These are some of my brothers. But where are the others? Where am I? I am his chosen regent! I fought on a thousand battlefields for him! The blood of my warriors is on his hands, and he ignores me like I don't exist! I am Horus, and I make my own fate. An incoming Voxhail echoed through the Vengeful Spirit Strategium. The storms of plasma boiling in the Greenskin's graveyard made the intership Vox choppy and unreliable. But this transmission was so clear, the speaker could have been standing next to Lupercal. Permission to come aboard, my son, said the Emperor. The moment was so sublime, so unexpected, and so awe-inspiring that Sejanus knew he would remember it for the rest of his life. It had been a long time since Sejanus had found himself awed by someone other than his Primarch. The Emperor went without a helm, his noble countenance bearing a wreath of golden laurels about his brow. Even from a distance, it was the face of a being worthy of eternal felty, conceivable only as an impression of wonder and light. No god ever demanded respect and honour more. No earthy ruler had ever been so beloved by all. Sejanus found himself weeping tears of unbridled joy. Father and son met on the main embarkation deck of the Vengeful Spirit, and every legionary aboard had mustered to honour the master of mankind. Ten thousand warriors, so many that every stormbird and thunderhawk in the deck had been flown out into the void to make room. No order had been given. None had been needed. This was their sire, the ruler who had decreed the galaxy to be humanity's domain and wrought the legions into being to turn that dream into reality. No force in the universe could have kept them from this reunion. As one, the Lunar Wolves threw back their heads and loosed a howling cheer of welcome, a pounding, deafening roar of martial pride. Nor were the legionaries the only ones who came. Mortals came too. Waifs and strays the Lunar Wolves had swept up in the course of the Great Crusade. Poets, would-be chroniclers and promulgators of imperial truth. To see the master of mankind in the flesh was an opportunity that would never come again. And what mortal would miss the chance to see the man who was reshaping the galaxy? He came aboard with 300 members of the Legio Custodes, godlike warriors cast in the mould of the Emperor himself. Armoured in gold plates with crimson horsehair plumes streaming from their peaked helms, they carried shields and long pole arms topped with armed photonic blades. Warriors whose sole purpose was to give their lives in order to protect his. The Mornival followed Horus at the head of the entire First Company, marching in a long column alongside the warriors of the Legio Custodes. As all warriors do, Sejanus measured them against his own strength, but could form no clear impression of their power. Perhaps that was the point. Jagatai taught it to me said Horus in answer to a question of the Emperor's. He called it the Zhao. I can't pull it off anything like as fast as the Warhawk, but I made a passable fist of it. Sejanus saw Horus as being modest. Not enough to keep pride from his voice, but just on the right side of arrogance. You and Jagatai were always close, said the Emperor as they marched between the proud lines of Lunar Wolves. Of all of us, even me, I think you know him best. And I hardly know him at all, admitted Horus. It is how he was made, said the Emperor, and Sejanus thought he detected a note of profound regret. They marched between the thousands of cheering legionaries, leaving the embarkation deck and moving up through the grandest processionals of the vengeful spirit. Companies of Lunar Wolves peeled off the higher they went, until only Ezekiel's Justeering Elite and the Mornival remained. They marched down the Avenue of Glory and Lament, 
the soaring antechamber with embossed columns of dark wood that bore the weight of a shimmering crystal-lined roof, through which the roiling, plasmic death rows of the Greenskin fleet could be relished. Coffered panels running fully half the length of the avenue bore hand-painted lists of names and numbers, and the march to the bridge only stopped when the Emperor paused to kneel by the newest panel. The dead, asked the Emperor, and Sejanus heard the weight of uncounted years in the simple question. All those where the spirit was present, said Horus. So many, and so many more yet to come, said the Emperor. We must make it all worthwhile, you and I. We must build a galaxy fit for heroes. We could fill this hall a hundred times over, and it would still be a price worth paying to see the crusade triumphant. I hope it will not come to that. The stars are our birthright. Wasn't that what you said? Make no mistakes, and they will be ours. I said that. You did, on Chthonia, when I was but a foundling. The Emperor stood and put a mailed gauntlet upon Lupercal's shoulder, the gesture of a proud father. Then I must prove worthy of your trust, said the Emperor. Lupercal watched his warriors race to battle from the golden bridge of his father's vessel. He wished he was part of the initial wave, the first to set foot on Goro's alien surface. A wolf of ash and fire, bestriding the world as an avenging destroyer god. Destroyer? No, never that. You wish you were with them, don't you? Asked the Emperor. Horus nodded but didn't turn from the viewing bay. I don't understand, said Horus, feeling the might of his father's presence behind him. What don't you understand? Why wouldn't you let me go with my sons? You always want to be first, don't you? Is that so bad? Of course not. But I need you elsewhere. Here, said Horus, unable to mask his disappointment. What good will I do from here? The Emperor laughed. <laughs> you think we're going to watch this abomination die from here? Horus turned to face the Emperor, now seeing his father was fit for battle. Towering and majestic in his gold-chased warplate of eagle wings and a bronze mantle of woven mail, a blue steel sword was unsheathed, rippling with potent psychic energies. Custodians attended him, weapons at the ready, upon the largest teleporter array Horus had ever seen. I believe you call it a spear tip, said the Emperor. We were there. The day Horus slew the Emperor, the murder of humanity's golden era, and the enslavement to a grim dark future of only war. The 41st millennium. For more than a hundred centuries, the Emperor has sat immobile on the golden throne of Earth. He is the master of mankind by the will of the gods and the master of a million worlds by the might of his inexhaustible armies. He is a rotting carcass, writhing invisibly with power from the dark age of technology. He is the carrion lord of the Imperium, from whom a thousand souls are sacrificed every day, so that he may never truly die. To be a man in such times is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloodiest regime imaginable. These are the tales of those times. Forget the power of technology and science, for so much has been forgotten, never to be relearned. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for in the grim dark future, there is only war. There is no peace amongst the stars. Only an eternity of carnage and slaughter, and the laughter of thirsting gods. An Imperium forged by the betrayal of the Emperor's most beloved son, Horus Lupercal. 
But how did the Imperium's shining beacon, the face of humanity's great hope, fall to corruption? His story begins in the 30th millennium. Like gleaming gems, the stars illuminate the night sky. The vast emptiness of space, in isolated pockets, planets and life blooms. Ones conquered in a long lost golden age of mankind. Chthonia turned under its sun. What had once been a jewel of civilization had been mined, tunneled and gutted of worth over the millennia humanity had lived upon it. Great cities that towered in enormous hives and cavernous lairs housed the cramped squabble of humanity. The collapse of mankind's federation millennia before had withered Chthonia in resources and in societal structure. A near lawless state, ruled by the various infighting hive gangs, battled over the scraps. Smog and dust filled the gloom that hung to the planet's surface, the soot filling the people's lungs. In the warrens deep below the surface, a low rumbling shook, an unnerving shake that seemed to settle in the weeks following, one that Car Gedon and his gang could not place, until a child was found, wandering in the dark. The brutal reality of life in this lawless place, in the near lightless existence, would permeate this child. He would fight, he would almost starve, he would kill, but at times he would look up to the stars and wonder, until after nearly a decade, he found something that felt like a dream. The shattered ruins of a device so advanced, so arcane. Welling up within the child, he felt memories and truth slam into his mind. He was no man, he was beyond that. He was not of this world. His mind and body were the height of human potential. A name stuck out, like it was blazed across his soul. I am Horus. In the wake of this realization, golden eagled ships plummeted through the atmosphere of Chthonia. An army decorated in brilliant gold and finery stood aside to reveal the perfection that made even Horus weep. The Emperor of Mankind. His father had come. The Imperium of Man, the expanding empire from terror, Horus learned as the light of the throne world illuminated his eyes. They sailed the very stars themselves, as Horus left Chthonia for the planet of his creation. For a young man who had only known the brutal and toxic life of Chthonian slums, to the tide of imperial might and sophistication, it almost overwhelmed him. But what expanded his knowledge of culture and creed was nothing compared to what he learnt of himself. He was a Primarch, a superhuman being created by the Emperor and forged from his own genetic material. But all this sense of wonder came crashing down. As Horus learned, he was not alone. He was one of twenty. He had brothers. But they were not here. They too had been scattered across the stars in a terrible accident. From those golden eyes his father told him of the Great Crusade, the conquest and reunification of mankind across the stars. The galaxy was mankind's birthright, and like the lost colonies, humanity was set upon all sides by infighting, xenos and mutants. For mankind to survive, it had to be united. Would he, Horus, help? The Emperor asked. The true purpose of mankind is to bear the torch of truth aloft and shine it, even into the darkest places, to share our forensic, unforgiving, liberating understanding with the dimmest reaches of the cosmos, to emancipate those shackled in ignorance, to free ourselves and others from false gods, and to take our place at the apex of sentient life. 
The Emperor needed him to be his general, his Primarch, his son. Horus knelt before the Emperor and gave his allegiance. A crescendo of joy, a feeling of belonging, a feeling of dire importance that he was needed for this great task swelled within him. Yes, he would fight. He would create the golden era of humanity to come. He would be the example his father needed him to be. For three decades, father and son stood side by side as the fleece of the Imperium launched to the corners of the galaxy. From the Emperor himself, Horus was gifted with the finest armor and arms, fed physical training and knowledge from the greatest scholars and orators the Imperium had at hand. All of it was taken in and mastered at a speed far beyond any mortal man. And then came the greatest gift of all, a legion of warriors crafted from his own genetic material, recruited from the finest warriors of terror, the Lunar Wolves, the 16th Legion, sons to Horus as he was a son to the Emperor. Even Horus himself was astounded, many of his sons bearing a strong resemblance to his own face. The sons of Horus he named them affectionately. After years, to Chthonia, Horus returned with his Terran-born sons. From the slums and underground gangs, Horus welcomed the best into the ranks of his Lunar Wolves. In his youth, he had explored the very depths of his adopted homeworld, beyond the deepest ore delvings, where the insane and crippled waited to die. He even ventured beneath the dripping cadaver pits, avoiding the screeching murder horsebacks with their disemboweling knives and organ cloaks. Chthonia was a warren of nightmarish rookeries, filled with unimaginable horrors at every turn. It was claustrophobic tunnels lit with pulsating light from magma fissures, thick with ash and a toxic miasma that clogged the lungs, fouled the eyes and stained the soul. Here he would find new blood for the Legion. Here he would find men who understood him, who grew up just like him. From the traditions born on terror, the Primarch only built upon them, a meshing of the cunning but brutal Chthonians with the disciplined but rigid Terrans, alloyed into one force. In their thousands, the brilliant white and scarlet crescent lunar wolves stood before the rising hope of the Imperium. Lupercal, Lupercal, Horus, Lupercal, they cheered as the Legion set off to the stars and joined the Great Crusade. To stand before Horus, even the Imperium's enemies wanted to kneel. His very presence hit like a wave, the fire of his spirit, the power and purpose behind every word and action made others want to follow him. Chthonia had shaped him, and the Emperor had perfected him. Horus knew the effect he had on others, and played into it. Only the astute around him could pick up on the rough Chthonian accent that he steered into. He was the charming king, a little rough around the edges. The Machiavellian prince who was the champion of the people, above them and yet one of them. Illuminate them my sons. Horus declared, as armed with the imperial truth and the hand of civilization and unity, Horus and the Lunar Wolves brought world upon world into compliance. For thirty years, Horus was the lone Primarch, the other legions looking on in envy to the sixteenth, who could stand beside their gene father. Elements of the 3rd and 19th Legion were auxiliary to his command as the Imperium began to grow. Legends were born and forged as Primarch and Legion battled non-compliant colonies and Xenos. First Captain Abaddon, Hastur Sejanus, Horus Aximand, Tarek Togadon, his Mournival, his closest sons and advisors, whose nature and temperament were a cultured alloyed mix. 
meant to represent each side of his mind, and a tempered voice to calm his worst impulses. He was the Lupercal, a figure beloved by all, a face remembered by millions upon thousands of worlds, one who had no equal bar the Emperor, who stood so far above him, until that day. From the Fenris system, the Emperor of Mankind summoned Horus. The reunion of father and son was a momentous and joyous occasion cut short. As the Emperor presented to Horus an equal, Lehman Russ. A brother, a Primarch, a primitive barbarian king. How long had Horus dreamt of this moment? How much had he played in his head? The fair-haired giant stood before him, knotted muscle and a glare so furious it could kill. Horus was bereft. He was no longer alone. He should not care, but he did. He was jealous. He was embarrassing himself. Sensing his son's resentment, the Emperor rested a hand on Horus's shoulder. The touch sent shivers into Horus's soul. Loving devotion welled in his heart that he could not deny, try as he might. Horus basked in the Emperor's attention. He was jealous. He would have to share the golden attentions of his father with another. The years they shared seemed reduced to an eye blink. He thought they would last for all time, and just like that they were done. In that moment, everything changed forever. If I cannot trust you to learn how to work with the others, and lead them as the first of my sons, then I have overestimated you. The Emperor's words stung Horus, as he realized the great responsibility placed upon his shoulders. He was the first found son. He had to quash his jealousy, to be the brother his siblings needed, to guide them as the Emperor had guided him. Though Horus found it hard to hide his disgust at these primitive Fenrisians, but who was he to judge? Had he and the hive gangs of Cothonia not been polished into gems? Could this not be the same for others? Decades began to pass, and more of them were found. More of his brothers, each of them utterly unique shaped by their worlds just as Cthonia had shaped him, all added to this growing Imperium. Horus often fulfilling the role of ingratiator to Imperial ways. All Primarchs stood before the great Lubacal and fell for that winning smile, an inviting demeanor. Mortarian, Alpharius, and even the Khan found a bond with the Master of the Sixteenth. Horus only finding difficulty in his bond with Corvus Corax. The Lunar Wolves and Horus had fought for nearly two centuries of war, at the head of the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet. The Imperium Horus had been brought into almost seemed like a distant memory. The military, administration and scale had magnified tenfold since those early years, when he was the lone Primarch. He and his legion now had a history and a culture that spanned centuries. Twenty legions. Now there were some that even outnumbered his. Led by brothers he respected greatly, such as the Lion, Gilliman and Dawn, who had all built reputations that sung across thousands of worlds. Many times Horus had brought worlds into compliance through diplomacy and negotiation. But once again, he found he had to unleash the wolves upon an enemy. The scrap world of Goro, deep in junkyard space of the Telon Reach. The greenskin empire that once claimed dominion over its stars was in flames, assailed on all sides by the inexhaustible armies of the Imperium. The alien's empire was being overturned, their muddy fortress world burning, but not quickly enough. The Armada of the Sixteenths and the Greenskins clashed in a shower of munitions and flame. The engagement volume became a swirling free fire zone, an impossibly tangled mass of entwined warships. Columns of Lazfire, 
Torpedo contrails and explosive debris fields. Void war engagements normally fought at ranges of tens of thousands of kilometers now began so close that Orc marauders with crude rocket packs were launching boarding actions. Horus held the fleet as the two engaged to a stalemate until another fleet had arrived. Space parted as though cut open by the sharpest edge. Amber light spilled out, brighter than a thousand suns and simultaneously existing in many realms of perception. The blade that cut the void open slid through the passage it had made, but this was no blade. This was a void-born colossus of gold and marble, a warship of inhuman proportions. Its prow was eagle-winged and magnificent, its length studded with vast cities of statuary and a palace of war. It was a starship, but a starship unlike any other, built for the most peerless individual the galaxy had ever known. This was the flagship of the Emperor himself, the Imperator Somnium. The green-skinned fleet broke as the Emperor arrived. The master of mankind went without a helm, his noble countenance bearing a wreath of golden laurels about his brow. Even from a distance it was the face of a being worthy of eternal fealty, conceivable only as an impression of wonder and light. No god ever demanded respect and honor more. No earthly ruler had ever been so beloved by all. From the thousands of serfs and soldiers, even to the Astartes, they wept at the majesty of his being. Such distilled humanity, perfected into one form. No one would miss the sight as father and son embraced. Before Horus had struggled to gaze upon that face, but he met those golden liquid eyes of his father and felt a well of emotion flood every fiber of his being. The two marched side by side, with the custodians and the mournful, resting near a monument to the dead. So many of Horus's sons had given their blood and their lives to build this Imperium, a sacrifice he felt keenly, even as he was willing to give more to see it through. The Emperor had come to Goro, and father and son would see this Xenos filth eliminated. Horus watched in envy as his sons declared their oaths of moment, drop pods falling towards the surface of Goro to confront the green-skin menace. He wanted to join them, to be first. He always wanted to be first. What did that say about him? He looked to the Emperor with concern on his face, only for a smile to reflect back. His father was fit for battle, towering and majestic in his golden chased warplate of eagle wings and a bronze mantle of woven mail. A blue steel sword was unsheathed, rippling with potent psychic energies. Custodians attended him, weapons at the ready, upon the largest teleporter array Horus had ever seen. This was the spear tip. In a flash of blue light, the scene upon the ship disappeared as the rust-red dirt of Goro replaced it. At them, the Emperor bellowed as the Custodians, Jesterian Terminators, and Horus leapt upon the Greenskins. With an ear-shattering roar, the Greenskins charged the Emperor in their hundreds, like iron filings to the most powerful magnet, knowing they would never find another foe so deserving of their rage. The Emperor killed them all, unstoppable in his purity of purpose, a crusade of billions distilled in one numinous being. Horus had fought alongside the Emperor for well over a century, but the sight of his father in battle still had the power to awe him. This was war perfected. Fulgrim could live a thousand lifetimes and never achieve anything so wondrous. The Greenskins fell in their thousands, as the master of mankind and his beloved son carved them apart. But then the ground began to shake violently. It tore from beneath them as the emperor extended a hand to his son. The emperor fell. 
Horus fell. He felt the wind bash his face. A shard of rock impacted his body. He looked around to see brave Jastarian and Custodes, who had leapt after their masters, their bodies smashing into sludge, as even their superhuman forms could not endure the impacts. Horus landed with a crash, his armor rent and broken in places, his wounds bad, but not fatal. Around him stood a vast chamber he knew to be the core of this world. Plasma leaked from enormous coils, a structure clearly built in a different age. Around the charging coils, a greenskin horde stood, crowding around the Emperor. Horus charged. Horus's sword was broken, his twin bolters empty of shells. The sword had snapped halfway along its length, the edge dulled from hewing countless greenskin bodies. He fought his way onto a stepped bridge, killing scores of monstrously swollen orcs to reach a crumbling ledge just below the Emperor. Blood drenched him, his own and that of the orcs. His helmet was long gone, torn away in a grappling, gouging duel with an iron tusk giant, with motorized crusher claws for arms and a fire belching maw. He'd broken the beast over his knee and hurled its corpse from the bridge. In front of him now he saw the Emperor and what he fought. An enormous, mechanized clad orc beast. Horus had never seen anything like it. Anything so monstrous and deadly. Titanic clangs pounded Horus' ears as he saw his father use every ounce of strength to hold against the creature that loomed over him. Horus sprinted forward, gripping one of the warlord's mechanized arms one bearing the spinning brass spheres and crackling tines of its lightning weapon. The arm's strength was prodigious, but centimeter by centimeter Horus forced it around. Lightning blasted from the weapon, burning Horus's hands black. Bone gleamed through the ruin of his flesh, but what was that pain when set against the loss of a father? Horus impaled the creature on its own weapon, and the beast howled as the Emperor used the opening. Horus felt the buildup of colossal psychic energies, and shielded his eyes as furious light built within the Emperor. Power like nothing had ever seen his father wield, or even suspected he possessed. All-consuming, all-powerful, it was the power to extinguish life in every sphere of his existence. The Emperor unleashed it. Physical flesh turns to ash before it, and what ancient face had once called a soul was burned out of existence, never to cohere again. Nothing would ever remain of he who suffered such a fate. Their body and soul would pass from the finite energy of the universe to fade into memory and have all that they were wiped from the canvas of existence. This was as a complete death as it was possible to suffer. The Emperor brought his sword down as he eviscerated the beast's soul from the universe. Horus looked on in awe, unable to stop his mind drifting to the belief that a god stood before him. The creature lied dead as the coils of the world core machine began to melt. Was this their end? Here, so much was left to achieve. Horus supported his wounded father as the Emperor uncurled his palm, releasing an energy that enveloped the incoming death. Horus stared into the event horizon and shuddered, a gnawing, great abyss of crawling chaos and unlimited potential. Howling voids where the combined lives of this galaxy were but motes reflected in the cosmic dust storm, an Imperium realm of the Neverborn where nightmares were burnt in the fetid womb of mortal lust. Things of void cold form writhed in the darkness, like a million snakes of ebon glass coiled in endless, slithering knots. Horus stared deep into the abyss, repulsed and fascinated by the secret workings of the universe. A sight he would never forget even if he wanted to. The warp. Goro had been cleansed, Horus looked to his father, 
overjoyed by their survival, cherishing this rare moment that father and son could once again fight side by side on the field of battle, though a part of him was unnerved. The warp had always been a dimension of mystery, even he did not fully understand. Not the Xenos that lived there, but the gaze into the abyss had shown him something that knotted within, an answer to a question he feared to ask his father. As the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet left Goro, new orders came in. A joint compliance in union with Jagatai Khan, and Robute Gilliman towards the Orc Empire centered on the planet Ulanor. Like a claw, the forces under Horus closed around the Xenos menace, leaving one last strike at the heart. The force was massive. 100,000 space marines, 8 million Imperial Army troops, and hundreds of spacecraft launched against a green tide never encountered before. Mountains of greenskins fell, and Horus and his Justerian Terminators made a gambit for the throat. Warboss Urg at his tower found the clambering black armored mass of Terminators, smashing into his own guard. The tide of gore and brutal melee almost swallowed Horus up, but the Primarch forced himself through, crippling Warboss Urg and launching his body from the tower to fall amongst his own force. The green skins broke, as the Lunar Wolves and Imperial Guard annihilated every last one of them. Ulanor was cleansed. In the wake of this victory, the world of Ulanor was transformed. A parade ground, the size of cities was carved and paved in only weeks. The forces of the Imperium were gathered in the largest display of Imperial might that humanity had ever seen. Billions of mortal men and women from thousands of worlds, hundreds of thousands of Astartes gathered for the triumph. Horus knew what was coming. The rumors of the Emperor's departure from the front lines of the Great Crusade had been building for years. Someone would have to assume the mantle. Upon the balcony alone, Horus reflected upon the weight of responsibility that role would ask of him. Was he worthy? Were his brothers who had risen up so much since those early days not also be worthy? Dawn, Gilliman, and begrudgingly the Lion. He was the first found son, but yet they were all meant to be equals. What would he do? If another was chosen above him, would he be jealous? Yes, he would, he admitted, but he would also support them as a brother should. But the Emperor was going to ask him to do this. How could he refuse? He had been prepared for this role since his discovery. He would be the brother to unite the others. Was there any other who could command equal respect and love? Only he could be the balance between them. Only he could be the symbol. The beloved Horus Lupercal. Down a parade line, miles long, stood mortal and superhuman warriors in numbers that stretched beyond the eye could see. With music, cheers and flags blowing in the wind, the master of mankind strode towards a throne. All wept at the majesty of this perfect being. His very image was like a sunrise within their souls. And fathomless, golden eyes, leaking wisdom and temperance. Some fell to their knees as their minds struggled to accept the immensity of what they saw, or who they saw. Horus strode towards his father and knelt. A laurel was placed upon his brow as he accepted the title of War Master. The parade ground erupted in cheers at the celebration of Imperial might and excellence. Horus rose to meet his father, only to ask why? Why was he returning back to Terra? Only for the Emperor to reveal nothing. Only the importance of his work and its secrecy. Horus smiled 
pretending that he did not feel pain at having been excluded from his father's council. Why, after everything they had been through, was he not trustworthy? Horus, squashing his tumultuous feelings, stood before the crowd and his brothers and drank in the glory, feeling more alive than he ever had before. Everything had changed. The Imperium swished upon a new paradigm, as now the weight of the Great Crusade fell onto Horus's shoulders. Many of his brothers congratulated him. Some were supportive, some were silent, and others were dissenting, but all submitted before the new War Master. The expeditionary fleets left the orbit of Ulanor as they continued the Great Crusade. Horus's 63rd expeditionary fleet grew exponentially, from the core of remembrances, poets, artists, chroniclers, and scholars a new administrative arm was bound to the fleet. From terror the Emperor had established a council, filled with mortal men and women to help rule the vast empire, a seniority that Horus kowtowed to. Even as he became frustrated, at their constant demands and lack of nuance. The constant flow of administration bombarded Horus every day, a weight alleviated by his mournable. Abaddon, Horus Aximand, Tarek Togadon, and beloved Hastur Sejanus. The court of the War Master was a civilization unto itself, a bustling hub that led the reconquest of the stars. The hope and pride was felt from the top to the bottom, from the Astarte such as Garviel Loken to the mortal men such as Kirill Sinderman, Euphrates Keeler, and Mercedes Oliton. It would only be a few short years into the reign of the War Master Horus that the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet encountered a system ruled by a so-called Imperium of Man. The humour was not lost upon Horus of this nine-planet system, ruled by this emperor, but still emissaries were sent led by Hastur Sejanus. But this olive branch was spat upon, as the imperial diplomats and their guards were murdered. The idea of another emperor unpalatable to this pocket realm. The murder of Hastur Sejanus wounded Horus. He had been there since those early days upon Gathonia. Nearly two centuries of friendship gone in an instant. He wanted revenge. Who would blame him? The execution of emissaries was a justification, but Horus swallowed the pain. He was the war master. He had to be seen as a symbol. He had to do what was best for the Imperium. Horus sent another emissary contingent. One last attempt headed by his Ekuri Malagurst, only for his ships to be fired upon. The War of 6319 had begun. The Lunar Wolves were unleashed, a crushing wave that mortal defenders could not stand against. Even this so-called Emperor's Guard, who utilized cloaking technology, 6319 was scarred and burned when the call came in. From Captain Garviel Loken, this Emperor wished to surrender to Horus himself, but it was a trap, sprung by Loken and his squad, the explosion throwing many from the throne room's height to fall to their deaths. Loken held on to the edge, his grip failing until a teleportation flare almost blinded him. A giant hand grabbed his, as Loken looked into the face of his gene father. He looked like a giant, a god amongst men. His armor was white gold, like the sunlight at dawn. Robes fluttered behind, haloing the beautiful radiant face. The War Master Horus Lupercal had arrived. Loken stuttered and looked at his Primarch in awe. Not so formal, Garvey, the War Master said as again one of Horus's sons basked in his presence. The war had been short and bloody, as did most affairs that concerned Astartes. The compliance of 6319 had been achieved, 
but rebel elements still lingered. The death of Sir Janus had been a somber time, for a figure so adored by Horus and the Legion. But still, Horus would show dignity, asking his brother Rogel Dawn, who was accompanying his fleet in support of his ascension to Warmaster. He asked him to attend as Imperial representatives for this so-called Emperor's funeral, a preservation for the people of 6319. But one problem had arisen. The alloy of the Mournival was missing an element, one filled by a man of honour and direct speech, one whose ascension was recommended by even Dawn himself, Captain Garviel Loken, a man of courage of directness, a naysayer to Abaddon's fanaticism, one whose first task was to suggest an idea of a last small task force assault on the last pocket of resistance. Loken, realizing that Horus used him as a springboard for this very idea before the court of the War Master, cultivating the image of a peacemaker who reluctantly had to listen to his sons when reason had failed. The image of Warmaster was a careful facade Horus had to cultivate, one watched by all the worlds of the Imperium, by billions of mortal men, a balance played masterfully. Loken, Vipus, Jubal, and 10th Company descended down to 6319, as Horus and his navigator waited patiently for news, when a spike of warp energy was detected. Reports came in that shocked Horus and the Mournival to the core. A legionary had turned upon their own, six brothers dead at the hands of Xavier Jubar, Astartes killing Astartes. It was unthinkable, a tragedy ended by Loken as a seemingly possessed marine screamed the words, Samus is here. I spoke to Kyril Sinderman, he said, and took a sip of the wine. He nodded to himself before continuing, as if surprised at its quality. Poor Kyril, such a terrible thing to endure. He's even speaking of spirits, you know. Sinderman, the arch-prophet of secular truth, speaking of spirits. I put him right, naturally. He mentioned spirits were a concern of yours too. Kyrul convinced me that it was a plague at first, but I saw a spirit, a demon, take hold of Xavier Jubal and remake his flesh into the form of a monster. I saw a demon take hold of Jubal's soul and turn him against his own kind. No, you didn't. Sir? Horace smiled. Allow me to illuminate you. I'll tell you what you saw, Garviel. It is a secret thing, known to a very few, though the Emperor, beloved of all, knows more than any of us. A secret, Garviel, more than any other secret we are keeping today. Can you keep it? I'll share it, for it will soothe your mind, but I need you to keep it solemnly. The War Master took another sip. It was the warp, Garviel. The warp? Of course it was. We know the power of the warp and the chaos it contains. We've seen it change men. We've seen the wretched things that infest its dark dimensions. I know you have. On Eridus, on Syrinx, on the bloody coast of Tassilon. There are entities in the warp that we might easily mistake for demons. Sir, I... I have been trained in the study of the warp. I am well prepared to face its horrors. I have fought the foul things that pour forth from the gates of the Empyrean, and yes, the warp can seep into a man and transmute him. I have seen this happen, but only in psychers. It is the risk they take, not in Astartes. Do you understand the full mechanism of the warp, Garviel? Horus asked. He raised the glass to the nearest light to examine the color of the wine. No, sir, I don't pretend to. Neither do I, my son. 
Neither does the Emperor, beloved by all, not entirely. It pains me to admit that, but it is the truth, and we deal in truths above all else. The warp is a vital tool to us, a means of communication and transport. Without it, there would be no Imperium of Man, for there would be no quick bridges between the stars. We use it, and we harness it, but we have no absolute control over it. It is a wild thing that tolerates our presence, but brooks no mastery. There is power in the war, fundamental power, not good nor evil, but elemental and anathema to us. It is a tool we use at our own risk. The War Master finished his glass and set it down. Spirits, demons, those words imply a greater power, a fiendish intellect and a purpose, an evil archetype with cosmic schemes and stratagems. They imply a god or gods at work behind the scenes. They imply the very supernatural state that we have taken great pains through the light of science to shake off. They imply sorcery and a palpable evil. He looked across at Loken. Spirits, demons, the supernatural, sorcery. These are words we have allowed to fall out of use, for we dislike the connotations, but they are just words. What you saw today, call it a spirit, call it a demon, the words serve well enough. Using them does not deny the clinical truth of the universe as man understands it. There can be demons in a secular cosmos, Garviel, just so long as we understand the use of the word. Meaning the warp. Meaning the warp. Why coin new terms for its horrors when we have a bounty of old words that might suit us just as well? We use the words alien and xenos to describe the inhuman filth we encounter in some locales. The creatures of the warp are just aliens too, but they are not life forms as we understand the term. They are not organic. They are extra-dimensional, and they influence our reality in ways that seem sorcerous to us, or supernatural, if you will. So let's use all those lost words for them. Demons, spirits, possessors, changelings. All we need to remember is that there are no gods out there in the darkness, no great demons and ministers of evil. There is no fundamental, immutable evil in the cosmos. It is too large and sterile for such melodrama. There are simply inhuman things that oppose us, things we were created to battle and destroy. Or orcs, Gaikon, Teshepta, Kalikid, Eldar, Jakera, and the creatures of the war, which are stranger than all, for they exhibit powers that are bizarre to us because of the otherness of their nature. Logan rose to his feet. He looked around the lamplit room, and hearing the moaning of the mountain wind outside. I have seen psychers taken by the warp, sir. I have seen them change and bloat in corruption, but I have never seen a sound man taken. I have never seen an Astartes so abused. It happens, Horace replied. He grinned. Does that shock you? I'm sorry, we keep it quiet. The warp can get into anything if it so pleases. Today was a particular triumph for its ways. These mountains are not haunted, as the myths report, but the warp is close to the surface here. That fact alone has given rise to the myths. Men have always found techniques to control the warp, and the folk here have done precisely that. They let the warp loose upon you today, and brave Jubal paid the price. Why him? Why not him? He was angry at you for overlooking him, and his anger made him vulnerable. The tendrils of the warp are always eager to exploit such chinks in the mind. I imagine the insurgents hoped that scores of your men would fall under the power they had let loose, but Tenth Company had more resolve than that. Samus was just a voice from the chaotic realm that briefly anchored itself to Jubal's flesh. You dealt with it well. It could have been far worse. You are sure of this, sir? Ing Mei Singh. Mistress of Astropaths informed me of a rapid warp spike in this region just after you disembarked. The data is solid and substantive. 
The locals used their limited knowledge of the warp, which they probably understood as magic, to unleash the horror of the Empyrean upon you as a weapon. Why have we been told so little about the warp, sir? Because so little is known. Do you know why I am Warmaster, my son? Because you are the most worthy. Horace laughed, and, pouring another glass of wine, shook his head. <laughs> I am Warmaster, Garviel, because the Emperor is busy. He has not retired to Terra because he is weary of the Crusade. He has gone there because he has more important work to do. More important than the Crusade? So he said to me. After Ulanor, he believed the time had come when he could leave the crusading work in the hands of the Primarchs so that he might be free to undertake a still higher calling. Which is? Logan waited for an answer, expecting some transcendent truth. What the War Master said was. I don't know. He didn't tell me. He hasn't told anyone. Horace paused for what seemed like an age, and the wind banged against the longhouse shutters. Not even me, Horace whispered. Logan sensed a terrible hurt in his commander, a wounded pride that he, even he, had not been worthy enough to know this secret. In a second, the War Master was smiling at Logan again, his dark mood forgotten. He didn't want to burden me, but I'm not a fool. I can speculate. As I said, the Imperium would not exist but for the warp. We are obliged to use it, but we know perilously little about it. I believe that I am Warmaster because the Emperor is occupied in unlocking its secrets. He has committed his great mind to the ultimate mastery of the war, for the good of mankind. He has realized that without final and full understanding of the Immaterium, we will founder and fall, no matter how many worlds we conquer. What if he fails? He won't. The War Master replied bluntly. What if we fail? We won't. Because we are his true servants and sons. Because we cannot fail him. He looked at his half-drunk glass and put it aside. I came here looking for spirit, he joked. And all I find is why. We know the power of the warp and the chaos it contains. We've seen it change men. We've seen the wretched things that infest its dark dimensions. From those early days by the Emperor's side, Horus had been told very little of this warp. But yet the Imperium's survival rests upon this highway into a realm of madness. For most of his two centuries of war, Horace Lupercal had barely given it much thought outside of its logistical consequences. But something changed at Ulanor. It wasn't hard for Horace to discern why his father had left the front lines of the Great Crusade. He knew that his father was pursuing the mysteries of that dimension, so that mankind could have dominion over all. So why was he left out? He always wanted to be first. First to assault the enemy, first in his father's affection. How much had that day affected him? The day another Primarch was found, and his father's attention wasn't solely upon him. If he admitted it, he wanted to know what the Emperor was doing simply because he wanted to know before his brothers. He feels a distance growing between him and his father. The keeping of secrets. The ascension of his brothers and this new council of terror. His opinion of mortal bureaucrats who did not bleed for the Imperium. The Imperium he and his sons were building was an opinion only known to his close Mournival. This only compounded by his struggle in this period of transition. Horus Lupercal is now Warmaster. The brother above brothers. He can feel his relationship changing with them, even the ones he was closest to. In his hands is the future decision of what kind of Warmaster he will be, what he will be remembered for, what is the great Horus Lupercal's legacy. 
he was a masterful orator, a charming man of the people, who in his rough Chthonian voice made his allies want to kneel and his enemies want to surrender. But every action and reaction, every word now came with the scrutiny of an entire empire and the relentless ambassadors from the Council of Terror. With the compliance of 6319 fully achieved, the expeditionary fleet once again loosed its mooring. A distress call had come from a contingent of blood angels, one answered by the Emperor's children with the lunar wolves en route. The horizon from the ship's bridge dawned with light as they looked upon the world coined murder. Storms raged across the surface of this bleak world. The contingents of blood angels and empress children had gone dark. The Vox returned no life signals, except for a strange music that seemed to emanate from the world. The blood angels were thought dead. But the Empress Children contingent still had survivors. Lupercal. Lupercal. The Lunar Wolves roared as the drop pods descended down through a gap in the storm. The Imperial forces had been near butchered by a violent arachnid Xenos race, equipped with pincers sharp enough to pierce ceramite plate. The dead and dying Astartes were hauled away to be spiked upon thorn trees for flying variants to feast upon. The prosecution by the 3rd Legion Captain Eidolon had been disastrous. A combat record full of bullheaded decisions and no accountability, a concern Horus would have to direct to his brother Fulgrim. They were close, Fulgrim being one of Horus's greatest supporters, his friend, but it concerned him that this temperament of warrior had risen so high in rank. Led by Tarek Torgadon, the extraction had been successful and aptly timed, and then Horus smiled as a new fleet emerged from the warp. Sanguinius had arrived, the two brothers locked in a warm embrace. No two Primarchs, save Fulgrim and Ferris, were closer. They had fought side by side on numerous campaigns, spoken long into the night on many occasions even held each other's secrets, one that Horus even kept from the Emperor. The cleansing of murder began. For six months the Blood Angels, Lunar Wolves and Emperor's Children reinforcements systematically annihilated the Megarachnids. The demolition of their trees, a tactic brought to light by Captain Tarvitz of the Third. Horus should have only been watching from the viewports. An unexpected consequence of his ascension to War Master meant he could not be risked upon the field so easily. His duties to the Imperium were more than just war. He could not take to the field as much as he desired, but he would not dare let anyone outshine him, especially a brother, and so he fought side by side with Sanguinius. The war had been a brutal and bloody affair. Many legionaries lost, but compliance had been achieved. In confidence to Sanguinius, Horus let his guard down. He had concerns over the potential disagreements between him and Fulgrim, over his concerns during this campaign, and the temperament of Astartes his brother held close. Fulgrim was an ally. They could not be seen bickering especially to the legions and primarchs who do not respect Horus as much. Sanguinius told him it was a time for change. He needed to assert himself and his legion. Horus knew how others saw him in the 16th. The Chthonian-born barbarians, gangers unfit for a role so close to the Emperor. But Sanguinius was right. The Emperor had placed trust and the title upon him. Why not show that elevation on his legion too? But Horus was reluctant. He didn't want his legion to change. The victories, the fallen, the deeds earned under the name of Lunar Wolves were sacred to him. How could he erase that? But the Imperium had changed. A time was coming for his sons to evolve with that. A time would come when they would command the respect they deserved as the sons of Horus. In the conclusion of the campaign, 
all battle stations came to alert as an unknown fleet entered the system. Long and sleek silver white ships, some even twice the length of the vengeful spirit approached. The communiques came alive with chatter in a human voice. Did you not see the warning we left? What have you done here? The Interrex, a human federation, had come to examine their prison world of the Megarachnids, only to find a mighty human fleet in orbit, and the world entirely cleansed of life. The delegation from the Interrex stood upon the deck of the Vengeful Spirit. Their arms and armor were fascinating and strange. Bows and swords, though clearly forged with greater technology, their armor fit sleekly, unlike the bulky Astartes powered plate. There was sophistication in their demeanor and words. Their very language had evolved to be accompanied by music, the tones shifting to fill in nuance. It became clear to Horace that these interrects were a vast and advanced civilization that could be a jewel within the growing Imperium. They were the talk of the expedition, except for one detail. Xenos, the Kinebrak, a humanoid alien race that had been integrated into the Interrex society for millennia. Their blue-black flesh, their jointed mouth and nose, the smell drew in looks of disgust around Horus's guard, the look upon Abaddon's face clear for all to see. The talks had only begun, but both sides were cautious. Horus re-entered into his inner chambers with Sanguinius and his Mournival. Immediately, the tension in the room escalated, Abaddon snarling that they had to destroy them. You have no choice. They are in opposition of our ways. The defiance of his first captain infuriated Horus. He bellowed back he would do as he saw fit. Abaddon had overstepped. He roared over his son to leave, as he shattered his drinking cup, but his anger melted as the first captain stomped away. Was this the way of Chthonia? Or the fire in his blood? Was it his fault? Was this the wolf he leashed tighter than some of his sons? It burned within because a part of him knew Abaddon was right. They were non-compliant. Their very civilization did not mix with the ideals of the Great Crusade. And yet, would he have to destroy another civilization? Was this to be his legacy as War Master? The Emperor had left the responsibility on his shoulders, and that came with the choice of what kind of War Master he would be. Since Ulanor had been only death and mistakes, the brutal compliance of 6319, the death of beloved Hastus Janus, and now this cleansing of the world of murder, he himself guilty of ignoring the signals projected from this world. He had fulfilled his role of Primarch, but couldn't War Master be more than just death and destruction? The Emperor was upon terror, building a future, so why couldn't he do that here? It had always been a carefully constructed image, the great Horus Lupercal of the Great Crusade. But what about the days when the Crusade was over? and the rule was passed to mortal men. Was he and his sons ready for an age of peace? They had to be. Horus chose to learn from this Interrex. They had shown him a contrast, and it had left him wanting. To an outpost world of the Interrex, the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet would journey, for the talks continue. The Imperial Armada above murder had grown considerably, as had the War Master's Council. Delegations from Terra and regional dignitaries, even other Legion contingents, such as High Chaplain Erebus of the Word Bearers, a close confidant of the Primarch Lorgar, and a respected figure amongst many Legions, a man who earned the respect of the Lunar Wolves immediately, having recognized the stress currently upon Horus's shoulders. Erebus put aside his own objectives and simply aided the War Master. The Mournival and Horus immediately were grateful, and it was something they expressed over many dinners and private meetings. To the world of Zenobia, Horus and his delegation landed. 
This outpost world was a jewel, a regal civilization whose towers of grey, silver and brass peaked up from verdant hills that were filled with beautiful architecture. The display was subtle power, one that radiated civility and progress. Horus chose to dress in robes, surrounding himself equally with Sanguinius, Astartes, and Remembrances, poets, scholars, and artists. The display would not be so bellicose this time. This was the Imperium. This was what he would be remembered for. This was the war master he would show to his brothers and history. Horus was not blind to the contrast. Even here, he thought of Imperial Hive cities, the bulky industrial nature of Imperial rule and life. What could he learn from these people? Through a great parade the delegation strode. The display of colour, dress and music enough to well emotion within them all. This was a day of celebration. Humanity unified once again. After millennia of separation. The great hope that had taken mankind to the stars sang proud this day. Through galleries and museums horror strode. The history of the Interrex displayed proudly. Even their collection of ancient Kinebrach weapons. Even the remembrance of Kirill Sinderman. Noticing the Anathame blade because of its crude design. In a place so filled with technology and magnificence. The negotiations began between the civilizations. But Horus could feel something was wrong. They were stalling. They even showed restraint before him when most interactions between a mortal man and a Primarch led to a sense of awe and even weeping. Again his counsel advised, Erebus joining his voice to Abaddon's, in the inevitability of conflict. They reminded him of his oath to the Emperor, to suffer no alien or mutant. But for a moment, Horus thought, what if the Emperor was wrong? The crusade had been born in a time of war, where humanity was set upon by strife. But here these people had survived, thrived even. They had adapted and integrated the alien into a society of peace. Why couldn't Horus Lupercal, the war master, also achieve that? A breakthrough in the talks was coming. Horus could feel it. But then disaster struck. A full security lockdown was initiated. The Hall of Devices, the museum, was burning. The Kinebrach Anathame had been stolen. The Interrex were under attack. Horus and his guard found the Interrex weapons raised upon them. The War Master's face turning to confusion as they fired, killing his sons. No, screamed Horus, the confusion and pain resonating in his voice. Why? Why would they choose to do this? Chaos, spoke Garviel Loken, a word the captain had heard from a guard earlier. Chaos? Do they mean the warp? They had not brought the warp here. They dare accuse him of this? Of a so-called attack against the Hall of Devices? Horus ignored his men's pleas to retreat and escape. His sons had died, ambushed by their hosts. He would see the evidence for himself. To the blazing inferno, Horus and his guard strode. His eyes looked into the fire that was spreading throughout the city. They dare accuse him of being the architect of this, of petty thievery, and of harboring some secret taint that came from the warp. The rage kept building. They had made him hope, made him think he could be more than a warrior. Again, another mistake as War Master. Erebus and Abaddon were right. He looked the stars and whispered to himself, Why have you tasked me with this father? Why have you forsaken me? Why? It is too hard. It is too much. Why did you leave me to do this on my own? The Interrex converged on their position. The Kinebrax Xenos leading the charge as with anger roaring in his blood, Horus attacked. The Kinebrach broke and exploded with every swing, gore and viscera covering Horus as he killed those who dared let him hope. 
the drop pods fell from the sky as the Imperium and Interrex were finally at war. Zenobia burned as the Lunar Wolves annihilated this perfect city and its inhabitants. A somber mood fell over Horus and the fleet, for this was no great victory, a compliance none would cherish in the annals of history of the Great Crusade. What was I thinking, thought Horus, that he could be some great peacemaker, that he knew better than the Emperor's own decrees, that he could be more. He reflected upon what he needed to be. He was a war master. He was a conqueror. Horus made up his mind. The Emperor and Sangunius were right. He did need to define himself and his legion. Gone was the pearl white. In jade green, the 16th legion stood before their war master. The lunar wolves had died upon Zenobia, and what rose in its place was the sons of Horus. In the months that followed, Imperial forces gathered. A great host led by Horus burned the Interrex Empire to the ground. The tide of the Imperial War Machine ground to dust, the architectural wonder of the Interrex, ready for colonization. In the ashes of victory, the mood of Horus had changed. In the months following the Interrex War, that warm smile that charmed the court and made men and women want to kneel never seemed to reach his eyes. Even the Mournival felt the change saw how his humours were out of balance, horrors at times losing his patience with them, and the mounting lines of bureaucrats that demanded his attention constantly. His melancholy could only be suppressed by the Council of One. He had begun to value highly over the recent months. Erebus. The High Chaplain had shown deaf diplomacy. He had alleviated the burden upon Horus. He had been a singular anchor to Imperial ideals that kept him focused since the Interrex War and the personal mistakes he perceived since his elevation to War Master. At a personal request from the High Chaplain, Horus brought the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet to the world of Davin, a victorious compliance during the Great Crusade. Horus and the Lunar Wolves remembered fondly. Six decades of imperial peace under the rule of Yugen Temba, a great man, a general, whose friendship Horus valued highly. It had brought great pain to both when the expedition had departed without Temba, but Horus trusted him and his capacity to be the warden of this system. Before the court of the fleet, the seats filled with officials. Military and Remembrances, Horus Lupercal held session. Once again, he and the Mournival would play out this pantomime, his sons acting as his political tools, his voice for when the War Master could not bring forward motions himself. The charming giant began polite laughter, and clapping spread towards the edge of the yurt. Once again, we return to Davin, sight of a great triumph and the Eighth World brought into compliance. Truly, it is. War Master, a soft voice interrupted. Horus immediately felt his blood boil and the mask slipped, revealing a thunderous expression. Interrupt him? How would anyone dare? With his humors out of balance, this was a dangerous time for someone to interrupt his plans. His schemes. War Master Erebus spoke. The faux pas of the interruption was creating a wave of discomfort throughout the court. A correction, Erebus said. Davin is not compliant. The first chaplain feigned politeness, despite his interruption. Say what you have to say, Erebus. This is the War Council and there are no secrets here, said Horus. A dangerous calmness to his voice conveyed the danger of what Erebus had done, and that this better have been worth it. Yugen Temba is a traitor, Erebus told him, that he had attempted to pacify Davin's moon, and had been twisted by so-called sorcery. 
Temba now serves the master of Davin's moon, and has spat on his oath of loyalty to the Emperor. He names you the lackey of a fallen god. Horus roared in rage at the betrayal of one who had been his friend, of a man he had appointed. How did he make the great war master look to others? Horus vowed before his court that he would strike down this traitor himself. In the preparation for the assault on Davin, an emissary had come from Terra itself. Petronella Viva, a documentarist, a noble of House Carpinus, a noble family since the early days of the Unification Wars on Terra. The woman had come to dare challenge for the role a whole fleet of remembrances would have killed for. The personal remembrancer of Horus Lupercal. Petronella Vivar and her mute guard Magard approached the War Master. Her breath, it was snatched away by the glory of the War Master's physical perfection and palpable charisma. His hair was short and his face open and handsome. With dazzling eyes that fixed her with a stare that told her she was the most important thing to him right now. She felt giddy, like a debutante at her first ball. Horace smiled, knowing the effect he had upon the mortal. I want to see it all, she told him, to see it all and record the glory of Horace for future generations. She had come to immortalize him. The glory of Horace. He lingered upon that longer than he should have, unwilling to state just how much that appealed to him. This was what he needed to fill the void of the Interrex War to extinguish his feelings of inadequacy since his ascension. He had tried other ways to establish himself as the War Master. He had wanted to build a legacy, and what better way than a record at the heart of the Imperium's brightest star? If she wanted to know the Lupercal, he would show her. Through the tide of the Imperial War Machine, in the assembly decks the Primarch and the Documentary strode, the Titans, Astartes and mortal soldiers in their thousands, almost stretched beyond the eye's line of sight. The war for Davin was coming, and here it stood, the forefront of the Great Crusade and its warriors who were building it. The stories, the victories, the achievements rolled off of Horus's tongue, almost like he couldn't stop himself. Before his Mournival, his most trusted sons, he knelt. He looked at them as a father did, and asked them to hear his oath of moment. Stunned by the magnanimity of such an act, none of the mournful dare moved. The other Astartes on the embarkation deck saw what was happening, and a hush spread throughout the chamber. Even the background noise of the deck seemed to diminish at the incredible sight of the war master kneeling before his chosen sons. Eventually, Loken reached out a trembling gauntlet and took the seal from the War Master's hand. He glanced over at Torgaddon and Aximand either side of him, quite dumbfounded by the War Master's humility. Horus swore upon his blade, sealed it with his own blood, and stood as the warrior king of mythology he was. Lupercal. The sentiment beat in the chest of all who watched as the greatest being they'd ever known walked amongst them. This was the Horus the Imperium would remember. Horus embraced his sons as the unbidden thought became reality. Lupercal. Lupercal. Lupercal, the cry rang out in echoes that roared from thousands of throats. Davin approached, as like tears of steel the forces of Horus descended. Strange whispers emanated across the Vox. Exaltations to some Nurgleth, but it was silence as the spear tip plunged into the meat of Davin. If Temba thought he could betray Horus, then he would illuminate him. The surface of Davin was rotten, verdant forests and arid deserts that had been twisted into a mired swamp, the smell of sulfur pouring through even legionary plate. Horus, the mournful, and his legion trudged through the porous ground until hands shot up from the murky depths. Bodies that looked emaciated and rotten sprung up, attacking the Imperial forces. 
They cut them down as Horace saw a stormbird crash ahead, and he and his men rushed to its ruins, breaking through the wreckage just in time to smash the scrambling corpses into piles of meat and bone. Pechinella Vivar hid, wounded and afraid in the corner, as a pile of bodies lay around her gene-enhanced bodyguard Magard. For a mortal man to display such skill, it impressed Horus. He told Magard he had courage, as the mute guard knelt with tears in his eyes. The admiration of the War Master, almost too much to bear for him. Magard offered his blade to Horus, the gesture clear. I am yours to command, a sensation Horus enjoyed. The poor woman had never seen war until now, and Horus was equally impressed as disappointed by her recklessness. The sons of Horus battered off this horrifying ambush, the contingents meeting up as they planned their next move. Covered in blood and gore, Erebus approached with his own word bearers. Erebus had found the way. He had found Yugen Temba. Rusted and dead nearly six decades, the glory of terror. Yugen's ship lay smashed and ruined upon the cratered mudflats. Its once mighty hull torn open and buckled almost beyond recognition. Its towering gothic spires, like the precincts of a mighty city, lay fallen and twisted. Its buttress and archways hung with decaying fronds of huge web-like vines. Its keel was broken, as though it had struck the moon's surface, belly first, and many of the upper surfaces had caved in, the decks below open to the elements. Horrors had not left the world like this. Erebus spoke again, urging Horus to push on. His remarks met with opposition by Captain Garviel Loken of the Mournival. Something was wrong. They should wait, soften up their targets with ordnance. This could be a trap. Loken pleaded with Horus to let the Mournival and the men finish this task. They are his will. They are his honor. You think my shoulders so narrow that I cannot bear it alone, asked Horus. And Loken was shocked to see genuine anger in his stare. Did they think him weak? How long had he heard the constant voices that he should not be in the field of battle? Horus strode off towards the wreckage. This was nothing, an obstacle. He was going to achieve so much. He was going to build a legacy Vivar would spread to mankind for all time. The anger within him only burned brighter with every step, as Horus ventured into the heart of the glory of terror, only for it to shatter as he saw the thing that had been his friend. A rotting, bulging carcass of a creature emerged from hiding. A sensation rippled across Horus's spine. Was this fear? The sight of the monstrosity sickened him to the core. This corruption was this chaos, like Jubal on 6319, the one the Interrex had spoken of. Horus lunged at the creature, as gurgling laughter and jibe spat from its hideous mouth, but its strength matched him, a Primarch. But still Horus landed blow after blow upon the rotting thing. The destiny is chaos, it screamed as black blood and stinking pus coated Horus's armor. Wielding a crude sword, the creature stabbed Horus in the shoulder, as Horus rammed his own into the heart of Temba. Through the red mist of anger and hurt, he saw the pathetic, weeping and soiled form of Yugen Temba, stripped of the loathsome power of the warp that had claimed him. Still bloated and massive, the dark light in his eyes was gone, replaced by tears and pain as the enormity of his betrayal crashed down upon him. Juddering sobs of agony and remorse racked Temba's body, and he reached up with his remaining hands to grip the War Master's armor. Horus's anger melted as he cradled his dying friend. He felt so hollow. He felt so hollow of that which drove him here in the first place. Temba died in his arms as his last haunting whispers spoke of a doomed future of only war. In his last moments, Temba had whimpered that he was weak, he was sorry, and Horus 
had to be strong. Only he could stop it. Carrying the corpse of Temba, Horus emerged back to his men. Abaddon, Aximand, Togadon, Loken, and Petronella Vivar greeted the War Master with cheers, as once again victory was theirs, only for the Pal of Horus to wash away to ash. The Primarch of the Sons of Horus wavered. His eyes rolled back into his sockets, and he began to collapse. Screams echoed in his mind as in shock. All around watched Horus Lupercal fall. In a storm bird, the Mournival and Apothecaries rushed their gene father towards the med bay. The news had spread like wildfire as mortal men and women crowded around, tears and wails growing like a chorus. The Astartes were in no mood to be slowed by this mass of people. The Mournival led the gurney through the crowns, mercilessly clearing a bloody path through the people before them. Men and women were cast down, trampled underfoot and their screams were so pitiful to hear, an aftermath that would never be forgotten. Upon the cold steel table, the son of the Emperor Lai, his armor stripped, blood and stimulants pumped into his frame. The wound on his shoulder, it wouldn't heal. It bypassed the genius of his cells. It was like a poison that had been designed to specifically kill Horus. The blade wielded by Temba, an anathame blade had been taken from the Interrex, and it was killing him. And the best apothecaries of the Legion could do nothing to save him. Horus found himself waking. He was stabilized, but he was degrading by the hour. Petronella Viva, he called for. The documentarist. He was dying. This was the end, but what frightened him the most was the possibility he would be forgotten. No, his legacy, she could save him. She would immortalize him. They were jealous. The wounded Horus whispered to her, all of them, my brothers. He knew it. Only the true brothers bowed their heads, whilst the others stared daggers in his back. He lamented how he knew the truth, that the Emperor did not choose him because he was the most worthy. It was simply because he was a conqueror, and that was all the Emperor expected of him. Oh, how he missed those years, when they were alone as father and son. His brothers had ruined that. He did love them, but controlling them and their desires, they were like children. Sanguinius. Sanguinius should have been war master. Horus was the Emperor's ambition. He knew it, but Sanguinius was his spirit. He loved and hated that about him, and for all his ambition it would mean nothing in the golden era to come. Bureaucracy and officialdom are taking over, Viva. Red tape. Administrators and clerks are replacing the heroes of the age. And unless we change our ways and our direction, our greatness as an empire will soon be a footnote in the history books. Everything I have achieved will be a distant memory of former glory, lost in the mists of time like the civilizations of ancient terror, remembered kindly for their noble past. If Horus saw the shock on Vivar's face, he didn't register it. I was bred with wondrous powers, encoded into my very flesh. But I did not dream myself into the man I am today. I hammered and forged myself upon the anvil of battle and conquest. All that I have achieved in the last two centuries will be given away to weak men and women who are not there to shed their blood with us in the dark places of the galaxy. Where is the justice in that? Lesser men will rule what I have conquered. But what will be the reward once the fighting is done? He couldn't stop. Horus poured out everything, every resentment, every trial and secret he had. A confessional of a dying man, the true Horus Lupercal. Until the blackness took hold and Horus fell unconscious. The sons of Horus were paralyzed. A wave of hopelessness spread across the fleet, from the menial serfs to the Mournival itself. 
Hundreds of thousands were already mourning, and some even prayed. It was in their most dire moment that a suggestion came from one they trusted, Erebus. He spoke of a mystical healing temple upon Davin, the Serpent Lodge. It spat in the face of the ideals of the Great Crusade, a temple to mysticism under the Imperial Truth. But what options did they have left? If they did not try every avenue, could they live with the guilt? From the Warrior Lodge, a society formed during the Great Crusade, a gathering where Astartes could discard rank and share in brotherhood, a meeting was held. A choice was made as Abaddon, Aximand, and the Lodge members agreed to take Horus to the temple. Carried upon a kite shield, armoured in his finest ceremonial suit, the Warmaster's hands were clasped across his golden sword. A laurel wreath of silver sat upon his noble brow. Abaddon, Aximand, and the sons of Horus wept openly. The mortal men and women in their thousands joined the procession, throwing flowers, lighting candles, holding their loved ones tight. The outpouring of grief was on a scale never seen before. The symbol of the Imperium, the Lupercal, the champion of the Emperor's golden era. How could a symbol die? The procession left the vengeful spirit as thousands of ships followed, the entire expedition on a knife's edge. Everything else had failed. The War Master was dying, and the Emperor wasn't here. There could be no doubting of the identity of the central figure now, and Horus looked into the carved face of the Emperor. No doubt the inhabitants of this world thought it magnificent, but Horus knew this was a poor thing, failing spectacularly to capture the sheer dynamism and force of the Emperor's personality. With the additional height offered by the statue's plinth, Horus looked out over the slowly circling mass of people and wondered what they thought they did in this place. Pilgrims, thought Horus. The word leaping, unbidden to his mind, coupled with the ostentation and vulgar adornments he saw on the surrounding buildings. Horus knew that this was not simply a place of devotion, but something much more. This is a place of worship, he said, as Sejanus joined him at the foot of Korax's statue, the cool marble perfectly capturing the padded complexion of his taciturn brother. Sejanus nodded and said, It is an entire world given over to the praise of the Emperor. But why? The Emperor is no god. He spent centuries freeing humanity from the shackles of religion. This makes no sense. Not from where you stand in time, but this is the Imperium that will come to pass if events continue on their present course. The Emperor has the gift of foresight, and he has seen this future time. For what purpose? To destroy the old faiths, so that one day his cult would more easily supplant them all. No. I won't believe that. My father always refuted any notion of divinity. He once said of ancient Earth that there were torches who were the teachers, but also extinguishers who were the priests. He would never have condoned this. Yet this entire world is his temple, and it is not the only one. There are more worlds like this. Hundreds. Probably even thousands. But the Emperor shamed Lorgar for behavior such as this. The Word Bearers Legion raised great monuments to the Emperor and persecuted entire populations for their lack of faith, but the Emperor would not stand for it and said that Lorgar shamed him with such displays. He wasn't ready for worship then. He didn't have control of the galaxy. That's why he needed you. Horus turned away from Sejanus and looked up into the golden face of his father, desperate to refute the words he was hearing. At any other time, he would have struck Sir Janus down for such a suggestion, but the evidence was here before him. He turned to face Sir Janus. These are some of my brothers, but where are the others? Where am I? I do not know. 
I have walked to this place many times, but have never yet seen your likeness. I am his chosen regent. I fought on a thousand battlefields for him. The blood of my warriors is on his hands, and he ignores me like I don't exist. The Emperor has forsaken you, War Master. Soon he will turn his back on his people to win his place amongst the gods. He cares only for himself and his power and glory. We were all deceived. We have no place in his grand scheme. And when the time comes, he will spurn us all and ascend to godhood. While we were fighting war after war in his name, he was secretly building his power in the warp. The droning chant of the official, a priest, realized Horus, continued as the pilgrims maintained the slow procession around their god, and Sejanus' words hammered against his skull. This can't be true, whispered Horus. Horus, my brother said Magnus. You must not believe whatever he has told you. It is lies, all of it. Lies that disguise his sinister purpose. Those with courage and character to speak the truth always seem sinister to the ignorant, snarled Erebus. You dare speak of lies while you stand before us in the warp. How can this be without the use of sorcery? Sorcery you were expressly forbidden to practice by the Emperor himself. Do not presume to judge me, whelp! shouted Magnus, hurling a glittering ball of fire towards the first chaplain. Horus watched as the flame streaked towards Erebus and enveloped him, but as the fire died, he saw that Erebus was unharmed, his armor not so much as scratched, and his skin unblemished. Erebus laughed. <laughs> you are too far away, Magnus. <laughs> Your powers cannot reach me here. Horus watched as Magnus hurled bolt after bolt of lightning from his fingertips, amazed and horrified to see his brother employing such powers. Though all the legions had once had librarious divisions, the trained warriors to tap into the power of the warp they had been disbanded after the Emperor's decree at the Council of Nikea. Clearly, Magnus had paid that order no mind, and such conceit staggered Horus. Eventually, his Cyclopean brother recognized that his power was having no effect on Erebus, and he dropped his hands to his side. You see, said Erebus, turning to Horus. Nor can you, Erebus. You come to me cloaked in the identity of another. You claim my brother Magnus is naught but some warp beast set upon devouring me, and then you speak to him as though he is exactly as he seems. If he is here by sorcery, then how else can you be here? Erebus paused, caught in his lie, and said, You are right, my lord. The sorcery of the Serpent Lodge has sent me to you to help you, and to offer you this chance of life. The Serpent Priestess had to cut my throat to do it, and once I return to the world of flesh, I will kill the witch for that. But know that everything I have shown you is real. You saw it yourself, and you know the truth. Magnus towered over the figure of Erebus. His crimson mane shook with fury, but Horus saw that he kept tight rein on his anger as he spoke. The future is not set, Horus. Erebus may have shown you a future, but that is only one possible future. It is not absolute. Have faith in that. Ha! <laughs> sneered Erebus. Faith is just another way of not wanting to know what is true. You think I don't know that, Magnus? I know of the warp and the tricks it can play with the mind. I am not stupid. I knew that this was not Sejanus, just as I knew that without a context, everything I have seen here is meaningless. Horus saw the crestfallen look on Erebus's face and laughed. You must take me for a fool, Erebus, if you thought that such simple parlor tricks would bewitch me to your cause. My brother, smiled Magnus, you are a wonder to me. Be quiet, snarled Horus. You are no better than Erebus. You will not manipulate me like this, for I am Horus. I am the War Master. 
Horace relished in their confusion. One was his brother, the other a warrior. He had counted as a valued counselor and devoted follower. He had sorely misjudged them both. I can trust neither of you. I am Horus, and I make my own fate. Erebus stepped towards him, and his hands outstretched in supplication. You should know that I came to you at the behest of my lord and master Lorgar. He already has knowledge of the Emperor's quest to ascend to godhood, and has sworn himself to the powers of the Warp. When the Emperor rejected Lorgar's worship, he found other gods all too willing to accept his devotion. My Primarch's power has grown tenfold, and it is but a fraction of the power that could be yours were you to pledge yourself to their cause. He lies! Lorgar is loyal. He would never turn against the Emperor. Horus listened to Erebus's words, and knew with utter certainty that he spoke the truth. Lorgar, his most beloved brother, had already embraced the power of the war. Warring emotions vied for supremacy within him, disappointment, anger, and, if he was honest, a spark of jealousy that Lorgar should have been chosen first. If wise Lorgar would choose such powers as patrons, was there not some merit in that? Horus, I am running out of time. Please be strong, my brother. Think of what this mongrel dog is asking you to do. He would have you spit on your oaths of loyalty. He is forcing you to betray the Emperor and turn on your brother Astartes. You must trust the Emperor to do what is right. The Emperor plays dice with the fate of the galaxy. And he throws them where they cannot be seen. Horus, please, cried Magnus, his voice taking on a ghostly quality as his image began to fade. You must not do this or all we have fought for will be cast to ruin forever. You cannot do this terrible thing. Is it so terrible? It is but a small thing, really. Deliver the Emperor to the gods of the warp and unlimited power can be yours. I told you before that they have no interest in the realms of men. And that promise still holds true. The galaxy will be yours to rule over as the new master of mankind. Enough! I have made my choice. Horus finds his spirit, his soul cast into the warp, as his body lay within the Serpent Lodge temple. Haster Sejanus, his beloved son who had died years before, appears to him, acting as his guide as they venture further into the warp. And what Horus sees shakes him to his core. The future. A grim, dark future where the Emperor is worshipped as a god. This future disgusts Horus. It is the very thing the Great Crusade destroys. But what hurts the most of all is that he is not celebrated. The Great Horus Lupercal is forgotten. He has no legacy. He is not immortal. Perhaps he and many of his brothers in this grim dark future have been annihilated by the Emperor. This Sir Janus tells him that the Emperor is a liar and has stolen power and broken bonds with entities of the war. Ones that are in part responsible for he and his brother's creation as they show him the past and the Primarch vaults beneath the surface of terror. Horus seeing his own childlike body within the gestation capsule these entities simply want the Emperor, and they can help Horus stop the Emperor's cruel future. They can give him power. Power the Emperor keeps to himself and denies humanity. The power of the warp. 
Each part of this vision quest is designed to shatter every strand of loyalty Horus has to the Emperor, playing on his doubts, his fears, and most of all, his ego. A part of Horus so carefully wrapped behind the mask, though some of his brothers know the ambition that roars in the heart beneath. The manipulation is interrupted by Magnus the Red, his brother. He breaks the disguise of this Hasta Sejanus, revealing the true face beneath, Erebus. But what Horus has seen was too much. He is no servant, no slave to this chaos, but he sees it as a tool, a power he can use to cast down the Emperor and become the new master of mankind. Is he preventing the enslavement of mankind to the Emperor, taking control of a galaxy the Emperor would hand over to mortal bureaucrats? Or is it truly about the idea of Horus Lupercal, an ambition to immortalize that name and his legacy? Was Horus ever really a true believer in the Great Crusade and the ideals behind it? Or did he simply enjoy the power, the position, and the proximity to the Emperor? Horus makes his choice. The gates of the Serpent Lodge open. The crowds who have been waiting for days, lighting candles and praying. The Mordeval and the sons of Horus kneel as Horus Lupercal strides forward, healed and smiling. The roars of Lupercal shake the very walls. Horus has returned, but in his heart, he has betrayed the Emperor. The Autrician Technocracy A civilization the 63rd expedition had encountered the months following the miraculous recovery of the War Master Horus. The humans of this civilization reflected the Imperium almost like a mirror. Their warriors equipped in powered armor from a similar STC design. This was what the Great Crusade was about. The reunification of mankind the welcoming of brothers and sisters into the growing fold. Except, what should have been a time of celebration had turned to war. The delegation of the technocracy were ripped apart, as Horus claimed they had tried to assassinate him. The news was spread to the fleet in horror. How dare they try and kill the beloved Horus? Though the details of the event had been altered, there were few such as Captain Garviel Loken and Tarek Torgaden of the Mournival, who felt discomfort at what they were doing, about how Horus had changed since the Serpent Lodge had healed him. Only they protest at the growing mysticism and inhumanity growing within the Legion. But others such as Abaddon, Aximand and Malaga simply followed the orders and the will of Horus. The War Master's betrayal was no open declaration. Yet, the groundwork had to be laid for the greatest war the Imperium would face, and Horus wanted to make it a quick one. Through the Warrior Lodge, the gathering Horus had turned a blind eye to over the Great Crusade. The War Master began to spread his new ideology. It began in whispers of the Emperor's lies, of how he would betray the Astartes, just as he had the Thunder Warriors of Terror. The Imperium they were building would be handed over to weak, mortal men. The Imperium their brothers had died for. The Great Horus just couldn't stand by and allow this to happen. Would his warriors, his sons, help him save the Imperium and humanity? A divide between the ranks was forming. The subtle prodding of loyalties. The Emperor or Horus. Dissenting voices of the remembrances that criticized the Legion were silenced permanently. The compliance of the Autracian technocracy, joined by the World Eaters Legion II, was used as a form of purge. Elements of the mortal armies not utterly loyal to Horus found themselves falling in the line of duty. Horus himself giving heartfelt eulogies to the great leaders he knew, yet killed in secret. His father, the Emperor, controlled vast armies, 18 legions and thousands of worlds. But the pace of the Great Crusade had built a wave of resentment waiting to crash down. 
How many worlds have been forced into compliance? How many worlds have never even seen this emperor? Only the charismatic Horus. How many of his brothers too held resentment? How many loved him more than their father? He would illuminate them. Just as how he had been illuminated by the journey in the warp. But one small detail had to be dealt with first. Petronella Vivar strode into the War Master's chambers. The previous months had not been kind to her. The excessive drinking brought on by the true story of Horus and his revelations, whilst he lay on death's door, had wounded her spirit. But the memoir was almost complete. She would uphold her promise. She was going to immortalize him. A shocking tale that would spread like wildfire across the Imperium. But she would never get the chance. She looked into his eyes and saw nothing but cold horror. She tried to back away, but the War Master followed her. His steps slow and measured. When we spoke in the Apothecarian, I let you look inside Pandora's box, Miss Vivar, and for that I am truly sorry. Only one person has need to know the things in my head, and that person is me. The things I have seen and done, the things I am going to do. Horus placed his hand around her neck, a mortal in a giant's grip, and then he broke it. He couldn't afford weakness in the war to come. Weakness such as understanding, kindness, mercy or honor. Erebus had told him. The warp had shown him that the universe was not fueled by such things. The Emperor was wrong, and Horus was right. He would do what it took to rip that monster from his throne, no matter the cost. Because humanity had to be saved. That is what he told himself. To his brothers Horus journeyed. Lorgar of the Wordbearers already stood with him, supposedly brought into the fold five decades before. But there were those who he knew he could persuade to join his cause. Fulgrim, Mortarion, Angron, Alpharius, Perturabo, and Conrad Kurz. Each speech Horus gave had been practiced. He knew them. He knew the canker in the heart of all of them and exploited it. The lying, manipulating, hypocritical emperor. The imperium that undervalued them. The future that would discard them. The pleas of a brother who they loved, needing their help to save humanity, to enact revenge upon their twisted father who lied about the warp and kept its secrets to himself, just so he could become a god. Every word was crafted to each brother in a way only Horus could, until one by one they gave him their loyalty. And for those brothers who were loyal to the tyrant emperor, Horus, in union with Erebus created plans to scatter, attack and weaken them. An ambush for Gilliman and the Ultramarines at the dual world of Kalth. The Thramas Sector for the Lion. Manipulations of Rust to destroy Magnus and Prospero. And Cygnus Prime for Sanguinius. Many of his brothers he respected. Some he loved. But he couldn't turn back. Not after what he had seen. He told himself he had no choice, as much as it pained him to do it. To the world of Isfarn III, the sons of Horus, Death Guard, world eaters and emperor's children convened. A rebellion had broken out across the world, one that the war master Horus would annihilate. Above the planet, the legions converged as Mortarion, Angron, and Eidolon of the emperor's children unveiled their battle strategy. A spear tip assault upon the surface and the hub of Choral City. A unified attack with contingents from all four legions. In the court of the War Master, the usual calm and charismatic Horus had seemed to be replaced by one of authority and sternness. It was as if he commanded attention and obedience. All felt the unspoken tension in the air. In seclusion, Horus again met with his close counsel, Erebus, the first chaplain finally showing this power spoken of and promised by the warp. 
and these entities of chaos. Ing may sing. The Asher path of the vengeful spirit cried. She had tried to betray them. The messages and information over the previous months from the War Master to the traitorous legions had broken her. Horus rammed his clawed gaunter through her chest, dripping her blood onto a fire that crackled with dark power. The Emperor had jealously hidden much from Horus, such as the truth of the warp, the intrinsic tie between that realm and the material universe, of how emotions powered it, and of how that power could be wielded. From dancing shadows a demon began to whisper, War Master, with a voice that stung the nerves as it spoke the power it offered, the promise the War Master had made to chaos. The Anathema's future would die, the Emperor would die, and Horus would need their help. Nothing is beyond the reach of the gods. Gods, replied Horus. You waste your time throwing such words around. They do not impress me. I already know of your gods. I already know your gods need me. It was about him, Horus thought. I am the key, and it pleased him greatly. But the fact they needed him made him believe that perhaps they are not as strong as they pretend to be. No, they were entities in the war, and the power they offered was a tool. He was no fanatic or so-called believer like Lorgar and Erebus. Unseating the Emperor was his only concern. Horus would not be intimidated as he spoke to this so-called demon, telling it that it better make due on the power it offered. If they were to take on the numerous forces of the Imperium, but before he was willing to use that very power, he would start the war himself. He was unwilling to use it as a crutch. No, the legions would begin this rebellion. But before that could begin, his own legion had to be pure. To the world of Istvan III, the drop pods fell. Munitions and flames scorched Toral City and its rebelling force. Twisted humanoid creatures. Foul sorcery of the war began to slam into the legionaries, and bolt guns were unleashed upon them. But some began to notice the unusual structure of the companies. Many of the Terran elements, and those not in favor with the War Master, such as Logan and Torgadon had made planetfall, with over two-thirds of the four legions remaining in orbit. Horus sat upon his throne, as the light of the system star shone through the observation deck. Choral City burned, as the contingents of the sons of Horus, Empress children, World Eaters and Death Guard locked around it like a vice. The assault was effective and brutal, just as Astartes were known to achieve. But here would be no victory celebration for those upon the surface, because they were all going to die. To think that so much depends on the personalities of so few, Horace thought. News had come that Prospero burned. Soon Fulgrim would return with Ferris. Jagatai Khan he knew would join them. Horace could see the victory to come. On a podium Horace and his equerry Malagur stood. The observation deck of the vengeful spirit swelled with the hordes of personnel, iterators, Remembrances and documentarists, all here to bear witness to the compliance of Istvan III. Pickfeed showed the brutal ruins of Choral City. Bodies, blood and destruction washed over every meter of ground. The sight made the mortal men and women feel sick. And then the bombs fell. Virus munitions roared from the Legion's fleet onto the surface of Istvan III. They were killing their own. The fires washed over the entire planet, eating every living thing in its wake. It covered mountains, rivers and seas until all was death and silent. Astartes choked and dropped in their armor as they were eaten alive from within, their screams evaporating. You see now, said Horus to the assembled mortals, this is war. This is cruelty and death. This is what we were made to do for you, and yet you turn your face. The men and women were weeping, 
holding each other in the wake of this betrayal. You have come to my ship to chronicle the Great Crusade, Horace bellowed, and there is much to be said of what you have achieved. But things change, and times move on. The Great Crusade is over. The ideals it stood for are dead, and all that we have fought for has been a lie. Until now. Now I bring the Crusade back to its rightful path, and rescue the galaxy from its abandonment at the hands of the Emperor. Horus felt exalted. The mask was removed and he was free. He had never cared for a golden age of humanity. He had no great love of mortal men and women, as some of his brothers did. The secrecy since Davin was gone, and now he could show the universe the true Horus Lupercal. He had illuminated these pathetic beings, and now they had to die. The guns blazed as the Astartes massacred every person on the deck. The collective memories and knowledge of some of the Imperium's brightest people died in an instant. It was the death of a dream, a shattering of the Emperor's golden age of humanity, and Horus murdered it. The rebellion had truly begun, and the galaxy would burn. But after the fires had faded, a problem arose. From black charred buildings, the wastes of annihilated Isvan, life signs emerged. From bunkers across Choral City, Astartes stood out. Some had lived. They had been warned, giving them enough time to get to safety before the bombs had fallen. Horus's fury was apocalyptic. His great declaration, his moment of triumph had been spoiled. Horus ordered his legion into the drop pods. They would have to finish off their kin personally. Angron, Mortarion, Abaddon and Aximan threw their forces at the very men they used to stand besides. The bonds of broken brotherhood. The pain was unleashed by those loyal to the Emperor. The Marines of the 16th discarded their title, reclaiming the Lunar Wolves' banner as they faced the Sons of Horus. Kill for the living, kill for the dead, replace the chance of Lupercal. As men who had fought and lived side by side with for centuries killed each other. Thousands fell in the guerrilla war that delayed the traitorous fleet for weeks, but eventually the Loyalists fell. Names such as Tarvitz, Vipers, Torgaddon, and Loken lost. The Legion was pure, though despite the careful execution of their Loyalist brothers, an escape had been managed by Captain Nathaniel Garrow of the Death Guard. The Imperium felt the shock as the news rang out that the beloved War Master Horus had declared open rebellion. The warp rippled and convulsed as storms raged across it. Travel and communication became fractured and difficult. Entire sectors rose up in their support for Horus, as the Imperium became divided in two. The master of mankind sat upon the Golden Throne, a prisoner to the great folly of Magnus, who in his attempts to warn the Emperor after the events of Davin, broke the psychic wars placed within the webway. The mirror dimension the Emperor had returned to Terra in order to forge humanity's golden era. But the Imperium's response would be swift and brutal, Horus knew, as the four legions under his banner plotted their course to the next site of the conflict. Istvan V. The barren world had been fortified by Fulgrim. Four legions entrenched into the fortress that would take the brunt of Imperial retaliation. Finally, they came, his brothers, Ferris Manus, Vulcan and Corvus Corax, a forward contingent to be reinforced by another four legions. The drop pods fell from the sky as Astartes fought Astartes in open conflict on a scale the Imperium had never dared to think possible. This was no time of enlightenment or building, this was war. The bloodiest battle in Imperial history raged across the lines as the world glowed orange with munitions. Horus held back at the command dais as brother and legionaries killed each other in their thousands. 
Titans and Imperial Guards smashed against each other, in a conflict that would melt the sanity of those who watched. As the Loyalists blunted the traitor line, both retreated, but the Iron Hands refused to stop. Ferris refused to let Fulgrim go. As the Salamanders and Raven Guard approached their reinforcements, they hailed their allies. The Iron Warriors, Alpha Legion, Night Lords and Word Bearers only to be met with silence. The tension grew, until a flare rose from Horus's base. A second betrayal was revealed. Death to the false emperor roared across the Vox, as the Loyalist legions fell in a wave of meat and shattered bone. Horus lifted his mace worldbreaker onto his shoulder and charged. The battle turned into a massacre, as Horus and nine legions eliminated three from the field. As the ashes of the dead rained upon them, Horus stood before the amassed horde of traitor forces, his fellow Primarchs below him in supplication. Already he could see amongst these legions those who had embraced the power of the warp. He declared to his brave warriors they were victorious. They had achieved so much, and now the road to terror was open. The galaxy was their prize, and they would unseat the lying false emperor. Hail Horus reverberated across the planet, and as he looked over them all, he let the weight of it sink in. In his strategium upon the vengeful spirit, Horus looked over the traitor armada. Not since Ulanor had he seen such a gathering, but the galaxy was a different place now. The road ahead was daunting. He knew it could be a long, bloody affair, but nothing would stop him now. An object was thrown, tossed at his feet, but when Horus looked upon it he felt repulsed, the severed head of his brother Ferris Manus. To see a brother, despite an enemy so violated it shook him, a feeling he masked. It was distasteful, and yet an up-close reminder of what he had started. If only Ferris had stood by his side. Fulgrim approached the War Master, hoping he would appreciate his gift. But Horus felt that same spine-tingling sensation he had felt before. He looked into his brother's eyes and saw another. A demon. Possession. A creature of the warp wore his brother's skin. It disgusted him. It made his blood boil to see his brother's body so violated. Horus's knowledge of the warp this chaos was growing, but this new revelation unnerved him. The true Fulgrim had surrendered to this creature, unable to reconcile with Ferris's death at his hands. Horus wanted to smash the abomination, but stayed his hand. The creature had given him its oath, and he had need of the Third Legion. The puppet Fulgrim left unharmed, but Horus walked away with the realization that he needed to overcome his ignorance of these creatures. He would not be vulnerable to a fate like that. The traitor legions scattered. Dark tendrils that would raise every world that resisted the new order. The horrors heresy had begun. Across the galaxy, the violent warp storms isolated entire sectors of space. The ultramarines were decimated by Erebus and the word bearers at Kalth. Lorgar launched his Shadow Crusade to burn the realm of Ultramar. Lehman Russ and his wolves, blunted at the hands of Magnus and his sons on Prospero, were ambushed by the Alpha Legion. Sanguinius and his Blood Angels were walking into a trap at Cygnus Prime. The Lion and his Dark Angels were locked into a brutal war of attrition with Conrad Kurz and his Night Lords. Thousands of worlds that resisted the ascension of Horus were annihilated or made compliant. But as the months and then years began to pass, Horus dedicated much of his attention to a new pursuit. The warp. The primordial truth. This fundamental logic of the galaxy, where sentient life's emotions and beliefs were manifest. From Lorgar and Erebus's instruction, Horus delved deeper into this mirror dimension's power. Demon binding. Weapons and knowledge that were tools he added to his arsenal. Even later a gift from Cygnus Prime. The Red Angel. 
a demon forged from the dark power that lay in the blood angel's line. A gift given to Horus by Erebus, they all knew this was a result of a failed enterprise. Erebus had tried to corrupt his brother Sanguinius on Sickness Prime, something Horus had sabotaged. Sanguinius should have been War Master. He had said that to Petronella Vivar in his dying breaths. He knew it. So he would not allow that same possibility of the champion of these Chaos Gods. Erebus let his mask slip, calling out the War Master with rage in his voice. A kindness Horus returned as he flayed the Cretan's face from him alive, banishing this zealot from his court. He had no more need of Erebus. Did the chaplain not think he too heard the whispers, the promises of the Dark Gods? A dark empire covered the entire northern sector of the Imperium. From his seat of power, Horus ruled a force and Imperium that was greater than that of the current emperors. But all knew that every road, every path led to terror. And the final confrontation, where he would kill his father and assume his rightful place as the new master of mankind. But could he defeat the Emperor? Thirty years he and his father had stood side by side. They had fought back to back countless times and even saved each other's life. So none knew better than Horus the power the Emperor still wielded. On the world of Goro, Horus had seen it. The buildup of colossal psychic energies, power like nothing he'd ever seen his father wield before or even suspected he possessed. All consuming, all powerful, it was the power to extinguish life in every sphere of his existence. Physical flesh turns to ash before it, and what ancient faith had once called a soul could be burned out of existence, never to cohere again when the Emperor annihilated the Orc Beast from existence. How could Horus challenge that? He needed to become as powerful as the Emperor. As he had seen in the warp in his near death upon Davin, the Emperor had stolen this power from these gods of chaos in order to build his apotheosis into a god himself in the future. The Emperor could only be challenged by an equal. Horus would have to acquire this same power and knowledge for himself. To the world of Dwell, Horus would find his answers. Upon the world lay a fortress. Horus knew it was built by the orders of the Emperor during the Great Crusade. But the sons of Horus were ambushed as they lay siege. A strike force formed of the shattered legions of Isvan made a strike for the head. Horus himself. Only to be repelled. The attempt grew a state of paranoia. As so few had almost achieved the impossible and slain the war master. Primarchs had died since this war had begun. It was unfathomable but possible for these demigod beings to die. Through the inner sanctums Horus, Abaddon, Aximand and the new Mournival members, followed by their Justarian Terminator guard, strode. They traversed high vaulted antechambers of fallen pillars and halls of bulk crated frescoes that had once been battlefields. The air thrummed with vibration of buried generators and tasted like an embalming workshop. Between murals of cobalt blue legion warriors, tens of thousands of names were inlaid on the coffer panels with gold leaf. A colossal cryogenerator throbbed with power in the center of the echoing chamber. The great minds, the heroes of the early days of Terran unification and the Great Crusade, swam in this amalgam of glorified dead. Knowledge the Emperor clearly valued a wisdom Horus would tap into to find his answers, leading him to the first piece of the puzzle, Molech. Mortarin and his death guard arrived upon Dwell. The Pale King stood before the War Master as another slithered into view. The last time Horus had seen the Primarch of the Emperor's children, Fulgrim had been the perfect warrior, a snow-maned hero in purple and gold plate. Now the Phoenician was the physical embodiment of an ancient, many-armed destroyer god, serpentine of body and clad in exquisite fragments of his once magnificent armor. Fulgrim was a beautiful monster, 
a being to be mourned for the splendor he had lost and admired for the power he had gained. Motarin looked at their brother in disgust, but Horus only saw a brother, no matter how transformed. And why should he not bask in the secrets the Emperor kept from them? Molech, he asked his brothers. A world Horus, Fulgrim, the Lion and Jagatai had made compliant during the Great Crusade. They were Primarchs, they remembered everything that had happened in their lives to the minute detail. So why did Horus and Fulgrim hesitate to recall their memories on this world? It was hazy, as if their memories had been tampered with. Only one being was capable of such a feat, the Emperor. Something was hidden upon this world, something the Emperor feared even his sons knowing the truth of. A rumbling sound grew, until the three Primarchs and their guard saw a silhouette grow rapidly. A flying machine of death. A fire raptor unleashed a wave of munitions almost point blank at Horus's forces. Blazing hot rounds pierced into Horus and slammed him backwards. He didn't need his visor display to know how badly he had been hurt. His armor was battered but unbreached. Though his skin was burned to the bone, his scalp scorched bare. Shadrach Medusin of the Iron Hand. The Shattered Legions had deployed another ambush. Shells ripped apart the ground forces as even the demon Primarch Fulgrim roared in pain. Motarian darted forward, attaching a chain to his scythe silence and hauling it at the ship, hooking it in place as he screamed for Horus to act. Horus appeared at Mortarian's side, running. Even in his towering armor, he was running, jumping. He vaulted onto the shattered remains of a cryo capsule and launched himself through the air. Hooked by the Death Lord, the gunship was powerless to evade. Horus landed on its prow and knelt to grip the haft of silence as the gunship lurched with the impact of his landing. He saw the pilots' faces and drank in their terror. Horus never normally gave any thought to the men he killed. They were soldiers doing a job misguided and fighting for a lie, but simply soldiers doing what they were ordered to do. But these men had hurt him. They tried to murder him and his brothers. With his mace worldbreaker in one hand and Mortarian silence in another, he brought them down upon the ship and eviscerated it. The ship came crashing down in a blast that flung shrapnel and flame in all directions. Horus waited for the mists to part finally catching sight of the mangled body of Mortarian. He knelt and reached out to clasp his blood-soaked brother to his burnt breast. Mortarian's arms hung limp, tendons ripped from bones and muscles acid-burned raw. Horus wept at the sight of him. Brothers had died in this war. He was prepared for that, but to see one up close and on the brink of death, he let the warmth back into his heart. He loved them, all of them. It didn't change what he had to do, but it only made his journey so much harder. Mortarian lived. The forces of the War Master returned to their fleets, as they all began to heal. Dwell had been destroyed by the ambush, breaking the cryo vaults forever. A knowledge deemed better to be destroyed than in the hands of the War Master. As the fleet loosed their moorings, they roared towards Moloch. For the viewport and intelligence, Horus, Mortarian, Abaddon, Aximand, and the new Mournival could see the might of Imperial defenses. A nighthouse, loyalist contingents of Mars, millions of guard and elements of the Ultramarines and Blood Angels. The garrison force was immense, another layer of defense for the Emperor's secrets. In tomb ships, Horus launched covert forces that awakened on top of the enemy's fleet. It was too late as even Horus himself joined the boarding action of the anchored Imperials. The Ultramarine contingent fought bravely, so Horus honored these warriors with a quick death. The Imperial fleet was broken as Horus looked down upon the enormous world of Moloch. The sons of Horus and the Death Guard forces would direct the main thrust of their attack upon the latter continent. 
Moloch's primary seat of command lay within a mountain valley, a city named for Horus himself during the Great Crusade, Lupercalia. The ground assault began. The entrenched imperial positions were heavily defended as the sons of Horus marched upon them. Kill for the living, kill for the dead ran out across the Vox, as thousands of Astartes smashed against the tide of Titans, Skitari and other Astartes. In a land raider, flanked by a fleet of them, Horus moved, sensations and triggers telling him he was on the right path. He had been here before, he knew it. But the Imperial line held as the sons of Horus slogged through the smoke and mud, until the land raiders became caught out. Titanic blasts exploded the transports, the sons of Horus screaming in panic as Horus limped out of a wreckage. Horus was down on one knee, his taloned hand pressed to the side of his land raider, as though mourning its passing. Blood slicked one side of his dark battle plate, and a length of pike were pierced his side like a spear. The ground began to shake, as titanic humanoid monsters barreled towards the War Master. The Knights of House Devon were going for the kill. Horus looked upon the metallic giants pounding towards him, their guns leveled and locked onto the eye of Horus on his breastplate. He heard footsteps around him and warriors. No, beasts clad in broken sons of Horus plate launched themselves at him. Blitzing spear of sun hot light enveloped Horus as the Lupakai, demon host warriors created from his legions dead, enveloped him. The meat of their tainted bodies took the brunt of the thermal lance, washing over them and scorching their forms to charcoal. Horus's body burned, his armor was broken, his nerves stung with searing pain, but he was alive. I should be dead, he thought. Again he had come so close to death. Horus moved. He broke off the charcoal cage and launched himself at the knights. Worldbreaker swung as he smashed machine legs into splinters. He got in close, using his strength and fluidity to duck and weave between the knight's clunky strikes. Three knights fell as Horus gored their pilots into meat. The rest of the knight's squad fled as Aximan and the rest of the legionaries caught up to their Primarch. Horus felt his body begin to heal and re-knit, but still he felt exhaustion. Across the field the Imperials fell, but the cost was high, so many of his sons lay dead. Onwards, Horus and his sons pressed, fresh armor replacing the War Master's broken plate. To a cave entrance outside the city of Lupercalia, Horus and the Mournival strode. A stagnant lake filled the center of the cavern, its surface a basalt mirror, rotted vegetation. Festering dung and heaps of bone taller than a man were heaped at the water's edge. The ambient temperature dropped by several degrees, and plumes of breath feathered before the War Master and his sons. He had been here before. A mix of nostalgia and anger washed over him, as he struggled to piece together the memories his father had manipulated. Ghost shapes moved through the cavern given life by his picking at the wound in the angles of space and time. Each was numinous and smudged, like figures seen through dirty glass. They were indistinct, but Horus knew them all. His brothers. This was where the Emperor had manipulated his mind. Of course he would. His father had always been a liar. He kept the truth of the warp from him, kept his work on terror from him. Of course he lied. Horus's anger again boiled, a sentiment mirrored as the lake's water began to boil too. The cavern was suddenly gloriously illuminated, an angel of fire with swords of lightning held outstretched. Faceless, remorseless, Horus recognized it for what it was, a sentinel creature, a final psychic trap in place by the Emperor to destroy those who sought to unpick the secrets of his past and it moved faster than Horus could believe. It smashed Horus into the lake as black water filled his lungs. His sons fired upon it to no effect. Horus rose to meet the creature tearing through his men. 
He slammed forward and rocketed Worldbreaker into his chest. If bolt rounds wouldn't work, a weapon forged by its maker would. A weapon forged by the Emperor. The fire angel dissolved away as fire shot out across the cavern, and with its death, Horus remembered Moloch. He remembered everything. He remembered the warp gate. In the war camp headquarters surrounding Lupercalia, Horus sat, reading from a book bound in human skin. Lugar claimed that corpses from Isvan III provided its binding in pages. And, for once, Horus had no reason to doubt him. The book had taught him much of the warp, of demons, rites and bindings. The Red Angel. The demonic manifestation of the Blood Angel's curse floated beside Horus. Using the knowledge, he bound the demon to his will, interrogating it for the truth. Tell me, how can I follow my father? Tell me of the obsidian way that leads to the House of Eyes, the Brass Citadel, the Eternal City, and the Arbors of Entropy. Horus drew his talon back and sunk it into the corrupted meat of the demon, pulling it in close as it snarled. In blood, the demon spat. The path can only be opened in blood. Lupercalia's siege ramped up until the Imperial defenders fell. The Ultramarine and Blood Angel contingents annihilated. The mortal defenders and knights broken. The last time I entered this city, I was paraded in glorious triumph with Jagatai and the Lion, said Horus. I marched at Father's right hand and the people cheered my name. Now they looked on in fear through the rubble and smoke. No, one day they would praise his name again. He would return victorious after he had taken terror. And to do that, he'd have to be more than just an emperor. His father's only mistake was his breaking of the oath he had given these gods of the warp. So what if one honored the bargain, and still emerged with power that matched the master of mankind? Horus would no longer be just a man, just a Primarch. He would be a god. Horus liked that. Horus, the god. In a cave in the heart of Lupercalia, Horus found what he was looking for, with Abaddon, Aximand, Falcus Kyber and Mortarion by his side, they raced into the cavern's depths, the narrow corridors shrinking further as they delved deeper. Boltram slammed into the Justarian Terminator shields, a large contingent of ultramarines guarding a mortal woman were anchored at the edge of sight. Horus glimpsed it. A simple obsidian rock formation, and he knew he had found it. The ultramarines gave their lives to the last, clearly buying time for this mortal woman. Horus panicked. Something was wrong, and he would not risk everything he had sacrificed so far to fail now. He rushed in front of his men as Mortarion followed. He slammed his talon through the mortal woman, tossing the dying corpse to the ground. Horus looked upon her, realizing he felt the echo of his father's power within her. Who was she? What was she trying to do? The bleeding mortal woman looked into the war master's face. She saw no pity, no mercy, but curiously she saw regret. She struggled to speak, and the war master knelt to hear her final words as the life bled out of her. Even souls ensnared by evil maintain a small bridgehead of good, she said. I want you to remember that at the end. Horus looked puzzled for a moment, then smiled. In that face the mortal woman saw the echoes of the charismatic man who had made worlds kneel, a man who once represented the greatest star in the Imperium, the guide to a golden age that was now Ash. Horus stood. He walked to the obsidian structure. From Davin to now, it had been an ocean of blood. A journey that had asked so much of him. A betrayal of his father, his brothers and the Imperium. A path he had no choice to make. Horus laid his hands upon the black stone, 
and prepared to follow in the footsteps walked by the master of mankind. Blood. The path could be only open in blood. Do it. Mortarion spun silence around his body. The blade flashed. Horrors howled as the Death Lord's Reaper cut him from clavicle to pelvis. The pain was ferocious. Its savagery took him all the way back to Davin's moon, and Yugen Temba's stolen blade. Blood jutted from the wound and sprayed the black wall. Through eyes wet with pain, Horus saw unfinished sigils and arrangements of arcane significance. Their brightness was dying, washed away by the tide of his blood. The gouges his talons had torn were bleeding. His blood and the woman's mingled, and Horus saw hair-fine cracks spreading from where he'd marked the wall. He grinned through the pain. Worldbreaker swung to his shoulder. Time to earn your name. He said. The Emperor's gift swung around in a sledgehammer arc and smashed the wall to shards. Absolute darkness spilled into the chamber like a physical thing, as though an ocean of dark matter filled the mountain above and was now pouring out. Horus felt hurricane winds tear at him, yet was unmoved. He felt the cold of space, a soul deep chill that enveloped him in ice. He was alone floating in an empty void. No stars illuminated him. He had no memory of passing through the gate, then berated himself for so literal an interpretation. The gate beneath the mountain was not a literal portal, separating one space from another, but an allegorical one. Just by spilling his blood upon the stone that was not stone, he had passed through. By enacting his desires with Worldbreaker, he had hurled himself heedless into the domain of gods and monsters. A realm he knew of only in myth, and the ravings of lunatics put down in prescribed texts, and lurid works passed off as fiction. This was the place unconstrained by the limits of the physical world. The laws governing existence in the material world held no sway here, and were endlessly flouted. Even as he came to that understanding, the void surrounding him conspired to refute that notion. A world faded up, a terrible place of bone-white sands, and blood-red mountains and orange skies, lit by global fires. The air tasted of ash and regret, of sorrow and fudicity. Horus heard the clash of swords, but no battle. The plaintive cries of lovers, but no flesh. Whispers surrounding him, plotting and scheming, as he felt the cycle of entropy on his flesh. Old cells dying, new ones born to replace them. He blinked away the heat of the sky, now seeing it wasn't the orange of a reflected blaze, but the blaze itself. The heavens were on fire from horizon to horizon, a firestorm blaze over distant mountains, swollen by forks of ruby-red lightning rippling upwards from their summits. Horus felt the ground beneath him become more solid, and looked down to see that he stood on a circle of flagstones, fashioned from obsidian. Eight radiating arms vanished into the far distance, and the landscape twisted into hideous ways along each of the pathways. Acres of wire grew with the moaning bodies of his closest sons, hung upon barbed spikes. Flickering light skimmed desolate bogs that burped and hissed with the decay of rotting corpses. Silken deserts of serpentine fog banks, of perfumed musks. Labyrinthine forests of clawed branch trees clung to a series of rounded hills each with eight doors set around their circumference. I've traveled realms like this before, said Horus, though there was no one to hear, no one obvious at least. Each of the four cardinal paths ended at a mountaintop fortress to rival that of the Emperor's palace. Their walls were brass and gold, bone and earth. They glimmered in the ruddy light of the firestorm. Screams issued from each of them, and booming laughter of mad gods 
rolled down from the peaks. They are mocking you, said a voice behind him. Horace turned, knowing what he would see. The cruel Angelus was the red of a battlefield sunset. Its armor no longer splintered and broken, its face no longer a charred nightmare of agony. The chains encircling his body were gone, but the light of extinguished sun still burned in his dead eyes. Why are you here? I am home, said the Red Angel. I am unbound. The cold iron Erebus hung on me has no power here. Nor do the warning oaths cut into my skin. Here I am the sum of all horror, the thirster after blood, and the devourer of souls. Horus ignored its grandstanding. So why are they mocking me? You are a mortal in a realm of gods. You are an insect to the pantheon. Insignificant and unworthy of notice, a fragment of dust in the cosmic wind. Horus sighed. Noctua was right. All you warp things are ridiculously overwrought. Razored bone talons ripped from its gauntlets. Curling horns tore from its brow. You are in my realm, where you will see only what we wish you to see. I can snuff you out like a candle flame, War Master. If you're trying to intimidate me, you're doing a poor job of it, said Horus, taking a step towards the demon. Let me tell you what I know. You exist in both realms, but if I destroy your body, your time in my world is over. The angel laughed and stepped to meet his advance. Demons never die. No, but they do get incredibly tiresome, said Horus, reaching up to wrap his hand around the red angel's throat. He lifted it from the ground and squeezed. It spat black ichor, and the fire in its eyes blazed. Release me! It roared, clawing at his arms. Blood welled from the cuts and splashed the mirror black flagstones. Black veins of disintegrating blood vessels spread down Horus's arm at the demon's touch. He felt the internal mechanisms of his body decaying, but only crushed the demon's neck harder. You will die for this! One day, perhaps. But not today. You weren't sent here to kill me. You're here to guide me. Your masters need me, so take me to their fortresses, speak my name, and tell them the galaxy's new master would treat with them. Horus dropped the Red Angel, and for a moment he thought it might fly at him in a rage. Booming thunder rolled down from the mountains. Bellows of anger, squeals of delight, and more sibilant whispers. A million voices swept the harsh, nightmarish landscape and the Red Angel's claws retreated into its gauntlets. Very well. I will take you to the Ruinous Powers, it said with a hiss of venom that curdled the air. The Obsidian Way is the eternal road. It is perilous for flesh and soul. It is not for mortals to walk, for its dangers are... Shut up. Just shut the hell up, said Horus. Horus Lupercal fell through the oil-black surface of the gate and crashed to his knees before Abaddon and Kyber. Behind him, the darkness of the gate vanished with a bang of displaced air. Only a solid wall of mountain rock remained, as though the gate had never existed. Horus stood to his full height, and Aximan's eyes widened at the sight of him. The War Master had aged. Chthonia had shaped him molded him into a warrior of flint-hard lines and cruel beauty. Two centuries of war had left no mark upon him, but moments beyond the gate had done what the passage of time could not. Silver streaked the stubble upon his scalp, 
and the grooves at the corner of his eyes were deeper and more pronounced. The face Aximand had devoted his life to serving was now that of an ancient warrior who had fought for longer than he could ever have imagined, who had seen too much horror and whose campaigning days had bled him dry. And yet the fire and purpose in his eyes was brighter than ever, nor was that fire simply confined to his eyes. Aximand, Abaddon and Kyber backed away from Horus, each of them dropping to their knees in wonder as the power filling the Primarch bloomed in the material world. Even Mortarion, that most stubborn of Primarchs, bent the knee to Horus in a way he had never done for the Emperor. Horus grinned, and all trace of the war-weary ancient was banished in the blink of an eye. In his place was a mortal god, brighter and more dangerous than ever, filled with a power that only one other being in all existence had wielded before. Yes, said Horus, I found exactly what I was looking for. Horus Lupercal emerges from the realm of chaos, and his power near matches the emperor of mankind. Horus stood before the gods, creatures he had allied with, simply in the beginning, tools he thought he could use to unseat the emperor, but now he has seen gods. In the realm of sentient thought and madness, Horus follows a path set by each of the pantheon of Korn, Nurgle, Slanesh, and Zinch. He fulfills quests, he battles in armies of demons, he wanders in a realm where time is flux. What he sees, what he achieves is almost unimaginable, and the truth would only ever be known to him. When he emerges only moments after stepping through in the material universe, he is changed. Power radiates from him. He looks older, something thought impossible for a Primarch. The knowledge and power offered by the Chaos Gaunts. The strength promised since Davin is finally Horus's. He knows the truth of his creation, of how the Emperor used knowledge taken from the gods to forge him and his brothers. They are of the warp, and even more floods Horus's veins. It swells in his body, but also infects his mind. His worst excesses are accentuated. He becomes the worst version of himself. And yet he is so far above humanity that he struggles to hold on to human emotions. Where his father, the Emperor, was able to take this knowledge and stave off the corrupting power of chaos, Horus has aligned with it. The Horus that sought to use the warp as a tool now finally believes wholeheartedly in the Pantheon. Though still that ego, one he had hidden under a mask of charisma, is still there. He still believed it's all about him. For the first time, even since Ulanor, Horus feels like he truly inhabits the title of War Master, something he had struggled to live up to in his mind. His armor sheds the green of his legion, and dons the black of chaos undivided. His armor is bulked out. He is a hulking beast that finally inhabits his role as champion of chaos. And he is going forward to bring the blessed union of humanity and the warp. The Legion leaves Moloch and returns to the vengeful spirit. But upon the bridge, Horus finds the captured remnants of an infiltration unit. They are Astartes. Their armor is gray and has been wiped of their previous legion colors. He looks down to see a man he long thought dead. One he had spoken to on 6319. Or the folly of sorcery and its belief. A former member of his Mournival, Captain Garviel Loken. Loken looked up to his gene father, Horus Lupercal. Horus was possessed of a powerful dynamism, 
a charge had passed from him to those he beheld. To be in his presence was to know that gods walked amongst men. A hyperbolic sentiment, but one born out of those fortunate enough to have met him. That power, that essence was magnified now. Horus looked upon his son, one he had betrayed, one he had tried to kill along with thousands at Isvan III, and yet here he was, alive, surrounded by a squad of lost sons of other Primarchs. What were they plotting? Why were they here? Fenrisian runes had been found etched across the vengeful spirit. Were they making it for Russ? Oh, how pitiful. Did that broken legion really believe they had a chance? Horus offered Loken what he knew in his heart he desired. A place back at his side. Horus saw the effect his words had upon his son. The conflict that raged beneath. He wanted to see it. He wanted Loken to break his bond to the Emperor. To choose him. To choose brotherhood and his way. He would embrace his return. And then he would illuminate him. Just as he did upon 6319. Come back to me, Garviel, said Horus. Feel that warmth again. Don't you want to be part of the greatest endeavor the galaxy has ever seen? But Garviel Loken looked Horus in the eyes and saw nothing of the great man he followed. Where was the Horus who loved and fought for his sons? Where was the Horus who knelt before the Mournival to give his oath of moment? Where was the Horus who wanted to be more than just a warrior? A being who wanted to leave a legacy of hope and diplomacy? Loken told Horus he was part of the greatest endeavor the galaxy had ever seen. And that was the Great Crusade. The bridge erupted into violence as the Grey Marines broke their bonds, charging at the sons of Horus. Duels and desperate struggles washed across the ground until the Acton Cruz, agent of Malkador and former Lunar Wolf died at the hands of Horus. The War Master effortlessly impaling him upon his talon and ripping both his hearts out. The Acton Cruz died in Loken's arms as the sons of Horus surrounded the Imperials. Horus sat disappointed in his throne as Loken rose renouncing Horus, and promising he would fight him until the end of his days. The glass of the bridge shattered. An Imperial Stormbird loosed a volley that shot the bodies and knights errant into the vacuum of space. Horus and his sons clamped their magnetized boots as the little fish ran. They were of no consequence, no more distraction, for now Horus had what he needed to challenge the Emperor himself. Months of preparation and battle plans followed as Horus prepared his armies for the last stroke, the spear tip towards terror. Within his inner sanctum, the champion of chaos sat. He looked around his libraries, his trophies and gifts, all that he had acquired over the centuries, to the very stars themselves and the billions of miles of endless space. Specks of light swam in that ocean of dust and shadow. War Master. That weight had been heavy. It divided and separated as much as it elevated. Never more than now did he feel alone. The Master of Mankind. The title was just in sight. This war had taken nearly a decade. Thousands of worlds conquered, intimidated or raised in his name. The legions of his traitorous brothers had let the galaxy burn, and soon he would forge a new Imperium. But he lamented at the tear of ally that stood beside him. He knew it. He was surrounded by the broken and flawed. He struggled to control the growing personalities of his brothers, some too drinking in the power of the war. They acted like children, feeding their petty egos and seeking to accomplish their own goals. And in the actions they promised they bring failures. How many of his loyalist brothers still stood after their deaths had been guaranteed to him. He wondered if this was how his father had felt. Gilliman, 
Oh, perfect Gilliman with his data slates and quills. This war would have been over if he had stood beside him. Korax would not have made the same tactical failures as the untrustworthy Alpharius. All the brothers he wished to join him stood against him, and he would have to reforge the Imperium with these broken monsters. Did they think they were even half the Primarch he was? No, only he, Horus Lupercal, was capable of such a feat. Only he could have brought them this far. Perhaps that was why his father had named him Warmaster, because he feared what he was capable of if he had not. A confessional Horus spoke to, in the presence of the skull of Ferris Manus. In the Tresolian sector the vengeful spirit hung. The capitulation of Mechanicum facilities and forces in the system was almost complete. To the Warmaster personally they bowed, as once again the Warmaster's fleet loosed their moorings, as they prepared to meet at a rally point for the push towards terror. But from the void an ambush was sprung. Using the gravity well and solar radiation between the two Trisolian system stars, the Space Wolves' entire legion launched towards the traitor armada. An almost reckless assault as the two fleets began to trade munitions as illuminated the miles of cold dark space between them. The Wolves could not hope to overwhelm their enemies, but that was not what they were trying to accomplish. The entire fleet rushed toward the vengeful spirit. They were going to cut off the head. At the spear tip of Lehman Russ's flagship, the wolves cut through Horus's fleet. Boarding torpedoes streamed across the void, ramming into the ceramide frame of the vengeful spirit. The ship had wolves in its belly, as Russ and his sons slammed against the sons of Horus within the tight corridors. Some of the Fenrisian runes, marked by Loken's team, have been found, but not all, as Russ and his host made for the bridge. Russ and his sons again rocketed into a large hangar space, as equally the sons of Horus rushed to meet them. Blood, ceramite, and bone lasted the walls and floors, and Astartes killed each other, until a voice boomed across the battlefield. Cease. Such power was imbued in that command that all warriors faltered. Green and grey armoured figures stepped back from one another, eyeing each other with unshakable hatred, but they were compelled to hold their peace by Horus's word. No matter how much they wished to fight, Horus looked upon his barbarian brother, the Wolf King's mask. One Horus knew he wore, just as he had done, slipped. Shock and horror rippled across Russ's face, as he saw what Horus had become. Horus grinned. It was too wide and leering, not a human expression, but the smile of something else pushed out through a mortal face. It shrank back into his features, and his expression became sorrowful. Stop this now, Russ, he said. Listen to me. I have learned the truth. I have seen the future. I know what disaster our father will inflict upon our species. Russ looked around him. The corruption and taint. The flayed skins and horrific scenes that represented this truth. Did Russ, their father's lapdog, hope to defeat him, thought Horus. Could he now see the difference in the power they wielded? How he was utterly outmatched? Russ in horror told him he was not himself. He was sick, manipulated. Come with me to terror. The Emperor can heal you. I am not wounded, Horus spat back. I have been made whole. Before I was but a pawn, now I am the master of my destiny. I will overthrow our father and bring a new era of power to mankind. An era of cruelty, said Russ. Look at your warriors. They have become monsters, though not so much as their father. Monsters, roared Horus. I have seen the black future the Emperor will bring upon us. He cares nothing for humanity. 
The Great Crusade is a lie, Russ. He cares only for its apotheosis. You and I, who were his tools to be cast aside. He will let the souls of a trillion human beings burn to sate his eternal hunger. I know. Horace offered Russ to join him. Fight for truth. Embrace the primordial way and help him overthrow the tyrant emperor. But Russ rejected the outstretched hand. The Wolf King had come to slay a monster. At his side, Russ raised a golden spear that emanated brilliant power. Horus felt the hand of the Emperor's power upon it and raised Worldbreaker. Horus charged, propelling the many tons of his adapted Terminator plate into a thunderous run with ease. His giant maul he held high overhead, ready to strike. Russ met the blow with a double-handed block, taking the maul's head on the blade of his spear. A shockwave of empiric energy blasted outwards, knocking space marines over and tumbling them head over heels. Horus struck again, and Russ staggered back. Bolt guns roared a thunder to match the lightning of their clash, and the battle was joined once more. The Wolf King was outmatched, but the very presence of the spear banished much of Horus's warp strength. The duel was now Primarch versus Primarch. Russ leaped forward, only to be battered back time and time again. The relentless superhuman strikes of Horus ruined his armor as he desperately tried to parry. There was no possibility the Wolf King would win, Horus thought. But Russ didn't have to win. The Wolf King stepped into the blow, locking Horus in place as he thrust the Emperor's forged spear into Horus's gut. Howling, Lehman Russ pushed again, plunging the eager tongue of his blade into the War Master's guts. Horus roared in agony, and his men faltered in dismay. His maul fell from his fist, and he began to shake tremendously. His head jerked back, and a blast of white hot soul fire blazed from his mouth, cracking the armored cow curve above his head. Skittering lightning crackled over the two brothers. Violet light blazed from his wound and the edge of the blade shone golden. It too was shaking, its edges blurring, becoming a spear made of nothing but light. And the corrupting light was banished. Horus staggered back and looked at his brother. The absolute confidence he had displayed a few moments before was absent. His flesh hung sackly upon his skull. He had aged a thousand years in a moment. It was like Horus had taken a breath after drowning for so long. He felt a part of him awaken that had been crushed and buried. Russ, he said hoarsely. He looked so vulnerable. Even souls ensnared by evil maintain a small bridgehead of good. Horus felt the emotion swell within him. I am sorry, brother. I shouldn't have been so jealous. He had never gotten past it. The fact that he had to share their father. How much it had hurt him. He wanted to be first. Always. He wanted the attention. It was akin to orbiting a star. Only to drift away from its warmth. The cold of the dark poisoning him. Lehman, Lehman, you have been speaking to me since you arrived here, he said, his voice thick with emotion. I have seen it all. I understand. I had to do it. I had to. The Emperor is the greatest evil in the galaxy, but what have I done to stop him? How many have died? Am I worse than he, who was trying to save the species from him? He had killed so many because the end goal was just. Surely it had to be. He swam in an ocean of blood to justify it. Brothers, allies, worlds had died and it was his fault. He was trying to save humanity, but who would save them from him? Every lie we tell incurs a debt to the truth. Sooner or later, 
that debt is paid, and the regret was eating him alive. Russ hesitated. He offered a hand to his brother. Come with me to terror. It's not too late. Horace, with a face wrecked with emotion, looked to his brother. It was right there. An offer of peace. A chance to end the killing. A return to the embrace of their father. The one he loved. He could. Horace's eyes snapped into a hateful glare. Almost like something possessed him. The corrupting energies rose again from within as he stood. Horace screamed so loudly warriors on both sides stumbled and clutched at their ears. I hear you. I defy you. Horace's words echoed down the eons, coming from a place beyond time and space. This universe will burn as countless others have burned before it. There can be no victory against chaos. If you cannot accept its power and its glory, then you shall die. The Emperor is doomed and I will kill him myself. Horus raised his weapons and gored Russ. The Wolf King was thrown back as Horus marched forward to kill him. Russ's sons leapt at the War Master as others dragged him away kicking and screaming. With each swing, Space Wolves died as Horus cut them down until nothing but an ocean of blood, bone and ceramite was left. The Space Wolves retreated, the majority of their legion dead upon the vengeful spirit. Russ feeling his consciousness fade, lamenting at how he talked to him. He got to talk to his brother, the true Horus. The traitor forces had won, but Horus felt hollow in his victory. For how elevated he was, Russ and that damn spear had wounded him. He should have swiped him aside like it was nothing. The Imperial Gambit had failed, as Horus and his armada pushed the last bastion before the Sol system. To the sector of Beta Garmin, the War Master's fleet sought to meet the shored up defences of Dawn. Billions died in the war for the sector as Horus broke the last resistance before the throne world. But in the wake of victory, Horus faltered. Those months since his battle with Russ, a dread had been building within. The Apollonian spear, wielded by Russ and forged by the Emperor, had left its own taint, a poison that the War Master struggled to resist, even as the power of chaos flooded his veins. It was knowledge. That was a spear's gift. And it wounded more than just his body. It wounded his soul. The cut where Russ had plunged the spear in opened. Blood began to pour out as Horus slumped to the deck. His sons rushed to his side, carrying their lord to his throne. Ethereal cries rose as the warp seeped out and flowed around them. Horus felt his mind fading, the tendrils of unconsciousness swallowing him as even his physical form began to flicker. His eyes were open but distant. Finally the wound closed up, but the damage was far beyond physical. His sons knelt before him, unable to do anything. It was a repeat of the dread they had felt at Davin, as the War Master was dying. What had the spear done to him? Why did he feel the rush of human emotions pouring in him once again? My brothers, summon them, Horus rasped. Ulanor, Ulanor, he whispered. And then the great Horus Lupercal was silent, his eyes shut. He sat bleeding and unconscious upon his throne. No. It couldn't end here. He had to be there. The day he would slay the Emperor. Pain is an illusion of the senses. Fear an illusion of the mind. Beyond these only death waits as silent judge o'er all.
to defeat death, you must become it. The newcomer is striding into battle, crashing out of nowhere, swinging a scythe like Vorx's father did, two-handed, back and forth. He is huge, not as huge as the Pale King, but far greater than any mortal man, and the power in those reaping arcs is incredible. He has already wounded the Pale King, cut it open, spilling a mass of entrails over its flabby stomach. And he is not stopping. He is pressing on, driving it back, goading it. The Pale King tries to respond, but it is too slow, too slack, and its smiles are ripped from it. Vorx gets up, his lungs burning. He is bleeding, but barely feels it. The spike is still in his hand, and he tries to use it, jabbing at the Pale King's monstrous foot. His efforts are useless, but he keeps at it, trying to drive the sharp point in. The newcomer is unbelievably fast, unbelievably strong, whirling around and sending his cloaks flying like flails. The Pale King is lowing now, blubbering, weeping blood. Impossibly, it is being killed. Others of the settlement see this and join the attack. Suddenly, they are hunters, not fodder. They strike out, barely believing they are doing it, and the Pale King reels away, bewildered by the charge. In truth, however, none of them matter. Vorx does not matter. It is this newcomer who is doing the work. He is single-handedly carving the monster into ribbons using that scythe in ways Vorx has never dreamed of. He harries it back into the fog. He cuts it apart in there, throwing out specks of blood that halt and shiver on the stones. Eventually, the bellowing dies out. The whoosh of the great steel sickle stills. Mist closes over the scene of carnage, as if abashed by it. Vorx is on his knees, exhausted, staring into the murk. The rest of the survivors stare at one another. Vorx begins to wonder if it has been some kind of dream. He begins to wonder if the newcomer was a phantom sent from the heights, just another trick by this world that loathes them. But then the cowed figure re-emerges, unbowed, tall as the sheaf of uncut corn. He looks barely troubled by his exertions. His hood has fallen back a little, revealing grey, smooth flesh. It is the most beautiful face Vorx has ever seen, like theirs, but as hard and clean as a stone. The newcomer looks directly at Vorx, and the intensity in the yellow eyes makes him want to blush, or laugh, or burst into tears. Bravely done, says the newcomer. Vorx cannot reply. He feels as if his heart will burst, but then he remembers the death. He had seen his father's death, and he rushes to find the body. He sees quickly that his mother is motionless, along with so many others. He is an orphan now, and that is as good as a death for him too. Now the cold becomes unbearable. He looks one way, then the other, and every view sinks him further into desperation. Vorx expects the newcomer to leave. There is nothing to keep him here, for the settlement, having been stripped of its best workers, will likely wither long before the winter. But he does not. He remains with them, lifting the wounded from the earth and carrying them back to what remains of the shelter. Vorx hangs back on the verge of shameful tears, not knowing what to do or where to go. Eventually, the survivors gather in the old courtyard. Rigan, the headman, too blind and ill to fight, shuffles down to his knees before the newcomer, 
but is prevented by the gentle extension of a giant hand. No kneeling, the newcomer says. The time for that is long over. He turns to the rest of them. I show you a new way, the way of endurance. You have no weapons, I will give you weapons. You have no armor, I forge armor that does not fail. You are sickened. He smiles, and it is chilling. That too can be a strength. They are hanging on his words. His voice is strangely soft, thin like a gust of rain-frozen wind. But it is pure with conviction. Vorks has never heard a voice like it. There are many gathering. Every valley is moving. They have divided you for too long, keeping you from discovering one another. Together, unbroken, you can be mightier than you know. Join me and fear no witchery again. Vorks looks at the rest of them, his throat tight with hope. For a moment, he thinks they will rise up, raise their crude weapons into the drizzle, and declare allegiance there and then. But this is a beaten place, populated by beaten people. Rigan glances over at the survivors, hunched and bloody in the fog, and there is no fight left in him. The newcomer looks down at Rigan. Then he looks at the rest of them. There is no scorn in that slender face, just appraisal, just a judgment. In the end, he nods. He reaches up to his cowl and pulls the fabric back over his head. The choice is made, he says. Then he turns and strides back along the rutted path. As he goes, the heel of his scythe sinks deep into the slurry. It only takes a few moments for him to fade into nothingness again, sighing into the great white miasma that forever surrounds the settlement and hems it in. Vorx watches the whole time. Of all the horror, that is almost the worst. Now the deaths mean nothing at all. Now that brief, terrible window of defiance has closed again. By the time he turns back, he can see the survivors limping over to Rigan, congratulating him. They are already talking of replanting, of rebuilding the walls that were torn down but never kept anything out, even when they stood. As he stares at the meager crowd, a vivid certainty flashes before him, as sharp and clear as all else is muffled. He sees the settlement limping on, the vice of starvation clamping tighter around it, the rib cages becoming even more scrawny, and a slow death coming, without honor and without resistance, albeit comforting and understandable. For they have always been weak and cannot be expected to fight, and must accept with equanimity what comes their way, for it is the will of the universe. And that is the greatest horror of all. Even before he really understands what he is doing, Vorx is pushing himself back to his feet, turning, slipping in the grime, and scrabbling towards the perimeter. He hears voices calling his name, but does not turn back. He sees where his father's body lies, and does not return to it. He stumbles further out through the churned fields with their black rows of barren soil and leafless trees. It is hard to run far in that country, and the mud is too thick and the air is too foul, so he marches as fast as his young legs will bear him, head down, suppressing the tears that would burst free if he thought for a moment of what he was leaving behind. He can see the deep marks of the scythe's heel running before him, scoring out the path to follow. And he locks his mind onto it, the way becomes hard very quickly. The ground rises and sharpens, and soon he is in country he does not know. The rocks are greasy, the wind like a knife, his clothes become leaden with moisture, and they hang slick across his shaking skin. He cannot retain his sense of certainty for long. His feet keep moving, but soon doubts crowd in. 
sapping his energy and draining the will from him. Still, he does not look back, for he knows that if he does, he will see the last of everything comforting and familiar, and that will break him. Head down, legs lifting, time slows to a pain-filled crawl. His shivering becomes a shuddering, his breath becomes shallow and rapid. The ground keeps on rising, ever rising, and the air spoils into an acrid haze that stings his lips. By the end, he is on his knees, panting like a dog. He understands the folly of his actions and the wisdom of Rigan's. But now, there is nothing to do but persevere. His palms are cut raw, his knees stripped of skin, but he keeps going. He does not ever discover how long the newcomer was watching him before the end. There are some questions best not asked, though he thinks now it must have been many hours. By the time the figure intervenes, lifting Vorx carefully from the acid-washed rock and pressing a woolen mask doused in something herbal over his mouth and nose, he can barely see or hear. He glimpses a blurry image of that stone hard face up close, just as before. This pain, are you strong enough? Vorks takes a strained breath and feels the cut of the world's spite in his throat. Make me strong. The Pale King, the Death Lord, the Prince of Decay, gene father to the Death Guard and son of the Emperor of Mankind, Mortarian, savior of the people, or hypocritical traitor. Three times in his life, Mortarian was forced to submit to the will of a father figure, who was a tyrant with latent psychic powers, and what remains is a twisted and bloated form enslaved to the service of a rotting creature of the warp, a god of death and decay. But who is Mortarian? How did one so opposed to the power of the warp become a very vessel of its corruption? His story begins at the end of the 30th millennium. Of all the fates to inherit, perhaps the worst of all is a home so toxic, so scarred and barren, it despises life itself. Underneath a cloud of miasmic amber mist was the swamped and near lifeless surface of the planet Barbarous. A creature roamed across the toxic mists that encompassed the hills, mountains, and highest peaks. Necair, an overlord, a monster that looked like a burnt bone, charcoal sketch upon diseased pages. He was garbed in a hooded mantle of sailcloth so dark it seemed to eat the light around it. And what could be seen of Nikaia's corp flesh face and hands was nightmarish and alien. If his kind had ever shared any kinship with humans, that history had been seared away and forgotten. Like all of the overlord species, Nikaia was a horror. As if the universe had decided to express the fullness of the word cruelty in a living, breathing being. A divergence rumored to be born from the toxic conditions of Barbarous, and a dark pact with a vile god. Once again, Nekair was obliterating a rival, crushing his territory and forces with the horrifying flesh mutants and stitched, dark magic infused golems. The air was foul at this height, able to burn and bubble the flesh of mortal men in minutes. Yet Nekair heard a sound he thought impossible. A child's cry. Amongst a pile of rotting corpses, a child cried out to the world, lost and alone. Impossible, thought the Overlord. A mere human in this toxic mist should be dead. It wasn't paternal affection or duty that gripped Nikair, but curiosity and jealous spite, a prize a rival had tried to hide from him. All the motivation he needed to take this pathetic, yet special human child for himself. To his fortress grounds near the highest peak on Barbarous, this child was taken. 
his new own holdings below his adoptive fathers were constructed. Amongst the toxic clouds and barren rock, a fortress that barely constituted the word home was given to this child, as well as a name. Mortarian, Child of Death. Mortarian, moments into his existence had only known one thing. Horror. A tearing sensation, as if he had been stolen from somewhere. At the rate of his rapid growth, his intellect and understanding of the universe bloomed. In the bland and rotting ground of his home, he began to learn. In the care, his so-called father was a cruel master, an upbringing Mortarion struggled to call an education. Mortarion felt more like another of Nicaea's experiments, often thrown into grueling physical trials, and yet at times an aide and student of Nicaea's teachings. Despite Mortarion's growing and towering stature, one that over time dwarfed Nicaea, he found himself unable to endure the extreme toxins of Nicaea's personal fortress peak, a poison Nicaea enjoys tormenting Mortarion with calling him weak, just as he did every time Mortarion nearly died. Mutants and vile creatures clashed in the territorial wars of the overlords, a war Nekair would send his precious child to the front lines. Mortarion despised him, his so-called father. How many times had the small scimitar-wielding corpse-like monster leered over Mortarion across battlefields? Mortarion wasn't sure if Nicaea cared for him, in his own twisted way, teaching him to become a cruel and vile monster just like him, or simply enjoyed tormenting him. Maybe he even feared him. Knowledge. Knowledge was power. If you know the truth of something, then you can destroy it, and that is all you need to hold true power. Spiteful words Mortarion felt hammered into his brain by his father. It was the truth of his father and his secrets that was kept from the boy. Mortarion having slyly suggested that he should be allowed books to better fight Nicaea's enemies. To Mortarion the comfort of books and knowledge was his only escape. The old and dusty tomes on history, war, even some glimpses into the experiments of Nicaea. He read and reread them dozens of times, even memorizing them. He even bleached the ink off the pages and began to write down his own thoughts. He relished it, as one of the very few things that was his, a secret even Nicaea did not know. Deep down, as much as Mortarion hated to admit, he desired to know what Nicaea kept from him. Perhaps he could use that to end that monster. Mortarion languished in his prison fortress, his existence a grueling cycle of violence, tests of endurance, and study until after decades he saw it. From a window out on the barren and rocky outcrops, covered in the miasmic toxins he saw them. Humans. Many times Mortarion had seen humanity over the decades. The dismembered parts bound together in Nicaea's constructs, to the slaves hauled up from the valley into his father's laboratories. They were small and weak. He knew he was like them, but different. Up there, watching, you can see us. You can help us. What are you? One of the humans had broken free from the golems. He was fighting back, summoning creatures like some spell or magic. Mortarion looked as he felt his heart freeze. What am I? Who am I? He thought. Paranoia gripped him. Was this another cruel test of his father? They were going to die. The humans. The golems would break them, and if they lasted long enough, the toxins would choke them. What am I? A tool? A weapon? A disappointment? An error? A fool? Am I weak? cold hot rage surged up through Mortarion's body, with such force that he trembled, long buried and long denied, raw unspent defiance now turned to steel, deep within him, the links of a chain forged by cruelty, neglect and spite broke away, 
and suddenly he was snatching at the black powder gun holstered on his hip. Who was he? What was he? That was for him to decide. Because one thing he was done being was a slave. Mortarion leapt down, unleashing the pepper box munitions into the golems. He pounded over the corrupted ground and smashed into the creatures. The wet, slopping mesh of corpses tearing and slumping onto the ground. Only one remained. The young man who called out to him. The haunting voice of Nikair echoed around them, calling back his boy. That he was going to punish him. Mortarin resigned himself to death until the human survivor begged him to come with him. Fight another day, a choice, another that could be his, Mortarin thought. The two escaped, racing down the mountain into the safety of the less toxic valley below. Mortarin asked the man his name. Typhon. Kalas Typhon, the young man replied. Hellas cut. For the first time, Mortarion saw a human settlement, a community, life. For the first time, Mortarion heard music. But yet with all this beauty in a dark place, he couldn't rectify it. Like he didn't possess the tools to appreciate it. It made his blood boil again. The thought of what Nakair had kept from him. What he had been denied. Mortarion and Kalos hung onto the edge of the settlement. Both were outcasts. Mortarion the enormous superhuman figure that some had seen serving under the cruel overlord. Kalas Typhon, whose skin was ashen, evidence of his cursed heritage as the bastard child of an overlord. Both coming from a life led utterly alone. As Mortarion sat down, he observed the humans. Look at them. They grasp at every tiny spark of life, desperate and afraid in all their thoughts and deeds. Their existence is nothing but fear and dread. How much was Mortarion talking about them or himself? He had had enough, enough of fearing his father's revenge, of living like this. He and the people of Barbaras had suffered this cruel world and the predatory horrors of the overlords who raided them for experiment turning them into flesh monsters and tools. Mortarin got up and strode to the farmers of the village. Kalas followed him to the animal-drawn cart as Mortarin picked up an enlarged scythe. It felt right in his hands. With a demigod's speed and strength, began to reap the grain as the people looked on in awe. It would begin here. He would earn the people's respect. He would feed them, train them, and then he would save them, free them from tyranny. Mortarion lent out his strength. The prejudice of the people swallowed. As they hurried to gather the reaped grain, Kalas saw it. What could be done if they all worked together? A scream. A civilian trapped under a fallen cart. The mists. The terror that encroached at night was approaching. They were far from the safety of the walls and the warding torches. Mortarion pounded over the distance. He placed his hands underneath and lifted the enormous grain cart, the sight shaking the farmers into silence. Kalas and the mortal men dragged the girl into safety, but they were too late. The toxic mists had arrived, and with them the monsters that stalked them. Mortarion glimpsed the black, cloaked shape rise up from the stands of uncut wheat and flash through the air in silence. He saw it come up behind a man and dive in for the kill. Men began to die as Mortarion heard the laughter. An overlord. Nikair? No. Desalem. A minor one. A scurrying rat that fed on the dregs of greater overlords. The people around him began to choke and scream as vicious flesh golems pounced on them. They ran from the toxic mists, just as Deslam knew they would. But he had miscalculated. There was one who did not need to run. One who could endure it. Mortarin broke into a sprint. Clutching the scythe once again, he launched into the air and raised the scythe to the amber-tinged night sky and split the arrogant monster in two. 
The surviving creatures looked at him and felt fear. Mortarion let them live. They would spread the message to the Overlords and Nicaea that he was coming. It started with one village, but it spread like wildfire. The many enclaves of humanity, afraid and enduring a short pitiful life, saw the silhouettes approach through the toxins, but their fear melted as they saw that they were humans, led by one enormous figure, Mortarion, the Reaper of Men, the Death Guard, men and women armed with the very size that reaped the fields, armoured in proto-powered armour that kept the worst of the toxins out. They were an army, freedom fights that chased the monsters and overlords into the mists, dealing vengeance and death. The Death Guard never retreat. We always resist. We do not fear death. We are not weak. Over the years, the army grew. Towns and cities were liberated as they launched a guerrilla campaign into the Overlord's territory. One by one, the necrotic monsters and their vile creations began to fall. Too stubborn and hateful to unite against the so-called humans they deemed so weak. Through time and victory, the people had come to accept Mortarion, though many still kept their distance from Kalas. The Reaper of Men, they called him. The Hero. The Savior. Though Mortarion didn't quite understand, he shared food and drink with them, sat around the flame and listened to them. They even drank poison together, a tradition born on this hateful world. If we are not strong, we will not win. If we cannot defy poison and darkness and pain, we cannot stand against death. My bastard of a foster father taught me one valuable lesson that I have never forgotten, and it is this. Everything is a test. Life is a challenge that must be endured. Those who are not testing themselves every day are those who are already dying. And the greatest test had finally come, with the return of Kalas Typhon and his forces. The last humans of Barbarus had been liberated, and only one of those vile creatures remained, Nicaea. To the halls of the Death Guard's greatest city, Mortarion unveiled to Kalos his final solution, the tool to take him to the gates of his father's toxic hold, powered armor, functional, and the best the people of Barbarus could produce. The climb would begin soon, Nicaea would die, his so-called vile magics would die. Mortarion's brothers and sisters would be free, and Mortarion would be free. Mortarion, surrounded by Kalos Typhon and an elite cadre, made the climb. Their rough and baroque barbarian features were so often twisted by the toxins, became lit up. As from the summit, a comet of fire came rocketing towards them. Men who had fought besides Mortarion from their earliest days, perish in a blaze of hate and sorcery, conjured by the maniacal laughing they care. Mortarion was furious. How dare that monster use these vile magics on his men? They couldn't get close. The toxins were eroding their armor. They were too slow. Mortarion's anger was apocalyptic. They were so close, but the others were holding him back. He wasn't like them. He knew deep down he was a weapon, he knew it in his heart, but at the back of his mind he pondered, for which war was he created for? This one. Typhon begged Mortarion to retreat, an unheard of suggestion on Barbarus. The end was in sight, but it would cost everything. With extreme reluctance, Mortarion and the surviving Death Guard retreated. Down the mountain they approached their stronghold, only to see the citizens gathered. The liberated people gathering in crowds, speaking of a newcomer that had arrived from the sky, offering gifts. Immediately Mortarion's suspicions grew, an outsider on the eve of their greatest victory, gifts, as if anything on Barbarus was ever given except death. This was the day he would set Barbarus free, why now? As they entered the war camp all went silent, a man. No, something more. Dark eyes that were clear and fathomless, yet ancient peered at Mortarion. His features were bronze, 
beautiful and regal, the complete opposite of Barbarin's. His armor was ornate, gold, and crafted with such mastery it made the people's hearts race. To be in this giant's presence, it made them want to kneel. A look of sorrow and warmth shone from the stranger as he regarded the equally large Mortarion. Who are you? Mortarion rasped, the anger still evident in his voice. I am a friend, the giant said, and that he had come to find Mortarion. You have been orphaned from the Imperium for far too long. This world, and thousands more, our lost kindred, it is time to return to the fold, and I promise you, glory and prosperity await. It will be the dawning of a new age. We don't want your glory, outsider, retorted Mortarion, the antagonism crackling away before the surface of his words. Nor your charity, or your Imperium. Barbarus has endured alone for centuries beneath the talons of our oppressors. The Reaper let his anger flare more. Where were you then? The stranger remained calm, speaking of how he could help. He could explain Mortarion's origins. He could help this world, and he could help kill the Overlords. I have no interest in where I was birthed. It matters nothing to me, Mortarion said. Barbarus is where I was born. It is where I was made home. The Death Guard are the only kindred I have ever known. My unbroken blades, and by our hand alone shall justice be delivered to the Overlords. You are not needed here. Mortarion had fought for years to free his people, and on the precipice of victory, he would not hand them over to a new master. The stranger offered Mortarion a deal. If he succeeded alone in destroying the care at the peak, he would leave him and the people of Barbarus alone, but if he failed, he would swear allegiance to him. Perfect, the Reaper of Men spat angrily storming out to collect fresh armor for his next ascent. He would finish this. He would kill that monster who hurt him. He would save his people from enslavement. He was strong enough for them. He was worthy. The thought echoed in his mind. He was worthy. Mortarion began the ascent. He moved faster in his new armor. He climbed higher than he'd ever done before. Even as his suit's klaxons were blaring, the very shell rusting and slopping off. Each step took more out of him than the last, but still Mortarion pressed on, climbing over the clem slick slate of the high crags. Every breath was a labor, taking in a lungful of toxic air and squeezing the last fractions of breathable elements from it. The primitive air tank on his back had run dry hours earlier. His mind was sharp, but draining from the pain. He was so close. The care would die. He thought of the stranger, the familiarity he felt in his presence, the offer of knowledge. No, if he stared into that abyss, what would stare back? His body trembled from the ill effects of the murderous toxins in the air, but still he managed to keep breathing. The care, he screamed. Answer me and face your final justice. But just as he slumped to the gates, his superhuman body failed. Mortarion collapsed to the ground, as finally Nekair approached, looming over him once more. He failed. If he was capable of a tear, he would weep, not for his failure, but for failing his people. A true despair hollowed out the wheezing Mortarion as he prepared himself for death. Do you understand? said a somber voice, following him down to the ground. Defiance alone is not enough. You will not perish this day, my son. A golden figure with a flaming sword approached. As Mortarion's vision blurred, he saw Nekair split apart in one swing. He saw his abuser. He saw his purpose, his path to freedom, die and the realization he failed to save his people from new shackles. I will always hate you, he thought, as the Reaper of Men lost consciousness. We've seen enough, said Sanguinius. We could spend years 
going through the archives of this campaign, but I think we've learned what we came here to learn. Is it time for me to receive my judgment then? Mortarion asked. He stared at the angel in challenge. We are not going to clap you in irons. Mortarion looked at the angel with narrowed eyes. That is no answer. That is craven evasion. I hear sentencing in your voice and your words, brother. He moved to the edge of the roof, then turned around to face his judges. No, you are not my jailers. You are my judges, but know this. I am yours. Your hypocrisy is naked before me. Do we understand one another? We do. I have one last question. I still wonder about the complete purge of the Order. There might have been practical value in keeping some of the mid-level functionaries alive. Or don't you agree? I do not. Every member of the Order left alive would be a piece of its structure preserved. Even the smallest fragments of that structure would have been more poisonous than this air. I did not destroy the Order to then permit the possibility that it might take shape again in some way. Horace looked like he was about to say something else, but kept his peace. It's the tally that concerns me. There are millions to work on it. They will complete the task. It is no impossible thing. Sanguinius glanced at Horus, who nodded, looking pained. Are we agreed, Sanguinius. Are there more questions, or can we say truly that we understand? We can. Very well, said Horus. His face set and grim. He stepped forward. We came to understand, like we said, and now we do. I wonder if you do. No. That is our question. Do you understand what you have done here? I do. I understood it from the moment I undertook this task. The Galaspar you find is the result that I foresaw. It is the correct one. That you intended this does not mean you see it fully. Even you agree with this, Sanguinius? I do. Does that surprise you? It does. Then you do not see it all. And there is something that it is terribly important you will be able to see. There was something in Horus's eyes of the sorrow that had been in their fathers. And that is? The other cost. To whom? To the population of Galaspar. Mortarion grunted in disbelief. They are liberated. Physically, they are. In other respects, they are not. They are traumatized. They have seen death in person sweep through their world. They do not know what freedom is. How could they? Where would they have encountered it? The force that oppressed them was destroyed by a greater one. All they know is destruction. And then there is this tally. They are doing it because it was a command. That's the only meaning they see in it. The meaning of obedience, not the point of the tally itself. I don't know what will happen to them when they are done, and there are no further commands. Do you see? Horus sounded like he was pleading. Liberation is not just the destruction of the oppressor. We can't replace one tyranny with another. Horus paused, and his last sentence struck Mortarion like a poisoned dagger. He felt his effect spread through his veins, cold with a truth too large and awful to grasp fully in the instant. This is what our father wants you to see, Mortarion. He wants you to understand the need for nuance in the crusade. You cannot always be the scythe. Look down below, brother. Look at the hills of bodies. You can see them even from this height. Mortarion looked back and down at the distant ground and the mounds of the dead. On them, the people he had freed were moving like maggots on carrion. Counting and counting. Was that liberation? We can't replace one tyranny with another. The sentence kept echoing in his mind. It set up resonances he did not want to hear. He forced himself to listen to the one Horus wanted him to hear. And maybe Horus was right. Maybe his father's sorrow was right. The look in those eyes. Had there been something other than sorrow in them? 
Had there been the hope that Mortarion would find a destiny richer than the one his first father had bequeathed to him, he shook off the thought and the weaknesses that it came with. He faced Horus again. I see the people of Galaspar. I see what I have done. I would do it again. I have ended the tyranny that enchained them. The tally of the dead is the task of a people who must see and know that their former masters are truly dead. And the cost. Everything has a cost. What do you think would have happened if we had accepted the cost of a blockade and siege? Would the liberty of these people be a sylvan paradise? Perhaps the likes of Rabute would believe in such a vision, but I am no such fool. You are, if you imagine yourself unique in your experience of a lethal homeworld. As you are too, if you think the manner of your conquest has no impact beyond the end itself. You came to Galaspar as the Angel of Death, Mortarion, not as a liberator. That is the core of the matter. If the angel was aware of any irony in his words, he gave no sign of it. Does that displease you, Sanguinius? Perhaps it does not. Perhaps it is useful to use me to burnish your own self-image. You broadcast the execution of the Lord Comptroller to billions. You brought death to this world and began what you call its moment of liberation with death. And yet the Eighth Legion spreads terror by any means it can. It has broadcast its share of executions. I have not seen them on trial. Enough! Horus shouted. Enough! He said again, more quietly and with true sorrow. It is all far beyond enough. We have seen enough. We know enough. Mortarion, you have done enough. Horus lowered his head for a moment, then looked up, regretful yet determined. There is compliance here. Instead, there is a wasteland and a population consumed by their fear of the Imperium, of the embodiment of death. Hear me, Mortarion. The conquest of Galaspar will be forever marked as a tragedy of the Great Crusade. It will never be celebrated. It will be the work of generations for the Imperium to undo what you have done here. You are censured, Mortarion, and your first command will be commemorated by morning. Mortarion said nothing. He was calm in his anger. It felt cold as a tomb. He foresaw this too. Farewell, Mortarion. I take my leave of you. Though I doubt you will believe me, I feel no pleasure in this judgment or in the accomplishment of this task. I hope is that when next we meet, you will agree that our decision this day was the just one. The angel boarded the storm eagle. Horus lingered a moment longer. Please learn from this Mortarion. Learn that there is another path for you. Mortarion stared back at his brother, waiting him out. And at last Horus broke with his gaze and joined Sanguinius aboard the gunship. It roared away, climbing quickly. Mortarion stayed where he was, alone with the sepulchre of anger. Mortarion, liberator of Barbarus, kneels before the Emperor in the wake of Nicaea's death. The Reaper of Men keeps to his oaths and pledges his fealty to his true father, the Emperor of Mankind. And he is not alone. He has equals. He has brothers. From a brutal life on Barbarus to the Imperium of Mankind, a galaxy spanning empire reuniting the lost colonies of mankind. The scale of change is enormous for both Mortarion and the Barbarians. He has gifted the Dusk Raiders, the Astartes, superhuman warriors crafted from his own genetic material, sons to him as he is a son of this Emperor, and he admits they are the greatest warriors he has ever seen. He could have conquered Barbarus in a day with them. He is their Primarch, and will lead them across the stars in the Great Crusade. In the wake of the events on Barbarus, 
he is summoned to his father's side and is immediately unnerved. The finery, the gold and luxury is alien to him. He sees it as almost disgusting. And then there is him, the Emperor, a psyker beyond measure, who in many aspects Mortarian sees Nicaer. He knows this Emperor. His father is better in some ways. He truly has come to bring enlightenment and prosperity. But Mortarian keeps his guard up, as he sees too many similarities with that monster who raised him. If the weight of the failure was not enough, his paranoia of the Emperor leads him to dark thoughts. Why was he cursed to live on Barbarus, despite the power of this master of mankind? Did the Emperor know he would fail? Did he manipulate him to gain his oath? He stole his triumph. Mortarion was meant to be the Liberator, and the Emperor stole that from him too, forever making the Emperor the Liberator one who had not struggled with the people in the brutal war before. A father is beholden to educate his sons. You learned a valuable lesson that day. I saw I had to remind you of your humility, Mortarion. There are some enemies you cannot alone defeat. The Emperor let him lose to learn a lesson, but it was one Mortarion couldn't accept, and he kept his true feelings to himself. The Emperor gifted Mortarion Lantern's Light, a plasma pistol and a legion, one free for him to mould for the Great Crusade. And as Mortarion held the weapon in his grip, he felt excitement. He didn't wish to serve, but he did love to fight. The test of endurance, the purifying flame of war. They did not call him the Reaper of Men for no reason. He would fight in this Great Crusade, for the sheer thrill of battle across the stars. It would be in the wake of a decade of work, moulding the newly donned Death Guard Legion, that Mortarion would face his first war. A conflict so destructive and brutal his brothers were sent to find out the truth for themselves. The Lord of Death would tell them the tale of the Lords of Galaspar, and then he would hear their judgement. They were ready, his legion. Swell with the ranks from Barbarous, the Death Guard were bound to Mortarion's will. Even when they were Dusk Raiders, there had been a grim sense of stoicism to the Legion, one that complemented Mortarion's own. The ships and plates of the Legionaries became reinforced. They were slower, but more enduring. The Reaper's Scythe, favoured by their Primarch, was spread throughout. The philosophy of a slow, Unstoppable wave enduring the brunt of their enemy, as they delivered death. Mortarin was armed in a ceramite plate crafted by his father, but he cast off the pointless ornamentation, painting on the skulls and sunset of the Death Guard. He attached his own mask, filled with the air of Barbarous, a permanent piece of that accursed world always with him. Everything is a test. Life is a challenge that must be endured. Those who are not testing themselves every day are those who are already dying. The Death Guard fleet rocketed towards their target. The first war with the Primarch and Legion unified. The Lords of Galaspar, a rumor Mortarion had heard during his training and recruitment from Barbarus. The Imperial spies had brought back more pieces that let the Primarch assemble the picture. The Galasparian Empire. It was a brutal regime. A multi-planet empire presiding over billions and billions of people. All ruled by the Lords. An extreme fascistic regime. The rule of the Overlords was absolute. An inherited protected class that used those beneath them. The billion slave caste didn't even have names. Forced to work and serve in brutal factories and slave armies. Constantly fed a chemical soup that kept them compliant. 24-7 vox blasts of propaganda blared in every room upon these worlds. And the reward for this uncaring, short and painful life was to be thrown into the food vats. Crushed into a protein paste an unquestioning ruling caste. 
who torture and use those below them. It wasn't hard for Mortarion to see the similarity with the overlords of his home. And here it was, an opportunity for Mortarion to succeed in toppling tyrants. This time. The Galasparian Empire was well fortified. It would take years to bring them into compliance. Unless Mortarion and his legion crushed them in a day. Great meteors with engines strapped to them rocketed past the system's outer defenses. The Death Guard fleet using them as shields as they plunged into the heart of this rotten empire. My Death Guard, when I first came to you, I called you my unbroken blades. I promised you that justice would come from your hands. I vowed that doom would stalk a thousand worlds. On this day, doom comes to the first of them. Humanity suffers on Galaspar. The Order rules this empire, and the Order is as obscene as the subjugation of its people is complete. Justice demands annihilation. Banish all thoughts of mercy, because mercy is the plaything of the coward and the lie of the tyrant. Today, the blade descends on tyranny's neck. Nothing shall stay our hand. No enemy can stand before us. Death is the truth that awaits us all. We march with death. We are one with death. Now let doom and justice be one. For humanity to be free, its oppressors must die. That was the lone sentiment that drove him, and he would pay the cost it took to destroy that evil. Those Death Guard ships that lagged behind were left. Just as on Barbarus there was only attack, there had never been retreat from the Overlords, so it was better to die with the only chance of victory. The Galasparian fleets fell for the ruse, loading too many shells into the meteors, and the Astartes vessels got close enough to break them open. The Lords of Galaspar in their capital threw their people, their resources at the invaders like it was nothing, a meat shield to delay the inevitable. The shadow of Mortarion's fleet loomed over the capital. A thought once so impossible to the Lords of Galaspar it broke their arrogant demeanour. Like shards of flame the meteors exploded on the Primarch's orders, showering the world with impact and death. The world was in chaos. The panicked lords locked down their tower and ordered the military to converge to them, but the Death Guard were already landing, beginning their ground assault. Through smoke and flame, the silhouettes of giants walked, the pounding drum of the march, shaking the poor wretch that dared to peek at the waves of death approaching. They formed a wedge that drove into the mass horde army of the Order, the soldiers of Galaspar surrounded the invaders, and had come to destroy them. But as the attack began, they seemed only to be offering themselves up for slaughter. The leader of the giants carried a massive scythe, and his warriors bore weapons that were made in its image. For all the people that feared the lords, something more terrifying had arrived. Like automatons of flesh, officers guided drugged up hordes of slave soldiers, into the Death Guard that fell in waves. Arcs of blood rained from silence. Mortarion's scythe, at such speed it was as if a razor blur carved men. Mortarion, Tursus, Garrow, Barazin, Typhon, Terrans and Barbarans together waded through thousands of the sacrificed people of Galaspar, thrown at them by those tyrannical lords. The Death Guard had punched to the bottom of the Lord's Tower, and began their ascent. They had 24 hours to reach their target, before enemy reinforcements would arrive. Galaspar would fall in a day, Mortarion vowed, as he and his men plunged into the complex. Layer by layer, Mortarion and the Death Guard ascended, marching headlong into ambush after ambush. Despite their chemical concoction flooding the slave armies, the fear was reaching them. A fact that made the lords inside their bunkers panic. The idea of the common people being afraid of something more than them, truly horrifying them. Mortarion and his death shroud punched their way into an open space, meeting a wall of resistance designed to halt their enemies. Turrets and Lasfire pounded them as tanks charged at the Primarch, 
Flame washed over him. He drove through the inferno, and the force of the blast sought to push him back. His armor temperature soared, and his pain was a deep crimson. He charged without pause, without mercy, and in another moment he could see again as he came through the fire. He jumped, and landed on the turret of a tank in front of him. He swung silence down, and the battle's scythe blade sliced through the turret. With two more blows, he had cut the tank wide open. The metal peeled back as if it were weak as flesh. The crew looked up at him in horror, and his next swipe killed them all, spraying the interior with blood as their bodies burst apart. Watari cleaved through more tanks, until they rammed him, attempting to drown him in a tide of metal and flame. Matarian couldn't breathe. Everything was black and red. Somewhere far away, the engines howled, and Tread shrieked for grip on Rockrete. The pressure was mounting. He was pinned and he had no leverage. No, he would not die here. He would endure. For humanity to be free, its oppressors must die. The Lords would die. Matarian broke out clutching a vortex grenade with his only free arm, and he threw it. It tore a rift in the materium, an infinitesimal point of nothing became a gaping black maw in a fraction of a second. Surrounded by a maelstrom of tortured reality, the spiral forces ripped the tanks apart. The hunger of the Inferium consumed machine and mortal, and the vortex grew as it fed, dominating the entire center of the chamber. Soldiers leapt from the entangled, trapped and stalled tanks and tried to flee. From his position on the wreckage, Mortarian addressed them, the Vox cast in his armor sending his cold voice across the square. You are slaves of the Order. You are slaves, yet you perpetuate the greater slavery. You fight for its continuance. For that you are judged. For that you are condemned. For that. This is your sentence. The Order's soldiers died, as many of Mortarin's men had too, but the Legion pressed on. The Lords of Galaspar reminded him of life on Barbarus, a tyrannical ruling elite, but yet here they were human. Not like the gaunt monsters that were the Overlords, and in a way that made it worse, but this time it would be different. The Emperor would not intervene, this time he would destroy this blight. The Legion pushed again forward. Though Mortarion could feel the hours ticking away, they were too slow. Even as they reached the doors to a grand chamber, but it was as if the air in the room was different. Dread. Fear. No. Psychus. The wretched of humankind. Sorcerous bodily avatars. Fit only for the mercy of extermination. Mortarion's anger bubbled as he recognized this sensation. A shambling horde of mutants, the tortured and the damned. A shameful secret of the Lords was thrown at them. The floor ahead rippled and began to liquefy. Rent in the air discord lightning blasts of acid. A spiral warp storm exploded in the center of the chamber. Mortarion was in the heart of a storm. His soul writhed his mind convulsing with an explosion of painful memories, his abuse from Nekare, the barbarans who died fighting for him, his failure at the summit, the emperor shackling him to service. No, he killed sorcery on Barbarus, and he would do it again. His armor was scorched, it was breaking and splitting, but he endured it. With all the strength he had left, he pushed forward, to the horde and cut them down. The more that fell, the weaker the vortex became until it failed, as the last of the mutant abominations was slain. They had made it. The lords of Galaspar were close. Those vile, tyrannical, genocidal oppressors would die, but the Death Guard had been delayed too much. The armies of Galaspar had assembled and reached them. Mortarion made the tough decision. He swallowed his ego, his need for vengeance, and broke off, allowing a small squad to make the final ascent, as he, Typhon, Garrow, 
and the others went outside to meet the oncoming assault. Ranks of mortal men and women, marching beside fields of tanks, looked to the sky. Their once unbreakable superiority died as rad bombs fell right on top of them. As they choked on the miasma, shapes quickly approached. As the Death Guard ran through their own poison, screams and flames surrounded Mortarion. He was death, and he was sweeping his curse through the enemy. He was the front point of a wave of destruction, and in his wake, his legionaries brought more of the same. Death spread wide and far over the Order. Hundreds of soldiers died with every passing second. More tanks collided, more exploded. Destruction reigned. You are my unbroken blades, Mortarion Vox to his sons. Our losses make us stronger, for the enemy sees our indomitable advance and knows we cannot be stopped. You are one with me, my sons, and I with you, the Barbarans and Terrans. United by one man, unleashed death upon their enemy. They were Mortarian's sons. He loved them and vowed to keep them strong, tough enough to endure anything. The Order's reinforcements was repelled, buying enough time for the second contingent to complete their own mission. The Lords of Galaspar had been seized. From a parade ground, Mortarion projected their execution to the entire empire. The once gods amongst men bled like mortals, as the crowds of workers and once enslaved gathered. You are free, Mortarion bellowed, as the lords of Galaspar died. He exclaims to the free to hunt down the last of the order in all the dark places they hid. Burn all of their touch, all they valued to the ground. A revolution spread across Galaspar and its system. Mortarion and the Death Guard were victorious. But others did not see it this way. A year after victory, Mortarion was summoned back. He stood in the wastes of Galaspar with his brothers, Horus and Sanguinius. Even now, the idea of brothers seemed alien. They had been sent by their father to discover the truth of Galaspar, a retelling Mortarion gave, though his brother's responses enraged him. How did they not see? He had done in a day what would have taken years. How many imperial lives had he spared? He had destroyed the oppressors. He had destroyed evil. Enough, Horus bellowed. Yes, the people were free, but in other respects they are not. They are traumatized. They have seen death in person sweep through their world. They do not know what freedom is. How could they? Where would they have encountered it? The force that oppressed them was destroyed by a greater one. All they know is destruction. Yes, he destroyed the lords, but what had he left in their wake? He was a destroyer, but what did he build? The Great Crusade was about more than this. He needed to be more than just the scythe that reaped the grain. He had to plant the seeds too, but Mortarion couldn't see it. This was not destruction. Barbarous was worse than this, and he and his people had survived. They had carved a path themselves. If the people of Galaspar couldn't endure this, and come out strong and free, then they were weak. It was that look in Sanguinius's eye. Pity. He hated it. It was the same look the Emperor gave him, like a tool who strayed too far from the path laid out for him. No, Barbarous had made him, turned him into a warrior. He was the Reaper of Men. He destroyed evil. Nakair built many things. The ability to create, to build, wasn't always pure. Mortarion and his legion found no praise from the others, but they didn't need it. The legion was unified, and was set loose upon the stars to battle non-compliant colonies of man and Xenos. To the furthest reaches of the growing Imperium, the Death Guard was sent. 
expanding the growing empire as the decades began to pass. For an approval he never sought, it began to frustrate Mortarion, how him and his legion were relegated to the sidelines, whilst others drew favour from their father. Easier campaigns, rewards and honours were lashed upon those such as Sanguinius, Dawn and Gilliman, whilst many such as him, Perturabo, and even Jagatai Khan were forgotten. Over the decades and many wars, Mortarion cut an isolating figure. There were many brothers he disliked, one he even hated, Magnus the Red, and his open use of vile sorcery, it disgusted him. Others he respected such as Ferris and Vulcan, and only one he looked up to, Horus. One who actually looked him in the eye and called him brother. The presence of Horus had been incredible even centuries ago, when they first met in the wake of Mortarion's discovery. Horus was a warrior. Horus had honour and bled beside his men. So he did not begrudge him when after two centuries of war, he was named War Master. The Emperor was returning to Terra to work on something he didn't even deign to tell his sons. A lord keeping secrets. An unsurprising move, Mortarion thought. Once again, the Imperium changed. Now they would all fight for Horus' attention. Above Ulanor, Mortarion and the Khan agreed on this sentiment. They could both see the squabbling of their brothers and how they would fight for his attention. Wanting to prove who was the best, who was the strongest. The Reaper of Men and the Warhawk of Chagoris both wondered who would be the strongest between them. Mortarin was content to leave the bureaucracy and growing administration, all the courtly excess at the heart of the growing Imperium far away. But one thing demanded his intervention. He was a genius of war, a tactician and a strategist with physical strength and stature far beyond any mortal man. But he was human. He felt joy, pain, brotherhood and love. But there was one emotion he wore like an armour. Resentment. Something had been allowed to exist for too long the decades grew that bitterness into hatred. The Psyche. The Witch. The abhorrent art he and his barbarans had suffered under. He had not forgotten how Nikair had created twisted and vile things, even forcing him to do the same. He would even felt that very torture attack his mind. He had seen the horrors that lingered in the warp. He had killed Psykers on thousands of worlds. Mortarin had begun a campaign that grew over many decades, gathering supporters on two sides that would eventually propose a question to the Imperium that it would have to answer. Nikea, the Colosseum carved into the heart of a dormant volcano, a hosting ground for the trial of Magnus and his sons. The question of whether psychic powers would continue within the legions had begun. The Primarchs or their emissaries gathered. The largest display of Imperial might since Ulanor less than a decade before. Many of Mortaria's brothers had made their vote known. But only he, Lehman Russ, Sanguinius, Jagatai Khan and Magnus had taken strong positions. Before the assembled court, Mortarian began his speech. He spoke of the horrors. The abusers of psychers they had encountered across the stars. He spoke of old night, the collapse of humanity millennia before, and the tyranny of unsanctioned rampant freedoms of psychers. Mortarian's mind was drawn back to Nicare. To channel the warp gave power to anyone, from the righteous to the downright hateful. It was corrupting. It turned people into oppressors and for humanity to be free, its oppressors must die. Mortarion's speech drew many of the skeptical to his and Russ's banner, but the tide began to swing as he was followed by the oratory brilliance of his brother Magnus. He scowled at him throughout, as the crowd rose with Magnus's triumphant speech. The court of the Imperium was divided, until he responded. 
the Emperor. Called back from terror for this nexus point in Imperial history, he looked into the mind of Magnus. He saw the abuses of trust and breaking of boundaries. Mortarion was right. Those who wielded such power would always be tempted. The tides of Imperial armies could not be trusted with such responsibility. The use of psychic power was banned throughout the legions, and Imperial will was enforced through the new rank of the chaplaincy. Mortarion's plight was victorious. As a legion split off to rejoin the war fronts of the Great Crusade, the Death Guard continued their battle across the stars, reaping a tall mountain to high. Over two centuries of war, it had left the balance of the Legion different. Many of the Terrans had fallen in the line of duty. Their ranks swelled now by mostly Barbarans. The traditions of the Dusk Raiders had all been forgotten, replaced by those born of Barbarus during the Overlord War. After each victory, as Mortarion had before, he shared a cup with one soldier. The drink of poison, a reminder that everything is a test. Life is a challenge that must be endured. Those who are not testing themselves every day are those who are already dying. He was comfortable only in the company of the Barbarans. They understood. They too had no love for such things as art and finery. Those were obstacles to strength, an indulgence of those who became oppressors. It was in the wake of Nikea that Mortarion found he had a visitor. His brother Horus Lupercal. The two embraced, his charismatic smile charming his legion and in truth him as well. Horus had come to speak with Mortarion, of something so important it could only be said in person. Horus spoke of a future, a devious plan of the Emperor to make himself a god, creating an empire and vanquishing all other religions so his could supplant them all. A future where the ordinary weak human ruled, and many of the Primarchs such as him were forgotten, eliminated in the name of faith. Horus couldn't let that come to pass. He had to save humanity. He would supplant the Emperor and create an Imperium for those who built it, its warriors. He needed him. Mortarion to be humanity's savior. He needed him to kill this oppressor. The psyker who plans to toy and manipulate humanity. Could Horus trust him? Could he rely on him? Was he strong enough for this task? It was as if every word was handcrafted for him. Horus's revelation almost confirmed every dark thought he had. He lied to us. He was a psyker. He let Mortarion be taken, condemning him to grow up on Barbarus. He manipulated him to charge the summit. He stole his vengeance. He stole the opportunity of freedom for his people. He was just a tool to be toyed with and then discarded just like Nakair would. I will always hate you. Those words he spoke at the summit had always been true. Mortarion and his legion joined Horus. The rebellion would soon begin, but the legion needed to be pure before the war started. A task made easy through the warrior lodges spread throughout the legion, a secret gathering for warriors to leave behind rank and converse as equals, all held by Kalas Typhon. To the world of Isfan III, the Death Guard, Emperor's children, world eaters and sons of Horus converged. The world was an open rebellion of the Imperium, and had to be made compliant. To the Death Guard, the structure of the ranks was different. Many of the Terran born were sent to the ground assault force, as the drop pods fell from the sky. The might of the Imperium rocketed towards Isfarn III, as four legions were unleashed. But some had begun to notice how the structure of the ground forces was unusual. It would be Saul Tarvitz of the 3rd, and Nathaniel Garrow of the 14th, who would discover the horrifying truth. They had been betrayed. Those that fought upon the surface of Isfarn III were those who could not exist in the war to come. 
legionaries whose loyalty to the Emperor was stronger than that of their Primarch. They had to be purged. To Motarin, he was killing his own men. But those who held loyalty to that monster, the Emperor, were already traitors in his eyes. They had been the finest warriors he'd ever commanded, but for the ultimate victory he was willing to make the hard decisions. He loved his sons, those that were worthy enough to follow him and his teachings. The virus bombs fell from the Legion's ships. Isfahan III bloomed in a wave of fire. Motarin watched as the world died. How many worlds had he seen die since Galaspar? But what should have been a physical and spiritual cleansing of the Legion, the opening gambit to launch the civil war that would rock the Imperium? It was spoiled as the fires faded and the Life Eater virus had finished devouring the billions of people and soldiers. Great bunker doors opened. The Loyalists lived. A miscalculation that had to be dealt with. Mortarion and his Death Guard dropped podded to the scorched surface of Isfahan III. The Lord of Death led his troops against those he had betrayed. The battle lasted almost months in a brutal close quarter guerrilla warfare. The hate of those that had been betrayed fell flat against the enduring wall of Mortarion's forces eventually cutting down the last of those loyal to the Emperor that lied. Though some had managed to escape, such as Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow, one Mortarin had hoped would choose the Legion over the Emperor, one he had shared the Poison Cup with. A man of honour. The Legion was now pure, and the Imperium had heard Horus's declaration. The war had begun. The war began to churn and convulse. Raging storms split the Imperium as planets erupted in their support for Horus. To the world of Isfahan V, the traitor legions assembled. Bunkering down on the enormous plateau, they lay behind structured defenses as they prepared for the Imperial response. Seven legions. Mortarion's brothers roared towards the traitor's entrenched position as the bloodiest battle in the Imperium's history began. Fire, smoke, and ash blotted out the sky as hundreds of thousands of superhuman warriors clashed. From titans to mortal men, the world of Isfahan V was soaked in blood and scorched steel and ceramite. Mortarion, Typhon, and the Death Guard clashed against Vulcan and his salamanders. The Reaper of Men endured the brunt of an Astartes assault as he brought down his reaper scythe into the very soldiers he had fought side by side with over centuries of the Great Crusade. The traitor line almost buckled until the Loyalists retreated. Hoping to meet with their reinforcements, the Loyalists were met with silence. As the Alpha Legion, Iron Warriors, the Night Lords and word bearers turned upon them. Legions and Primarchs died as a second betrayal was revealed. Mortarion looked to Horus as the traitors stood in the ashes of their victory, death to the false emperor. The Imperium was going to burn. Mortarion and the traitor legions left Horus' side to burn the path towards terror, but Mortarion began to forge his own path, making his way towards the world of Prospero. Jagatai said the Primarch Mortarion, planting the heel of his enormous scythe into the dust. Mortarion, the Khan replied, nodding in acknowledgement. This is not your word, nor yours, and yet here we both are. If you hem for Magnus, he is no longer here. I came to find you, brother. Things have changed. Mortarion smiled behind his mask, making his mottled cheeks crease. I have plenty to tell you, Jagatai. There are opportunities here. The cost of error has never been higher. The rewards beyond imagination. The Khan observed him guardedly. Mortarion had always been hard to read. You are here to persuade me, then? You take after all this. There are any more arguments to be made? 
Matarian reached up with his left hand and pushed his cowl back. A pallid grey scalp was revealed, though it still bore the noble countenance of the Jean Brotherhood. Deep bags nested under his sharp eyes, and whiffs of gas rose up from the collar around his neck. Listen. Just listen. You might learn something. Even you, my proud brother, can still be tutored. The card left his blade unsheathed, holding it loosely by his side. Matarian's power seemed to have grown. Something burned in him, dark like old embers. His flesh was somehow bleaker, his stance a little more capped, and yet the aura of intimidation around him had been augmented. Back on Olenor, even at the height of triumph, he had not had quite the same heft. The Khan recalled his brother's words. What would be the wager on us, brother? What would you pay if we fought? Say what you have to say, said the Khan. Motarian bowed, half mockingly. I have traveled a long way to find you. And now, look around. We have all the time in the universe. All we have left to disturb us are the dead, and they do not stir. Yet, you were not meant to be here. You were meant to join the Alpha Legion at Alaxis. The Khan nodded. Or return to Terra. We did not wish that. Why would we? The Alpha Legion held us at Jondex. They wanted us to hear from Dorn. Motarian raised a hairless eyebrow. Indeed. You surprise me, but perhaps you shouldn't. It seems that Alpharius is never wholly of one mind. He plays a dangerous game. His own intrigues will throttle him. So, are you? Why not me, brother? I assumed it would be Horus. Vanity. He has many things to keep him busy. The Khan's eyes narrowed. Matarian did not seem so sure of himself. For all the show, all the projected force, he was on shaky ground. Horus did not send you, did he? That means nothing. It means everything, said the Khan, studying his brother's reaction. Magnus told me how the war stands. Some souls are still to be decided on. There were always those of us on the edge. I was one. You did another. My legion was at Istvan, so put aside any thoughts that we are not committed. The outcome is already determined, and your choice is simple. Preservation or destruction. Come, Jagatai, you never even believed in unity. You saw through it, even when Gilliman was lecturing us all to tears, back when there was still Xenos standing between our father and the galaxy's edge. Then tell me the alternative. A galaxy of warriors. A galaxy of hunters, where the strong are given their freedom. A galaxy in which there is no dead hand at the tiller, constraining us, lying to us. And all this led by Horus. He's the start. He is the champion, the sacrificial king. He may burn himself out to get to terror. He may not. Either way, there will be room for others to rise. Motarian drew closer, and the Khan smelt the chemical tang of his armor. You should never have thrown your lot in with the Angel Brother, let alone Magnus. I hated to see it, the three of you getting dragged in deeper. I always thought you'd break away, see through it, get tired of the hypocrisy. They were never hypocrites. No? Mortarion exhaled a parched laugh. I hoped you'd have understood them sooner. It's the warp, Jagatai. Our father tried to pretend it wasn't there, as if he weren't already up to his elbows in its soul-sucking filth. It should have been cordoned off, put away, forgotten about. It's not for us. It's a sickness, a blight. Motarin became agitated. He calmed down slowly, wheezing through his gas-shrouded mask. The Khan heard a faint hiss and guessed at what kind of suppressants had been shunted into his bloodstream. I see what has happened. Motarin cocked his head. Oh. 
You were always sincere. I will give you that. You never hid what you wanted. I can guess how you thought it would go. First, hobble the sorcerers. Silence the witches. Drive them out. And the rule passes to the uncorrupted. The healthy. That was your great project. You even told me of it. That day on Ulanor. I thought back then that they were empty threats, but I should have known. You do not make empty threats. As the Khan spoke, Mortarion's mask-locked expression remained inscrutable. Every so often his eyes would go filmy, or his finger would twitch. There was a kind of feeble energy about him spilling out of the cracks just as the noxious fumes did. But it has gone wrong, hasn't it? You have completed your great mission. But there are more sorcerers than ever before. Horus sponsored them. Lorgar has shown them new tricks. If Magnus has not already made up his mind that he soon will, and then you will be surrounded. You have destroyed the Librarius only to find the witches are now untrammeled. They've played you well. You have done their work for them, and soon you will be dragged into it yourself, as warp sick as they are. You think that? I see it perfect. Magnus, show it me. Your legend may be free of it for now, but the change will come. You made your packs, and now they will come to collect. You fool. Mortarion stiffened. His eyes blazed with anger for a second, quickly quelled. You do not. And that is why you came to find me. You've run out of friends. Who will stand with you against the Eder Weavers now? Angron? But an ally. Course. Good luck. The Khan gazed at Mortarion disdainfully. You have tasted the fruits of treachery and found them bitter. Don't drag me into your ruin. You are on your own, brother. Mortarion's expression fractured behind the mask, shifting into an enraged snarl, disfiguring rapidly. Silence quivered and he took half a step forward, his free fist clenching. I came to give you a choice, Motarian said, keeping his voice under control with some difficulty. Half your legion are already declared for Horus. The others will follow wherever you order them. Our father's time is over. You can be a part of the order that replaces him. The Khan smiled, a cold smile. Imperious in its contempt. A new emperor. Motarin glared back at him, though he could not hide the doubt. Why not? Why should it not be you? The Khan nodded, finally understanding. Or you? <laughs> Why not indeed? He drew closer, noticing for the first time the discoloration of the skin around the edges of his brother's rebreather. How long had he worn it? I will tell you why. Because we were never the Empire Builders. We were the Outriders. You chafed at it. I embraced it. Motarian began to back away. As he did so, silence crackled into life, sparking with green-tinged energy. The Death Shroud lowered their scythes into combat posture. Then you will not be persuaded. 
A shame. I invested much energy to save you, brother. I shall take no pleasure in your destruction. For humanity to be free, its oppressors must die. The driving force of betrayal Mortarion clings to. His hatred for the Emperor has allowed Horus to manipulate him, because deep down, despite his visage, his terrifying gaunt features, his lack of ostentation, Mortarion believes himself to be a hero, something he would never admit out loud. He casts himself as the hero, slaying the great evil that is the Emperor. Horus has shown him that the Emperor has lied to him about the true nature of the warp. He is in association with these so-called gods in order to become one himself. He can't separate this view of a father lying, oppressing, plotting. It's the scars of a life under that monster Necair. He was a tool then and he is a tool to the Emperor now. But as this betrayal has unraveled, he has seen more how his fellow traitorous brothers used the war for their own ends, making pacts with demons and using foul sorcery. He starts to believe that he will topple the Emperor, and then perhaps he will be forced to turn upon his brother when the end comes, and for that to happen he needs allies. In the ashes of Prospero he approached Jagatai Khan, a brother like him treated as an outcast. The Death Guard and White Scars, a force that would cover each other's weaknesses. They would be unstoppable. Mortarion has always tried to solve his problems physically, as if he's trying to prove something. Like he is better than those who use sorcery. Like it's part of his hero's journey that the Emperor ruined on Barbarus. He attempts to sway Jagatai, but the Warhawk sees through him. How his hatred of the Emperor has blinded him. How he has framed it in his mind as liberating humanity from an oppressor. But he is simply surrounded by more monsters and sorcery than ever before. A path that could have left Mortarion to be more than just the Reaper's scythe is forever closed to him. Jagatai tells him he is a fool. And he is destined to fall to the very things he despises. He has made his choice. And it's not his fault that Mortarion has made a poor one. The words turn Mortarion's usual stoic face into a twisted crag of rage, for one that seems to uphold the pillars of strength. A part of him seems very fragile. He draws his scythe, and Jagatai draws his Talwa, flanked by their Terminator honor guard, the two Primarchs clash. Jagatai is a blur and lands numerous blows upon Mortarion, but he just takes it. For every three hits, Mortarion only needs one, as the two Primarchs are evenly matched. Mortarion's Primarch aura slowly draining the energy from Jagatai, but Mortarion himself bleeding from all the cut inflicted by a Primarch. Both unwilling to end it all here, they retreat. Mortarion is bitter and angry. Jagatai has unleashed a grudge that Mortarion promises to honor as the Horus heresy begins. The Imperium is burning as the Horus heresy rages. Loyalties are divided. Warp storms ravage the galaxy that hamper travel and communication. Despite being centuries from the challenging life he had on Barbarus, the lessons of Nicaea, the ones he had grown to revile had made a mark upon him. If you know the truth of something, then you can destroy it. And that is all you need to hold true power. A lesson Mortarion took to the truth revealed by Horus before the heresy had begun. He hated the warp and the power that came from it. He had tried to sanction it with the Edict of Nikea, but now, as much as it disgusted him, he had to understand this power in order to better combat it, to better hate it. It began in a trickle, 
a collection of dark materials, fragments, and artifacts he hid within a secret laboratory in his flagship. A shameful secret he kept from his men, even from his first captain, Kalas Typhon, who he had seen use psychic power long ago on Barbarus, when they had ran from Nicaea. But his brother, his friend, had kept that power buried in the centuries of the Great Crusade, as all the Death Guard librarians had been ordered to do. Mortarion despised what he learnt, and yet in a sense he enjoyed learning the secrets the Emperor had kept from him, as if he stripped his power from it. And then it happened. As the Death Guard began to purge the Prosperine system, he encountered a demon, possessing the body of a mortal woman. The creature attacked. Mortarion was in a stalemate, until he felt her power surge within him. Latent psychic abilities blasted from the Reaper of Men, banishing the creature back to the warp. A wave of emotion flooded Mortarion. In security, he was just like them. He had that corruption within him. The Emperor must have known. Another lie to add to the mountain of them. Anger. Jagatai was right. Mortarion had some touch of the Inferian. The very power his traitorous brothers consorted with. He knew it now. He had heard the dying screams of the demons. And it's hail to some plague father. Some blessed grandfather. What had started as curiosity had now become a resolution. Mortarion vowed to understand the power. He would combat it. Only he and his sons would remain pure. As Mortarion and the Death Guard sailed the stars, they split. Contingents led by many of his trusted captains spreading like tendrils to carve the Imperium apart. Summoned by Horus, Mortarion and Fulgrim joined the War Master as the traitors roared their way towards the planet of Moloch. A secret was hidden upon its surface by the Emperor during the Great Crusade one they would take from the false emperor. Mortarion, Horus, and Fulgrim fended off an assassination attempt upon the War Master at the Battle of Dwell, finally reaching to the skies of Moloch. But after nearly a year of civil war, a tidal wave of curiosity had built up within Mortarion. His power, his knowledge of the war was theoretical. He needed to be stronger. How would he next endure an attack from a demon? The creatures the Emperor claimed were fiction in his Imperial truth. Above Moloch, Mortarion utilized his materials. He had spent a lifetime on a world where monstrous creations of rogue geneticists and spirit-channeling corpse whisperers had haunted the fog-bound crags of Barbarus, where monsters truly worthy the name were wrought into very being. But the shameful truth he had never told anyone was that he had fashioned a few of his own monsters under the tutelage of Nicaea. Ignatius Grugor, a death guard, the second captain long dead due to Nathaniel Garrow and the flight of the Eisenstein, was now twisted into a demon. The life-eater virus bound within him. The creatures were thinning the walls of reality. But Mortarion's experiment needed one last ingredient, a sacrifice. Reluctantly, Mortarion drew the Reaper's silence and cut down his elite death shroud in less than the blink of an eye. The demon that was Ignatius Grugor erupted into the inner sanctum of Mortarion's ship, only to be bound and captured moments later. It disgusted Mortarion. He had observed toxins and plague most of his life. He had endured the worst of it, but the mewling, psychotic, corrupted creature was by far the most disgusting thing he had ever seen. He was right to capture it, to better understand how to control and combat this abomination. It was a sacrifice for the Legion, even as he bent over the corpses of his sons and wept. He unleashed the creature upon the Imperial-held surface of Moloch, ravaging the planet and binding his dark secrets back into his vault. 
To the surface of Moloch, the three legions launched themselves, mopping up the last of Imperial resistance. The three Primarchs approached their target, only to be ambushed by a Raptor fire ship. The three demigods fought side by side, under a hail of munition that pounded their armor and the dust at their feet. Motarian waded through the wreckage, unbroken as ever, the black blade of silence unlimbered and trailing a length of burning chain. He roared something in the heathen tongue of his homeworld as he ran towards the edge of the dome. He hurled silence like an axeman. The great reaper blade spun and hammered into the heraldic fist upon the nearest gunship's gallus. He braced his heels in the shattered dome, as Motarin hauled the chain attached to Silence's heel. The gunship lurched in the air, but the Death Lord wasn't through with it. Cannons roared from the ship, driving Mortarian back. Plates sheared from him, blood arcing in sprays. But still Mortarian pulled upon the chain, dragging the gunship closer. He was the Pale King. There was nothing he could not endure. The ship was ripped apart as the three brothers pressed on to their prize. A gate, a passageway directly in to the warp. His brother, the War Master Horus, stepped through, only to emerge seconds later. He looked like he had aged, something thought impossible for Primarchs. Horus had followed in the path of the Emperor, and had emerged with power that matched the master of mankind. All knelt before the War Master, even Mortarian. Was this the example? One who had successfully bound the power of the warp as a tool? Or was this the placation of an obstacle Mortarian would have to deal with after terror had fallen? As the Imperium burned, Mortarian and the Death Guard raised worlds and hunted down loyalist elements, but it felt directionless. In truth, the presence of the Death Lord had been minimal. He hunkered down in his inner sanctum. Matarian almost didn't want to admit just how ravenous his desire for knowledge had become. He devoured learning now, with the fervor of the long famished. He crafted weapons and toxins, harvested creatures for his own arsenal, ones he would use upon the Loyalist forces. The thinning of reality allowed whispers to plague his thoughts. He was shown visions in his dreams, obvious lies that even he saw through. But still it all took a toll. It toyed with him. But at times he would remember himself. He would catch a reflection and be reminded of the monster Nicaer and what he suffered on Barbarus. Many times Mortarian raged at what he was doing. He smashed the vials and tones with the fury of a Primarch, only to eventually return to his studies after a while. He warred within himself, from liberator to oppressor, to the empowered Mortarian he needed to be in this conflict. He justified it. He kept the Legion pure, whilst he endured the burden of this knowledge. Psychers were forbidden. All of them were handed over to Typhon, a brother, a friend who had been absent for years. So Motarin had no one but himself to explore the dangers of the warp. In union with Captain Eidolon of the Emperor's children, a traitor host was convened. Motarin saw the changes to his brother's legion, the ostentation and corruption, all weakness. The warp was abhorrent fit only to be used as a tool, not embraced like this. Jagatai Khan, the Great Khan, had left him with scars since that day on Prospero, a grudge that would finally end as the 5th Legion's forces were finally surrounded. The 14th had been hit hard by the mobility and guerrilla tactics of the White Scars, but over time they had adapted, they had endured the brunt of it, and now, they would face their wrath. The Death Guard and Emperor's children fleets, like spikes of shadow pierce through the warp, emerging into the cornered position of the White Scars. Jagatai would die by his hand. He would make him suffer for his words on Prospero. He 
prepared himself to kill a brother. There were others he despised. Magnus, Sanguinius. Only he and the Khan had been the outsiders, the neglected, but he was prepared for this. He had resolved to kill two fathers. What was a brother to that? Ordnance fire ballooned from all the ships as the titanic battle began. The third legion ships raced on ahead, losing cohesion with Mortarion's forces, a disunity that only seemed to grow over the years of the heresy. Desperate boarding actions from both sides led to brutal and bloody melees within the tight ceramite corridors. Mortarion felt his hearts quicken. He saw his brother's flagship and eagerly awaited the confrontation coming until a rift opened behind the 5th Legion. This was not the warp, it was something else, a tunnel that turned this last stand into a chase. Motarian pushed his fleet to the limits as the White Scar vessels crossed the event horizon. This was their last chance. Assembling his death shroud, Motarian teleported onto the bridge of Jagatai's flagship. The twisting energies encompassed his body, as he drew silence into his grip. Darkness. Motarian and his guard fanned out, met only by the broken and abandoned. This room was empty. A trickle of unease crept down his body as he moved cautiously. My brother, he called out. Motarian's frustration building at the thought of his prize slipping away. Kagan was roared from the top ledges as over a hundred scars leapt down to meet them. Motarin crackled silence into life and waded straight into the hordes of legionaries. He cut them down like cattle, but still they threw themselves upon him. They fought like men possessed, eager to meet their death. The sound of their whooping cries and laughter emanating from their grills. Why waste yourselves, Mortarian spat, looming over their leader, Torgan Khan. Atonement at last, the smiling Khan answered back. Mortarian and the Death Shroud butchered them until there was nothing but a pile of meat and ceramite. This wasn't an assassination, it was a distraction. Mortarian peered out from his own flagship once again, as the White Scar's flagship burned but the others had escaped, along with Jagatai Khan. He didn't face him. He retreated. Motarian began to smash and obliterate everything around him as the crew of the Endurance fell silent. Another failure. He could almost see the pitiful looks in his brother's eyes when he returned to them. The heresy had denied him the victory he sought. Whilst his brothers languished in their corruption, his legion was pure. He swore to himself to leave this sector and take his place at Horus' side. Only he had the right to spearhead the last play, the destruction of terror. Only his legion deserved it. Motarian sent out the call for all elements of the 14th to converge into one. No more disunity, as he sent a personal request summoning Kalas Typhon. The heresy had changed Mortarion. He sat above the world of Nyx. The cries from a million throats, the ceaseless concophony of it, now fatigued him. He had long since become jaded with the pleas of those he killed, be they babbling streams of words of the doomed, the foolish and furious curse of the fatally enraged, or the endless, irritating wail of those who wept brokenly. He had truly become numb to the suffering of mortal men. It no longer tugged at his heart like it did on Barbarous. Am I a tool? The thought came unbidden. The Legion was assembling before the final stroke, the Siege of Terror. But was Horus using him just as the Emperor did? Matarian strode through the crumbling and burning ruins of the world of Nyx striding towards the throne room. A tank, filled with the remnants of what could barely be called human, stuffed with cables and floating chemicals. Ostentation was everywhere. 
Were these the people he was supposed to hand the Imperium over to? When he and his brothers had won the war, Psychers emerged from behind this Lord, and Motari and his death shroud rushed forward. Motarian had silence raised, the anticipation of killing a tyrant stolen as a teleportation flare boomed. First Captain Kalas Typhon emerged into the chamber and stole the kill. Motarian had many brothers, but only one true one. The man who had been by his side on Barbarus, the one he had saved, Kalas Typhon. He respected him. He valued his counsel highly, as one who could cut to the truth, one who would treat him as an equal. But his disappearance since the heresy started, his disobedience had finally irritated him too much. Typhon looked at his brother, his Primarch. He could taste the psychic stain in the air around him, the spore left behind by deliberate contact with the warp. For Mortarian's hatred of the Immaterium, and the force that swam in its depths, he had seemingly willingly exposed himself to such powers. Typhon had spoken to the chattering menaces and monsters in ghostly places, hearing rumours of how the Reaper of Men had defied his own revulsion to satiate his desire for knowledge. After all, knowledge is power. Perhaps the reward was so much sweeter because he despised it so. Barbarus was gone, Typhon told him. Destroyed by the lion, it was a bitter pill to swallow. But in a way, Mortarion felt glad it was destroyed. For all it had forged him and the Death Guard, he hated it. The Legion were his chosen family, and they were here, and that was all that mattered. Upon personal request from Kalas Typhon, Motarin joined him upon the Terminus Est, Typhon's ship. A show of unity for the combined Legion now heading toward Horus, and then Terra. From the ship's throne, Motarin led the cohort of ships into the opening moor. A tear into the warp uncurled as the Death Guard entered. But immediately spikes of unusual energies flowed over the fleet. Many of the mortal crew screamed in agony. Something was wrong, weakness, Mortarin thought, looking upon them. He conferred with his captains. Sabotage, maybe. His eyes flickered to Typhon, who asked permission to investigate. A pang of mistrust touched Mortarian. Something was different about his brother. He looked paler, sickly somehow, but he crushed it. He had to trust him. After everything they had been through, they were the sons of the Overlords, the Outsiders. They'd always had each other's back. After not long, Typhon returned, barging into Mortarian's chambers in a manner not befitting of a subordinate. The first captain presented the perpetrators, the Navigators. They were the source of the strange energies. They were plotting, planning on decimating the Legion into the heart of a star. They had betrayed them and were in communication with terror. Typhon executed the protesting navigators before anyone could utter a defense. Have you lost all reason, Mortarian bellowed? Do you realize what you have done? Mortarian's shock was replaced with anger as he lifted Typhon by his gorget. He was so close to striking him, but Typhon protested. He had saved them. They were not lost in the void. He and his brotherhood could finish the task. Mortarion thought he could hear a buzz on the edge of his perception. The Psyker, the shameful secret many of the Legion had kept hidden from their Primarch. Mortarion had seen Typhon use it on the day they escaped into care. It was always a taboo subject between them. But what choice did the Legion have now but to use its shameful weapon? Typhon and the Psykers of the Legion were let off their leashes. Motarian's paranoia grew even more, only fueled again by the other captains, who desperately tried to convey their concerns to their Primarch. But each time, that prize, the thought of unseating the Emperor, of making him spill all his secrets was forefront. He was unnerved, 
but terror was more important. He could not be seen to be weak. The hours passed until disaster struck again. Mortarion stared into the sealed medical bay, witnessing legionary Zuriek, seeing his exposed flesh. Hundreds of livid boils were rising to the surface of his skin, each one set in a cluster of three. His bones cracked, and his body convulsed foul, sickly liquids. Milky white eyes stared at Mortarion as his son begged for help. The Death Guard Primarch had seen monsters. He had seen murders. The creatures stitched together from cruelty and corpses that the Overlords had made were the stuff of mortal nightmare. The wreckage of living things left behind in their battles. And then the wretched debris of ruined life Mortari had met during the conflicts of the Great Crusade. All these sights were terrible enough to haunt the soul and curdle the spirit of a common man. Over time, he had become numb to such things. Many times he had been responsible for them, but this horrified him. His son was a death guard, an Astartes. He should be immune. Motarin couldn't watch. His son was rotting away as they spoke, his body coursing with every disease known and some unknown. He couldn't let him suffer any longer. Mortarion entered the sealed chamber and drew a dagger. He ended the misery of the son who had served loyally and with honor. He plunged the dagger into Zuriak's heart and he became still. But Zuriak bolted forward, half flinging himself off the platform, a ghastly howl escaping his froth-rimmed mouth. His blind eyes were black with tainted blood and the buzzing mass of flies around him became a cloud of frenzy droning smoke. Mortarion took a step back and watched, appalled, as Zuriak moved like a jerky marionette, reaching up to pull the combat knife from his chest. The blade came out in a whisper of Ikor, and the Primarch saw the metal was now corroded and brittle. Mortarion backed away, leaving the undying monster. The Death Guard never retreat. We always resist. We do not fear. We are not weak. Botarian spoke the litany back to himself in his chambers. Throughout all his years as the Marsh of the Death Guard, there were a handful of unshakable truths that he held as unchangeable. These were the pillars upon which his sense of self, and upon which the very soul of his legion were based. The strength of the Death Guard was to him an immutable law. To see it so thoroughly broken was an event he had no way to frame. His men got sick. That should be impossible. The reports began to flood in. More and more, mortal Anastates were getting sick. They were under attack, but from an enemy Mortarion couldn't fight. He had always been able to battle, to pit his strength against his enemies, but here he could do nothing. The only countermeasure was his DNA in his men, and that was failing. Motarin retreated to his laboratory, passing the shameful secret he kept, the weapon he had used upon Moloch, the possessed demon Ignatius Grugor. The demon taunted him, speaking of his predicament and how he only needed the strength, the endurance of the blessed grandfather. Matarian didn't want to hear it, but the demon taunted him again of how Typhus was beyond his grip. Typhus? Typhon? Matarian had had enough. It was clear he had given Typhon too much leeway. The demon offered his oath as Matarian stalked away. He was dragging them out of the warp no matter what, and if Typhon tried to stop him, he would kill him. With conviction, Mortarion strode through the Terminus Est. All around him were the sick and diseased, spreading onto the entire Legion, but worst of all, the corruption had begun to take hold on him. Mortarion's sense of self had always been strength, and if he reached inside, he could feel the battle being fought in his bloodstream. It sickened him to admit he too was tainted. Motarian and his death shroud burst into the Ashapathic choir room. He ordered Typhon to bring them out of the warp or to die. 
Don't you see the truth, Reaper? We cannot die in this place, Typhon replied. Here we are as eternal and enduring as we were always meant to be. It took me a while to come to the understanding myself, but I have it now. I think perhaps I always did. I just needed to find the way. Mutarin caught sight of his friend, emerging from the shadows. His form was bloating, rust and dried blood speckled his armor as a gaunt face stared back, eyes hauntingly yellow. Was this his friend? The brother he trusted above all? What had he done? What has he made a pact with? Typhon told him he had to do this, for him, for the Legion, they would soon embrace the Grandfather. Motaran and his death shroud rushed forward to meet Typhon and his own Grave Wardens. Eldritch fire sprayed and plasteel tore as the two groups of bodyguards clashed, and between them the Primarch and his captain stalked each other, trading testing blows that quickly escalated in tempo and lethality. Their weapons locked, and the two of them struggled to a standstill. Despite his sickly appearance, Typhon appeared to draw upon a reserve of strength and stamina beyond that of any ordinary legionary. Motarian met his gaze and saw a stranger behind those familiar eyes. Everything he believed he knew about Typhon crumbled in that moment. The same chains that had consumed Grugor were here at work, he realized. The man who was truly Kalas Typhon, who had been a scared half-breed youth, a reckless rebel, then a trusted commander in his army of liberation, no longer existed. Motaran impaled his once friend, only for Typhon to still move. Blows that should have killed him, he endured. As the taint of the warp flowed from him, so Mortarin used the weapon he despised. Releasing the cage doors, a creature rushed forward towards their position. Grogor the Demon. Mortarin activated the creature's oath, and he watched grim-faced as the demon spawn strangled his comrade ignoring every blow that Typhon rained upon it. Finally, Typhon began to choke and splutter, as oily matter spurted from his gagging mouth and the monstrous tear in his body. Kalas Typhon died. Again, the first captain's body convulsed. Raw psychic power burst from him. A wave of toxins and flies filled the chamber, as the very air became choked with spores and decay. Typhon was dead and what emerged was that which could never die, Herald of Nurgle, Typhus. This was always how it was going to end, said Typhus. The fate you refused to accept ghosted you with every step. The questions in your mind lay there when we were just foolish youths and fearless rebels, planted like seeds to bloom into doubt. Your dalliances with demonology, your chaining of the life-eater Grulgor, all preordained by the eye of the Grandfather to bring us to this moment and remake me, to remake all of us. Sorrow grit Mortarion, all around him was death. The ships were torn open as he gazed upon the annihilation of his sons. He couldn't save them. There was no summit this time, no enemy to fight, just despair. The warp swarmed over everything. Time itself began to overlay and twist as a god descended down. I have failed my sons. He gave voice to the thought without realizing it. And the Reaper's utterance echoed back at him from the flanking plasteel walls of the warship's landing bay. Guided only by his instinct, Mortarion had returned to where the Greenheart had docked. His shuttle, once battle-ready and primed for war, now resembled a wreck exhumed from some quarry marshed morass. It, like everything in the grasp of this septic reach of the Imperium, was beset by decay. The heavy barriers had sagged under their own weight and cracked open, allowing some fraction of the mind-twisting aurora beyond to cast feverish light into the chamber. In any other circumstance, 
Mortarion would have expected the bay to suffer explosive decompression, but then this was the warp and he was learning that nothing in this place mirrored the laws of the universe he had been born into. The wild glow of the Imperium beckoned him. Out there was the source of his torment, he reasoned. Out there was where the forces corrupting his legion had gathered. Out there was the end point. Mutarin pulled back the hood over his pallid face and cast it away, staring that madness in the eye gathering his strength to step through and confront the truth. His boots rang with the strange echoes as he advanced. The hull of the Terminus Est ranged away from him on all sides, the metal shifting and altering, growing like weeds. The other craft in the fleet hung around him as tarnished ornaments, tethered to a screaming sky of raw, incorrect force. Writhing colors made of delusion and impossible horizons folded away into infinity. But there was one unchanging constant. Mortarion saw the sketch of what might be a god's face. Upon the form of three glaring eyes in a forbidden triad. It was grit by the truth that it had been waiting an eternity for this moment to come. Unbidden, the reaper of men's black and total despair took physical form around him, in a cloak as dark and hollow as the void between stars. The war in his blood seethed, burning him from within, and here, Mortarion's hate and misery, every last iota of his rage and melancholy, took shape in a single demand as he bellowed into the war. It was a cry of pure frustration. A spear hurled towards cruel fate and everyone who had ever condescended to name themselves as his father. What do you want from me? When the answer came, the buzzing timber and the distant, papery touch of the voice on his flesh was familiar to him. Defiance alone is not enough. Mortarion's heart seized in his chest. He recalled the first time he believed death was upon him upon the blighted crags of Barbarus, and the moment his deepest despair had first showed itself. He failed that day, betrayed his promise to his kindred and his world. He had fallen while another stepped in to take the glory that had been rightly his, and the shame of it had never dimmed. Then, the unfinished words were left incomplete, but now they were spoken in full and the truth the Reaper of Men did not wish to face was made undeniable. To defeat death, you must become it. To endure beyond all, you must submit. If you wish to be granted deliverance from your agony, you must surrender your soul. I remember. Do I? Is anything in this place real? Two parts of Mortarion's spirit warred. Decay against defiance. Submission versus rebellion. The future battling the past. The vast and terrible shape hove closer, taking on definition. The form of it was Protean. A huge colony creature of writhing viral clades. Given dimension and singularity, it reached out for him. A colossal, leprous claw with three talons spreading wide to envelop Mortarian's sight. Upon the degenerated skin of it was the Triad Sigil, repeating over and over in fractal profusion. The same as the cluster of boils that manifested the Primarch's exposure to the Chimera virus. My champion, I will give you all you wish. A dominion of your own that can be shaped to your will. You will be what you always wanted to be. All you need do is take the mark. Take it and swear loyalty. Out past the rusting dock cradle, where Greenheart's creaking space frame lay suspended. Swear your loyalty to me. Bowed down upon one knee, Mortarin could not hold his gaze towards the black, 
blasted mud of Barbarous, and he looked up into the shining eyes of the newcomer. The stranger's words seemed to stop the passage of time. An aura of power, vast and barely contained, crackled about him. He looked into Mortarion's eyes and saw into the murky depths of his soul, to the lost and forgotten places within the Reaper of Men, kept hidden even from himself. Mortarion's jaw stiffened. He did not want to be an open book. He did not want to... Give your fealty to the Grandfather. Bowed down upon one knee, Mortarion could not hold his gaze towards the rusted, broken steel of the Terminus Est, and he looked up into the menacing eyes of the great entity that swallowed the wild sky. The god thing's utterance made the strings of reality hum and resonate. A dark ether of corruption was falling like thick sleep thickening the space around him. The entity called itself the Grandfather, filled Mortarion's lungs with the spores of living death, and opened him up from within, teasing apart sealed spaces to find the rich meat of his unseen fears and his most secret hopes. Mortarion's fists clenched. He could feel his soul stripped bare. There was... You have chosen the only path you can. You have chosen the only path you can, said his father, said the grandfather. You are my son. You are my champion. And I have waited so very long for you. And this day's dawning has been long awaited. You are my son. You are my champion. And I have waited so very long for you, and this day's dawning has been long awaited. Time and moment, past and present, the futures of them crumbled and turned into sand, smothering Mortarin in the elves when he was there on Barbarous, and it was decades gone, and he was here in the utter insanity of the Immaterium. Together and separated, divided and merging. His father, the Emperor of Mankind, his patron, the Lord of Decay Nurgle beckoned him, offering Mortarin what he could not refuse. His oath and his honour forbade him from taking any oath from this moment forward. He had sworn to bend the knee to the stranger at the lodge, if he could not defeat the High Overlord and he had a vow to protect his gene sons and his legion beyond all else. Mortarion struggled, frantically trying to grasp the truth and the lies, desperate to separate the ragged, deathly present from the echoing, ashen past. Which was his reality, or were all things true? What price is an oath given in madness? What do you want, my son? What do you want, my champion? The voices merged into a single titanic reverberation through his bones and physical form into the bounds of the turbulent and unique psyche. I want to endure. Then rise. Rise, Mortarion. There is a brotherhood awaiting you out in the stars, the like of which you cannot comprehend. And with it, a purpose that will illuminate the galaxy. A crusade upon which your name will be etched into eternity. Then rise. Rise as a prince born of death. Vengeance awaits you in the realm of men. And with it, the blackest, most dire purpose. A slaughter by which your name will be feared until the last human soul fades to entropy. Mortarion said the vow without reservation then. I give myself to your banner, my blood and my bone, the unbroken force of my will and the power of my spirit. These are yours to command. If you grant me deliverance. His hand found the damaged, crackled blade of his war scythe, and he gripped it hard enough to cut metal and draw blood. By this I so swear. 
he looked down and saw the transformation take hold of him. A force of immeasurable mutational power crashed through his physical form and overwhelmed the pitiful limit of flesh and blood. Motarian tore away, rising to his feet, changing with each heartbeat. From his spine burst pestilent, insectile wings that quivered and crackled with new change. His soul soaked in the corrupting energy, dying and living, reborn and obliterated. The flesh across his gaunt features pulled tight, dragging his mouth into a rictus grin. The smile of death itself. He would endure. Three times in his life, Motarin was forced to submit to the will of a tyrant with latent psychic powers. The warp bleeds over reality as Motarin kneels before a god, the Grandfather Nurgle. In his despair and love for his legion, his sons, he pledges his loyalty to the god of chaos. The moment overlapping with the memories of his father, the Emperor. Mortarion is transformed. His Primarch form bloats and cracks. He sprouts insectile wings and is riddled with pox and disease. Maggots and pus ooze out from his monstrous form. But he is stronger now than he has ever been. His body can endure anything and in a way he revels in this power. His sons are made strong too. They will endure more punishment than any Astartes could. They are the extreme embodiment of their legion's ideals. And yet despite the front that Mortarion presents to his legion, that he has chosen this path, he is in deep pain. He has been forced into the pact, and the reluctance he feels manifests as a deep pain throughout his body. He proclaimed to the Legion that this was their destined path, that he has chosen the strength for the Legion, but he knows in his heart that he is a hypocrite. His very hatred of the warp led to a forbidden curiosity that he fed. At times he raged and destroyed all the material, but still he came back to it. He is someone who espouses that he cares nothing for the opinions of others, yet is defined by his battle against physical and perceived weakness. The overlord Nakair abused him through making him feel weak and manipulating him through that insecurity and with Motarian's embrace of Nurgle's gift, it is a retreat from that very insecurity. He is a monster, bloated and corrupted and rusted and leaking pus and blood, but a monster isn't weak. But he's most defined by his ultimate failure Something during the Great Crusade, Horus remarked on. Liberation is not just the destruction of the oppressor. We can't replace one tyranny with another. Motarian has thought himself a hero, one who slays the villain in his hero's journey. But here that journey ends. He's never built anything to replace what he has destroyed. He's never learned to create an empire, only to destroy them. It is why for so long the Emperor looked at him with pity in his eyes. Defiance alone is not enough, my son. The Emperor had hoped Mortarion would see it. A better future, a greater destiny beyond that of the Reaper of the Harvest. If we are not strong, we will not win. If we cannot defy poison and darkness and pain, we cannot stand against death. Hulking silhouettes darkened the skies of terror. Hundreds of rusting war hulks burst forth into the skies around the great bastion of the Emperor's Imperium, soiling the darkness with their presence, as the rays of faraway soul fell upon their blighted hulls. Daggers of corroded metal that had once been proud symbols of the 14th Legion poured out and wove among one another as carrion flies would swarm about a hunk of bloody meat. 
Mortarion strode onto the bridge of the vengeful spirit. Flies and decay flowed around the hulking form of the Primarch. Going onto one knee, his bones cracked and popped. All around him clawed at their throats and eyes, as death itself was before them. From a taut, skull-like face, two milky white eyes looked upon the War Master. Mortarion was here, ready to begin the Siege of Terror. From the boy who secretly wrote in secretive journals, trapped within his prison fortress on a world that was just as toxic as his adoptive father, Mortarion had returned to the place of his creation. Not as a son or a general, but a monster. Infused with the power of a god, the Emperor told him didn't exist. The hulking rotten forms of the Death Guard were given the honor that was promised, and were the first to land upon the world of terror. The bloodiest and most brutal siege in Imperial history had begun. The very skies were clogged with ash and fire, creating a foe permanent night as the mortal to superhuman warriors slaughtered each other. Mortarin unleashed the power of the Plague Father. Disease and death ran rampant over the civilians and combatants of the Imperium. The outer walls crumbled as the full might of Horus' armies washed over their defenses. All that lay before them now was the Imperial Palace itself. Magnus the Red approached Mortarin before the attack on the Colossi Gate. They had once been adversaries. Their battleground, the Council of Nikea, a decade before. Now they stood side by side, both steeped in the power of the warp, ready to eliminate their father and his empire of lies. Magnus told him that he forgave him. Your suffering gives you power, the sort I promised from the start. Your submission was not weakness. There is no shame. I bear you no ill will. I understand. Mortarion hesitated for a moment, but finally let down the wall he was barely keeping together. I hate this, he whispered. He hated the pain he felt. For all he could endure, this was becoming too much, and he couldn't confide in anyone. His only friend, Typhon, was gone. That's brotherhood a lie. Magnus told him that he knew. The Crimson King raised his hand, as energy emanated from it. Mortarion blinked, straightened slightly, and took a breath. He seemed taller, less bowed by pain and rack. His eyes had become fierce and unclouded. It felt like for the first time he could breathe. He was skeptical of this kindness, but they were on the same side now. The pain was because, as always, Mortarion was stubborn. His reluctance to embrace Nurkle's gifts was a crutch. He was a psyker. A demon had taught him that. But before he couldn't bring himself to use that power, but to embrace it now, he felt it truly. It wasn't just the strength. It was life. Unending. Undying. A cycle of rebirth. He was beautiful in a way. He felt the joy of a madman, the joy from the freedom of sanity. Mortarion felt renewed and led the Legion once more on to the last bastion of the Imperium. The siege continued, but despite victory after victory, the force of Horus had begun to fracture. Some lost interest, such as the Emperor's children. Others, such as Perturabo and his Iron Warriors, abandoned it unwilling to be Horus's meat shield. Whilst the Imperium suffered, it held on. Mortarion could break their walls, but nothing was quite sweeter than breaking their spirit. Look at them. They grasp at every tiny spark of life, desperate and afraid in all their thoughts and deeds. Their existence is nothing but fear and dread. To the Marmax Bastion, the Reaper of Men and Typhus led a joint assault, a rising Imperial cult, one that claimed worship of the Emperor, was giving the people hope, one Mortarion would annihilate. 
but a figure stood in his way, one standing before his target Euphrates Keeler, Nathaniel Garo. The captain of the Death Guard had been a prize Mortarion regretted losing since Istvan III. A man of honor, one who could be trusted unlike the snakes he was surrounded by, such as Typhus. He offered Garrow a place back at his side, brotherhood. Mortarion wanted to see him take the choice, to kneel as he did. He offered the poison cup, the Legion tradition, one they had shared decades ago. But Garrow refused. He drew his sword Libertas and lunged at his gene father. Motarin toyed with him. His strength and endurance was far beyond what he was before. To be in his very presence it caused flesh to rot. But Motarin underestimated the will of Garrow and took a wound. No, this was meant to be his humiliation. Motarin, enraged, summoned a host of flies. If Garrow wouldn't serve willingly, then he would puppet his body for him. Garrow began to splutter and falter, until a glowing light filled him. The Jean sun was renewed, and desperately attacked Mortarion again, only to be impaled upon silence. The body of Garrow slid down the blade, as Mortarion stared at him. He was weak. The gifts of Nurgle would have made him survive this. How could he deny this bounty? With the last of his strength, Garrow thrust the broken blade of Libertas into Mortarion's neck. The demon Primarch howled as he felt the sensation of burning score his body. He flung the corpse of Garrow to the ground. Mortarion was victorious, but the wound Garrow had inflicted weakened him, weakened the tether of his immortal demon Primarch form to the material universe. In the wake of Garrow's death, Mortarion vowed to break the defenders. The very presence of him and his legion created a miasma of dread, one that had built up over the months of the siege. It drained the mortal defenders of the Imperial Palace, many being driven to madness or succumbing to defeat in their minds. Motarian was gifted the spaceport and fortified his position overlooking the Imperial Palace. The assault was close at hand. But there was an obstacle. Typhus. Herald and favoured of the god Nurgle, but yet also a traitor to Mortarion personally. Before the Legion, the bloated creatures projected a united front. But underneath, a war of influence brewed between them. Mortarion was his Primarch, the strongest weapon in Nurgle's arsenal. But Typhus's rebellious nature that led to their very corruption had only grown. Many times he openly defied Mortarion. The Death Lord projected the sense that he had embraced the Grandfather's blessing, that it was his will to lead the Legion down this path. A contested view from Typhus, who claimed that it was him who brought the Legion into Nurgle's embrace. Mortarion impatiently awaited the unification of Typhus's forces for the final push. But he saw what was coming on the horizon. Through the scarred black night of terror, illuminated only by ordnance and fire, the Imperium was sallying. The white scars and a legion of Imperial tanks plummeted towards the Lion's Gate spaceport. Jagatai Khan was coming. The white scars worked in pacts, taking two of them to put down even one enlarged Death Guard. This was their last play. There was no attack and retreat. Jagatai Khan and his men pushed through the Death Guard's defenses, both sides caring not for the injuries and pain they took. The brutal battle raged through the layers of the spaceport, until finally Mortarion saw his brother again. Once more, the brothers would fight. But it was different this time. The Lord of Death had burst free from his old bounds, Becoming grotesque and monstrous, he wore a human form only in outline now, his body inhabited by a ramshackle armor of corrosion and decay, a gaggle of loosely held panels and moldy fabric, seemingly liable to fall apart at any moment. The air around him was acrid, 
suffused with the foulness that turned the stomach and made it hard to breathe. He was ruined and yet exalted, crippled and yet stronger than he had ever been. Their old jewel upon the sands of Prospero meant nothing. The two brothers launched themselves at each other, but the Khan fell back first. They exchanged more blows, rapid, heavier, and faster. All around him, the roar of a broader combat filtered up from the decks below, a chorus of screams and explosions that could not be filtered out. Their strikes accelerated, ramping up swiftly until the blows were exceptional in their heft and precision. Again, Mortarion sped up, his old solitary replaced by a phasing, shifting, demonic velocity. The whistling arcs of his scythe hissed with unearthly voices, wounding the atmosphere itself even as the Khan ducked away from its lacerated edge. When that warp-forged steel connected, the impact was bone-breaking, mind-jarring, a collision of dimensions as much as solid matter. It was clear Mortarin utterly outmatched the Khan, his demon Primarch's monstrous strength overpowering him, but Jagatai began to talk. Lost your footing, as well as your judgement. You are already defeated. You have become what you hated. The two brothers kept swinging. They were out in the open. A storm raged. Green lightning snapped down in the high reaches of the spaceport. Below them, the bulk of the immense fortress spread out in a panoply of jumped stages and terraces. Every inch of it was fought over now. A million points of light exposing White Scars and Death Guard at one another's throats. Mortarion's wounds were shallow, but the Khan's body and armor was breaking down. But still the Khan taunted Mortarion, the Death Lord's frustration growing to near rage. You know nothing, nothing of sacrifice, nothing of denial, Mortarion spat. You were the spoiled child, whining about the need for structure as the rest of us built an empire. You were shown the nature of the galaxy and you turned away. Matariot's rage built more. He slammed the scythe down and nearly broke the Khan's trailing leg in two. I embraced it. I embraced the pain. I looked a god in the eye. The broken mess that was the Khan looked up into Matariot's face and chuckled. I should have taken on the Legion Master. I should have fought Typhon. I absorbed the pain. Jagatai mewled out. I know of the Terminus Est. You gave up. I did not. My endurance is superior. Motarin fell silent as something within him broke. So that was what they all believed. What they had always believed. His brothers. Not that he had done what needed to be done. Not that he had sacrificed everything to make his legion invincible. Even condemning himself to the permanent soul anguish of demonhood. A change that could never be undone. It was not strength. He was weak. Motarian's anger soared. From blood boiling to an almost calm. His mind went utterly numb as only one thought pounded in his mind. Kill him. Mutarin hefted silence into the air and thrust down, only for the Khan to stand up. Jagatai took the blow and traded back one of his own. The two brothers scrambled. Mutarin dropped down sharply, piling in wildly with his gauntlets, slamming in punches at the Khan's throat and at his chest. At his ruined face, the clenched fists flew, one after another, barely warded by Jagatai's flailing arms, tearing up the remains of that beautiful lacquered ceramite and splattering the two of them in more gowns of forge hot blood. Again, they both reached for their blades and clashed in ripples that shook the very earth. Black blood oozed from Mortarion, his rusted plate broken in many places, but still he moved. The Khan was walking dead, a wash of red and ceramite that barely constituted life. It was here, it was coming, the death Mortarion would give him. The Khan was going to die, he would kill his sons, 
and then march upon the palace itself. He would drag their father from the throne, make him spill his secrets, his knowledge, and then it would all be his. But still, Jagatai chuckled. A cold tempering of his rage flooded Mortarion, as still to his shock, his brother stood. Mortarion was still the greater of them. He was still the stronger, the more steeped in preternatural gifts, but now all he felt was doubt, rocked by the remorseless fury of one who had never been self-doubting, self-regarding and unreliable. All Mortarion could see just then was one who wished to kill him, who would do anything, sacrifice anything, fight himself beyond physical limits, destroy his own body, his own hearts, his own soul. Mortarion shuddered to look within, to realize that he, the Reaper of Men, Primarch of the Death Guard, paled before this endurance. To defeat death, he must become it. Jagatai wouldn't have given in upon the Terminus Est, and that frightened Mortarion to the core. The possibility that he was a coward, unwilling to die. Through bloody lips the Khan wheezed out, that he knew Mortarion now was immortal. He couldn't die, but he could. On broken legs, Jagatai launched himself once more at Mortarion, the Reaper of Men impaling silence straight through his brother's chest. A burst of gore and spray exited out the back, but he was stuck. The Khan pulled himself down the blade. For an instant, their two faces were right up against one another, both cadaverous now, drained of blood, drained of life, existing only as masks onto pure vengeance. All their majesty was stripped away. It took only a split second. Motarian's eyes went wide, realizing he couldn't wrench his brother away in time. The Khan's eyes narrowed. He snapped his Dao across, severing Mortarion's neck cleanly in an explosion of black bile. Mortarion howled as his soul was banished back into the warp. Awakening within the Garden of Nurgle, he came to the horrifying realization that he again had failed, unable to re-emerge back into the material universe before terror would have fallen. Mortarion's hate and rage were so apocalyptic Virus and disease would ripple across entire worlds, and yet when the dust was settled, Mortarion created something that was his own. Within the warp, Mortarion was gifted a world, a demon world, one he forged in Mirror of Barbarous. Great libraries filled with arcane knowledge were hauled to his fortress. Entire populations hid in the valleys from the cruel overlord at the peak. The Liberator, the Saviour of Barbarous, father to a legion, teacher of strength and endurance, was dead. Consumed by the hypocrite that parodied the flesh of a man who once despised those who sought to abuse humanity, he lived out the fantasy. A destiny where he was victorious upon the peak, and yet he only replaced one tyranny with another. Mortarion had gazed into the abyss of the warp, and he blinked. Necessity justifies all, and this is necessary. Without this primeval force, without this chaos, there will be stagnation, ignorance instead of illumination, existence instead of life. Humanity needs to be led upwards with small steps, with their eyes gradually opened, lest the light blind them.
only good is knowledge, and the only evil is ignorance. If I am guilty of anything, it is the simple pursuit of knowledge. I am its master. I swear it. If I am guilty of anything, it is the pursuit of knowledge. I am its master. I swear it. Because there is no sin but ignorance. The sorcerer of Prospero, the Cyclopean giant, the Crimson King, Primarch of the 15th, the Thousand Sons Legion, Magnus the Red, a name uttered with venom and hate to an Imperium that only knows the monster that schemes and burns everything in his path, a man that desired enlightenment for all of humanity, but who now fights against his own species in the cabal of the gods of chaos. But who was the man that became the monster? How did someone, once so loyal to the Emperor, turn his back upon his father and his species? His story begins in the 30th millennium. Terror. The golden age of humanity had passed. We stand in the ashes of the Age of Strife, the collapse of the Federation of Mankind across the stars. Decay and ruin touches all of the worlds far-flung humanity resides upon, isolated and bleeding knowledge and wealth, prey to civil strife and xenos. But upon terror, the birthplace of our species, hope rises, the Imperium of Mankind. Deep below the surface of the cradle of mankind, a consciousness awoke. It was new, ignorant, and vulnerable. It, he, felt a voice connect to his mind, as if another being resided in his thoughts. Master, creator, father, the emperor of mankind. A presence, an aura, so earth-shattering, Powerful, ancient, cold, but yet caring, humanity distilled. He was a child. He was human, created inside a gestation capsule by this being, his father. He was speaking to him through telepathic communication, and this child began to learn, evolving his consciousness more each time he conversed with this emperor. But all of this was ripped away from him. The chambers around his capsule began to shake and convulse. Energies poured in from the realm of sentient madness, the mirror dimension, the warp. The capsule was ripped from the ground with violence and hate. Claws scraped and bit into the protective tomb. He was hurled through the warp, taken away from the side of his father. This capsule was spit out back into real space, falling down in fire towards a planet in the Frozari system, Prospero. The child opened his eyes for the first time. He took his first breath, spluttering abiotic fluid from his lungs. A visage of twilight met his eyes. Dark stone and muted life stretched for miles as the heat of the wreckage that was his gestation capsule illuminated his place on top of a mountain, a beacon to the others that resided upon this world. The child began to wonder, his mind filled with confusion and disorientation. Why was he here? How was he here? Where was the man who had spoken into his mind? For days, weeks, the child strode, almost Overwhelmed by the volume of information, the vibrant world around him screamed. He was not alone on this world. Finally, he saw them, humans. The child stood before a city of beautiful white marble, pyramids and towers touching the very heavens. The child felt a power here by a means he did not understand. The human citizens of Tizka found this wandering child. His presence made them want to kneel. Their pulses quickened. Hope, power, 
and obedience swelled within as they laid eyes upon him, vibrant crimson skin and hair, and he was swelled with psychic power. He was perfect. This child was taken in, but they did not grant him any title nor name, for he already knew his name, the one his creator had given him, a name that had been created from that commanding voice from before, his last piece of home, Magnus, a man who had been haunted by prescient dreams of doom, found the night where a comet of fire had roared down, that those dreams had vanished, a leader of the people of Tizka, an adept of the studies of the warp, Amon. Amon saw this child, he saw how special he was, and he took him in. He became his teacher, a father, and a friend. The boy astounded him. He absorbed information to a speed and understanding he had never seen before. Within a year, this young Magnus had devoured and comprehended everything Amon could teach him. The history of this world, how millennia before, in an age of darkness that nearly destroyed the people of Tizka, the foul Xenos, the Psychnuin, a chitinous warp spawned creature that had infested the entire world. It brought ruin and death to the people of Prospero, utilizing its disgusting powers of the warp to lay their young inside their victim's mind. A hatching, unleashing madness, pain, and death. But the people had survived. For those born with psychic abilities, even back then, with their primitive knowledge, learned to harness their power, shielding their minds. It was these survivors that had built the foundations of Tizka, the now home of Magnus. This cornucopia of knowledge and psychic exploration was devoured by the boy from the heavens. These powers had saved the people of Prospero. It was a gift. It was power. It was strength. It was survival. There was never enough of it. More and more, Magnus began to explore, soaking it up with the wonder and vitality only a child could feel. Seeing the impossible be achieved, it was incredible. Venturing outside the marble walls of his home, Magnus began to explore the ruins of this world. Although numerous times he was warned of the danger, even the danger of exploring his powers too much, he was just too curious. He just had to explore. Besides, he was Magnus. He was special. He would be fine. Gazing to the cliffs above him, he saw an avian statue of old. It tumbled down to the ground and shattered. An almost insignificant moment in time until he peered at the broken shards. And then he saw it. The pattern, the precise geometrical shapes. He delved further and deeper with a lens beyond human. The energies of the warp flowing through him. It made him want to weep. The beauty, the logic, and structure. It was like a fingerprint of a creator, a primordial creator. Magnus felt a deep understanding of the world. It washed over him. He bade Amon and the other Psycho Scholars to witness this truth. One by one, their skepticism was taken away, replaced by utter silence, as they began to see it too. How blind! had they been, but the moment was shattered. The Psychnuian came eerily floating towards them. They had been ambushed. The still young Magnus, Amon, and fifty scholars were surrounded, set upon by these warp creatures that began to rip and shred the humans to pieces, all the while attacking their psychic mental barriers. Only Magnus, Amon, and eight others remained. On the verge of being swarmed, Magnus felt a change within him. Dormant power unlocked, surging forth with a primordial understanding he had just witnessed. Torrents of roaring hot fire 
was unleashed from his hands. Power, like a flood of life, coursed through him, all the way to his fingertips. It felt electric, incredible even. His fellow survivors too unleashed their new understanding into deadly psychic abilities. They boiled the Xenos alive. They read their thoughts and attack patterns. They threw objects with their minds and pulsed protective barriers. With a mountain of Psychonuian viscera under their feet, Magnus, Amon, and the Tizkan scholars had survived. Each mortal man giving birth to a pillar of new prospering cults. The Athenaeans, Corvade, Pavoni, Pyre, and Raptora. Alone, at the top, the master of all the disciplines stood, the young man who had come from the heavens, Amagus, master of all cults, Magnus the Red. The child, the student, the young man, and now, the master, the teacher. Having peered deeper, having understood the fabric of the universe to a level beyond his fellow humans, Magnus became the guide. He became the leader of Tizka, ready to helm and bring this wonderful knowledge to his people, to bring them out of the dark where he had once been, to the truth of enlightenment, because he loved them. The only good is knowledge, and the only evil is ignorance. If I am guilty of anything, it is the simple pursuit of knowledge. I am its master, I swear it. A core philosophy formed from everything Prospero had taught him. Ignorance had left them vulnerable to Xenos. Knowledge had saved them. Ignorance was the sin that had cost lives. He would do everything in his power to avert the sin. He would learn everything he could. A repository of knowledge so great no threat would ever harm him or his people. He would be its master. He swore to it. Decades of learning, studying, and teaching. Magnus was proud to call this world home. But it was not his true home, he knew in his heart. Once again he heard the voice, the one from his earliest memories. His master, his creator, his father had found him. The emperor of mankind. It was like standing next to a star, blinding, warming, awe-inspiring. From humanity's home world of terror, an empire had been birthed, expanding outwards across the galaxy, and after decades, this Imperium finally reached the Prospero system. The child of Prospero never forgot where he came from. He never really lost contact with his father, communicating psychically over the decades as he lived inside Tizka. But this connection was nothing compared to the earth-shattering presence Magnus felt as his eyes dawned upon the master of mankind. Those golden eyes, what had they seen over untold millennia? What knowledge did he hold? What could he teach him? Magnus fell to his knees in submission to his father, pledging his loyalty to the emperor and the imperium of mankind. With childlike wonder, Magnus showed the Emperor Prospero and its crown jewel of Tizka, the City of Light, where the people lived in prosperity and happiness. Even the children laughed and played on the streets, utilizing their psychic gifts. Servers would read your mind, bringing you what you truly desired before you had even said it. Enormous white marble pyramids housed the thousands of scholars and researchers dedicating their lives to the explorations of the mysteries of the universe. Magnus was proud. Terra may have been his home, but Prospero had made him, and in return he had made them into a civilization of envy. However, this moment of joy dissipated, as the Emperor presented to Magnus the Thousand Sons Legion, the Adeptus Astartes. Superhuman warriors created from the meshing of stimulants 
and specialized organs grown from Magnus's own DNA. Sons to Magnus, just as he was a son of the Emperor. Faster, stronger, and more durable than the mortal man. A legion of warriors created for the greatest war in humanity's history. The Great Crusade. The reunification of the lost colonies of mankind across the stars. The Age of Strife was over, and once again humanity would be united under one banner, one singular vision at its heart, the Imperium and the Emperor of Mankind. But something was wrong. What should have been thousands of warriors barely numbered a thousand men. Before Magnus, the last living members of his legion stood, holding a dark curse within, the flesh change. For decades, the sons of Magnus, recruited from the people of Terra, had fought with distinction and glory, conquering Terra and venturing to the stars with the launch of the Great Crusade. But after decades of war, the Legion saw the first signs of a poison underneath. Legionaries began to feel ill, pain, needle sharp, spiked from every cell in their body. Their form would start to convulse and grow. Cancers and swelling consumed them in the tombs of their armor. Every part of them wanting to burst forth with unbridled change, leaving the victim a mewling, groaning mess, only fit for the mercy of a quick death. They began to drop like flies, whistling down to the survivors that earned their namesake. Less than a thousand Astartes, the thousand sons. Magnus stood before them, their enormous Primarch, with crimson skin, and felt nothing but shame. Magnus immediately began his work, delving into every scripture, every tome, and scrap of knowledge the Imperium and the vaults of Tisca had to offer. He was going to save them. Perhaps he felt it was his fault. The curse was in their blood. His blood. Perhaps it was his flaw, the very thought filling him with dread. But if his life on Prospero had taught him one thing, knowledge would save them. He separated his soul from his body, swimming the tides of the great ocean like a blazing comet, delving into every corner and crevice of that sentient realm for any scrap of knowledge he could use. With time ticking down for his sons, he returned to them. Many locked away in stasis, such as Azek Ariman, awoke to find a legion restored. His body was stable. The unbridled pain and change was gone. He looked up to find his lord. One eye missing, sacrificed for the knowledge to save his sons. The legion was elated. Their father had saved them, but some were not saved such as Osmond Ariman, twin of Azek, and the psychological trauma would never fade. But once again, the 15th Legion could serve the Imperium. Knowledge had saved his sons. Magnus once again vindicated, and reaffirmed by the use and exploration of the primordial creator, the power of the war. With his legion saved, the Primarch accompanied his father back to terror, as a legion began rebuilding, drawing new recruits from the world of Prospero itself, many itching for the opportunity to serve their lord. Once again, Magnus was upon the place of his birth, Terra, the bustling metropolis, now the heart of a galaxy-spanning empire. The emperor took Magnus under his wing, gifting him knowledge and teaching him things beyond even his imagination. For the first time in his life, Magnus was no longer the smartest or most powerful in the room. In the great towers of the Imperial Palace, Magnus and the Emperor spent many nights in discussion and debate. They untethered their souls, father and son, even flying the great ocean and the warp together. He even spent time under tutelage of Malkador, the Emperor's own right hand. Upon terror, Magnus was at the heart of the Imperium, a Primarch to a Legion, battling in the Great Crusade. But he was not alone. 
there were others upon this world that matched his stature and power. Other Primarchs, his brothers, Titans, superhumans far beyond the mortal, and even Astartes, scattered like him across the galaxy and slowly reunited with their father as the boundaries of the Great Crusade had expanded. Twenty brothers, each of them raised on different worlds, taught by different masters, and schooled in different creeds. Magnus heard their tales, the meeting between their fathers and sons, now becoming myth and rumour amongst a growing Imperium. But Magnus found that he alone could recall the time on terror before their scattering. He enjoyed the fact that he was not alone in the universe, and more were being found. Upon his time on Terror, he met many of his brothers, finding kinship with some, such as Perturabo of the Iron Warriors Legion, bonding over their love of history and scholarship, delving into ruins upon Terror in search of lost texts. Others he respected, such as Sanguinius, Ferris Manus, and Vulcan, and there were some who immediately took a disliking to the Lord of Prospero. Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves, seeing the robed, armoured scholar and his use of psychic powers as cowardly. The time for Magnus on Terror and the years he spent there finally dawned. A deep sorrow came over him as he had no wish to be again separated from his father. One last time, they sailed the great ocean, soaring above Terror in the clouds knowing that it would be decades until they would meet again. The Great Crusade. Humanity demanded Magnus's attention. He had learned so much. He felt a sting of pity from his father, to be burdened with so much knowledge. But this would be Magnus's task. The enlightenment of the Imperium. Dragging out those corners of humanity left in the dark. Blind. Ignorant. But before Magnus departed, the Emperor told his son to be cautious of the warp, cautious of the idea that he could do no wrong, that with all the knowledge and power he possessed, he was not faultless, he was human. Always question, always be open to different ways of thinking, that his immortality was achieved through his legacy, his sons. The Lord of Prospero, on his long journey, finally returned to Tizka. Assembled before a legion of his sons, they together began the painstaking work of rebuilding and remoulding the 15th Legion. With Terran and Prosperine united, the disciplines of the various Prosperine cults were shared with Magnus's psychically gifted sons. Gone was the old livery, new, vibrant crimson donned the 15th Legion's armour in honour of their lord and saviour, a crimson legion for a Crimson King, finally rebuilt over decades, with their ranks swelled, warriors educated by Magnus himself, the Thousand Sons left Prospero and rejoined the Great Crusade. The curse of assumed knowledge is a challenge all enlightened individuals face. We must remember that we once walked in their shoes and were blind to the truths of the universe. The wider our views of the universe becomes, the more our beliefs must come to us second-hand. Our reliance on higher authorities forms almost every aspect of our worldview. I am well aware of that, Athava. Sadly. Not everyone will survive to reach orbit and safety. We've already seen civil disobedience, riots, and people who simply don't want to leave. There's no way anyone can organize the mass evacuation of an entire planet without loss of life. Why would anyone not want to leave a doomed world? Hathor Mart and others have reported instances of the populace refusing to relocate in the face of certain death. But I agree. It is vexing why arguments of sound logic and reason should be ignored. The Imperium is better off without such fools, said Phocis Dakar. 
Why should we waste time and energy trying to help those who will not help themselves? Perjurabo leaned over the plotting table, and Fosis Dakar recoiled from the flint in his gaze. When the Primarch spoke, it was with measured tones of a disappointed teacher. For the same reason I would not allow a child to pick flowers on the edge of a cliff, no matter how bright the blooms. For the same reason I would not let you wander the minefields before this fortress without a fourth legion map and the training to interpret it. We must put aside such childish ignorance and do what is right. Now, do you understand why we must help as many of Morningstar's people as we can? Uh, yes, Lord Perturabo. I, I am in your debt for correcting my erroneous thinking. Fosis Dakar was a seasoned scholar, but rarely did he ever admit to being in need of instruction. Even now, in the face of a Primarch's rebuke, his aura betrayed a measure of insolence. Magnus grinned and said, Fosis Takar is at his best when dealing with absolutes. True and false, right and wrong. He excels at unlocking the structures of empirical formulae, but he will never be a moral philosopher or grand debater. Perhaps not, and he's not the first to express such sentiments. But I'll not have it said we left innocents to die when we could have done something to save them. You and I need to work together, brother. I need every one of your warriors tasked to this world's evacuation, not chasing relics and digging in the dust. One squad diverted to the preservation of knowledge will not affect your timetable. The secrets this world might hold are too precious to be so easily squandered. You really believe there is some ancient knowledge buried in Zarukan that will explain why Morningstar survived Old Night unscathed? I am certain of it. If anyone else, I would say such certainty was arrogant. Sighed Perturabo, letting the data on the plotter table disperse like smoke. When have I ever been wrong about such things? Never. Admitted Perturabo stepping towards the sheet-covered workbenches at the perimeter of the mezzanine. But there is a first time for everything, and I need all your warriors on board. But here I want to show you something. The Primarch pulled back a white sheet to reveal the haphazard arrangement of half-finished projects, contraptions of mysterious purpose, and beautiful arrangements of gears and motors. This is my workshop. It is just as I expected said Magnus, delightedly moving from bench to bench to examine the pieces lying around the edges of the workshop. He lifted a sheet of wax paper, laid beside a partially completed model of a grand amphitheatre. The Thaliacron. You've begun work on it? Not yet. Soon, when the crusade is done and we have heroic tales aplenty to fill it with song, then I'll build it on the mountain across from Father's palace. I will be there to see it unveiled, promised Magnus, and his enthusiasm for his brother's work was genuine and contagious. He and Perturabo spoke as brothers, who had shared every memory from birth to this moment, yet they had known each other only a few short years. Magnus had once spoken of how he and Perturabo had spent time together on terror, recovering the relics of a long-dead polymath, and unearthing Arcana from the forgotten places of old Earth. Arthur had thrilled to hear such tales, relishing every opportunity to learn more of his gene sire. The obvious love between these godlike warriors filled the workspace with a swelling feeling of confraternity, a bond of brotherhood that could never be broken. This will be of interest to you, brother, said Perturabo holding out a complex arrangement of curved metal, winding mechanisms and adjustable lenses. I made a replica of the Antiki Thera, just like you asked. To see so delicate a mechanism in Perturabo's hand seemed incongruous, as most apparatus bearing the stamp of the Iron Warriors that Arvida had seen, save for those within this chamber, had been brutally functional. Does it work? I am not entirely sure. You never fully explained its intended purpose or how exactly it was designed to function. You've built it. What do you think it does? 
I believe it to be some form of navigational instrument, said Perturabo, lifting the device to look through one of its eyepieces. It has the look of a sextant once used by seafarers, but with infinitely more dimensions to its operation. What manner of ocean would you be navigating to require such a device? The Great Ocean. It allows even those without our gifts to perceive the realm beyond. Perturabo nodded and set down the Antikythera. I suspected as much, he said with a sigh, turning to lift something heavy from another part of his workbench. You remember what our father told us in the Hall of Leng, when he spoke of the warp and the danger of looking too deeply into its heart? I do, but this has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with that, as well you know, but we will speak of this later. Perturabo's arm swung around, and he smashed the delicate mechanisms of the Antikythera with a heavy hammer. The metal of the device buckled and split, the precision ground lenses shattering into a thousand fragments. Brother, no! cried Magnus, as the pieces fell to the floor. Why? Perturabo replaced the hammer on his workbench, and said, Because I will play no part in aiding you in delving into things you have been told to leave well alone. Our father knows more than us. He has seen further than us. If he tells us there are regions of the warp into which even he does not dare look, then we are beholden to accept that. Magnus stared at the ruined device in disbelief. Such a piece was the work of a master, a treasure that ought to have been held up as the epitome of the craftsman's art. Arthur saw Magnus's aura darken like blood in water. Knowing what you suspected, you could have destroyed the antique theater at any time after its completion, said Magnus, with cold and controlled anger. But you waited until I was here to see you do it. Why? Because you needed to see it destroyed to truly understand. Magnus let out a breath. <sighs> you have a cruel streak in you, brother. Perhaps. But sometimes cruelty is the only way to make a point so clearly that nobody can ever mistake its intent. The Great Crusade. Millions of Astartes, billions of mortal men and women, accompanied by contingents from the Mechanicum of Mars, had bled out across the galaxy for over a century. What began on terror was now an empire that encompassed billions upon billions of humans across the stars. Painstakingly rebuilt under the tutelage of Magnus, the Thousand Suns Legion enacted Imperial compliance across the galaxy, horrifying Xenos, and non-compliant colonies of mankind fell under their iron fist. Men and women were turned to see enormous men, armoured in vibrant crimson, wielding incredible power. Athenaeans, Corvate, Pavoni, Pyre, and Raptora. Enemy battle plans were read from their minds, or divined before they had even made them. Marines wielded fire and lightning in their hands. Whole contingents were telekinetically maneuvered across the battlefield, led by the Crimson Primarch, who seemed to remake matter with a thought. It was an army of thousands, worth the strength of millions. A statement to the Prosperine cults and teachings of Magnus. But war was not the only thing wielded in the hands of the Thousand Sons Legion. Wherever they strode, no matter who they brought into Imperial compliance, with peace or war, it was knowledge the 15th sought. Hidden tomes, lost libraries, human and Xenos alike, all knowledge that could be claimed from across the universe was collected, saved by Magnus and his sons. The only good is knowledge, and the only evil is ignorance. And how could Magnus destroy knowledge? Knowledge had delivered him from ignorance into enlightenment. The curse of assumed knowledge, the challenge that all enlightened individuals must face. We must remember that we once walked in their shoes and were blind to the truths of the universe. Knowledge had saved him 
and his people from the Psychonuin. It had saved his legion. It was the key to a future, a golden age for humanity, where all of mankind had mastery over the power of the primordial creator, the Warp. Most of the galaxy was blind to his truths, and Magnus pitied them. Like precious gems, the sacred information was saved, taken back to Tizga, and stored within the great glorious white marble pyramid libraries. The city of light and enlightenment. A legacy for humanity to inherit, as Magnus and the Thousand Sons would one day finish the Great Crusade. Decades into the war across the stars, Magnus and the Thousand Sons expedition received a call for aid, hailed by the Fourth Legion, the Iron Warriors. The world of Morningstar, a lost human colony brought into Imperial compliance only recently, was breaking apart, collapsing in upon itself. The evacuation of the civilian population, a feat of such titanic proportions, that even with the brilliant mind of the Lord of the Fourth, the Primarch Perturabo, still not all the people could be saved. Inside the command room once again, Magnus and Perturabo met, both elated to be in the company of a brother once again. The architect and the scholar, one vermilion red, the image of vibrancy, life and wisdom, the other immutable iron, strong and brutal. It was like participating in a living mythologized moment, a privilege to witness two demigods conversing, both of their sons in awe that two Primarchs stood before them. Imagine what these two would achieve together. The Lord of Iron questioned his brother, asking why he had diverted resources to scouring the world for knowledge. With the task of evacuation still at hand, Magnus told his brother that he had read the records of this world, and locked within this planet was a truth as to why Morningstar had survived Old Knight unscathed, that scarring age of horror that all of mankind knew. Think of the good that could be achieved with that information. Besides, Magnus told his brother, when had he ever been wrong about such things? A sentiment the Lord of Prospero utterly believed, even if he did acknowledge the hubris and pride of it. But something more had brought Magnus to his brother, the Antikythera, a replica of a tool designed to navigate the great ocean, the war. Elation filled Magnus, himself brimming with excitement and potential for what he could do, what he could achieve with it. But his joy was snatched away as the Lord of Iron smashed it into pieces. Shock gripped Magnus, and then the briefest spark of hate. Why? How dare he destroy it? How could he deny his opportunity to gain knowledge? The only good is knowledge and the only evil is ignorance, and this act felt nothing but evil to him. Our father knows more than us, Perturabo told him. He has seen further than us. If he tells us there are reasons of the warp, into which even he does not dare look, then we are beholden to accept that. Magnus had been forbidden, warmed of delving too far into dark places in the warp. He knew of this, but yet it still felt evil. Ignorance, the sin, knowledge wasn't evil. He believed in his heart he was strong enough to handle its power, but he dared not say that to his brother. Releasing his anger from his body, Magnus moved on from his brother's cruelty. The world of Morningstar required his attention, but the sting of resentment wouldn't fade. The evacuation outside began to escalate, Millions of people were ferried in overloaded ships as their home consumed itself. With the very world cracking, the Iron Warriors and Thousand Sons were spread thin, risking their lives to bring their people into the last bastions of safety. News roared across the planet, people begging for aid. A call answered personally from Magnus as he personally rode out to help them. Landing down upon the surface, Accompanied by his sons, Magnus found a city in ruins, the very earth beneath them upturning 
and breaking. Lava, ash, and smoke everywhere. Magnus psychically shielded his sons. The wash of sorrow and heartbreak of the people hitting him like a wave. He absorbed it all as tears rolled down his cheek from his one eye. Despite his power, knowledge, and strength, he was human. And it broke him to see, to feel intimately, people suffer like this. Magnus and his sons rushed forward. Save them, he ordered. Psychic power whirled up from within as they all spread out, all of them breathing forth the arts of Prospero and rescuing the civilians. Magnus found the planetary governor wounded and on the verge of death, he utilized his abilities to save him, but soon found himself in danger. A shell from a tank burst into the Primarch's chest. Magnus felt true pain for the first time in his life. Not a careful experimental wound or sparring cut. True pain. It shocked him. It humbled him. Sending a psychic pulse to all his sons. Hail Shaitan! Screamed roar from the throats of an army of zealots. Traitors. A doomsday cult who had burst out around the planet. Slaughtering the innocent civilians indiscriminately all in the name of their prophesied great dying. Magnus burned and split them apart, buying time for his accelerated healing to seal his first true wound. He looked to the sky in horror as an imperial ship, the Lex Ferrum, began to fall, sabotaged by these vile cultists, doomed to crush the last city, ending the lives of millions of people. He would not let this happen. Roaring across the sky in a damaged Thunderhawk, the Lord of Prospero gathered a cabal of his sons to the city. The sky above, steel and fire, their deaths almost certain. Magnus and the Thousand Sons gathered together as a Primarch of the 15th, unleashed everything he had. Light burst from him as if a man had become a supernova and all of Magnus's psychic energy released from him, the Lord of Iron, and millions of Imperials stood in shock, bearing witness to a miracle as the burning, falling ruin of the Lex Ferram came to a halt. Magnus just saved millions, but at the cost of 24 of his sons, consumed and turned to dust in their armor. The guild stung him, with not an ounce of strength left, his skin grey, Magnus collapsed, only to be caught by a brother, the Lord of Iron, carrying his very brave brother. Recovering from his wounds, the Lord of Iron praised Magnus. All of them had borne witness to what psychic powers could do. They saw what Magnus believed. He came a heartbeat from death, the Great Crusade would have been robbed of one of his brightest sons. More importantly, I would have lost a dear brother. There are none among our kin I regard as highly as you. So promise me you won't risk your life like that again. The kind words of Perturabo. Morningstar had almost killed him twice, but Magnus had not given up. Something hidden upon this world, this Shaitan, bore the truth behind this cult and the breaking of the planet. He would uncover it. Once again, Magnus made his way towards the surface of this breaking world. Now a legend with a deed that was spread across the Imperium, a heroic act of a Crimson King. If this is my fate, then I regret nothing. Better to have bathed in the light than cower in darkness. Better to have flown too close to the sun than never feel its heat. Magnus lay upon a cold steel table, his thoughts drifting, memories of his father flooding in, contemplating on his choices, how his insatiable need for knowledge, for answers, now put him on the verge of death. 
finding buried deep within the cracking earth of Morningstar, Magnus, Azek Ariman, Fosister Carr, and a detachment of his thousand sons, opened the Ceramite doors to an ancient Terran colonization ship, the secret the world had been hiding. Immediately, Magnus felt an aura of dread. Nausea swept over him as they delved deeper. Voices began to speak in their heads. Ironman begged his lord to leave, but Magnus refused. They had to know. A figure stepped out amongst the shadows of this strange, streamlined place. A legionary, silhouetted in a sick, rippling undersea glow. A possessed thousand sun, screaming, no one leaves Shaitan. A creature, a psychic apparition flew at Magnus, throttling him and slamming him into a crude surgical table, separating him from his sons. It poured its horrifying truths into his mind. Shaitan, an entity formed from the cruelty of humanity in the Age of Strife, the psychic echo of the tortured souls of this colony ship. Thousands of innocent people who had been murdered and stripped of their connection to the primordial creator by their own people, millennia before. They had been afraid of that power in this age of darkness and rampant warp catastrophe. Magnus wept. He felt their suffering beyond anything he thought possible. The horror. They had taken something beautiful from them and killed it. And it was that suffering, those wounded minds that had screamed in rage and vengeance in his face, coalescing into this entity Shai Tan, and it would make him feel that pain too. It would take away what Magnus valued most, more than anything, his connection to the war. If this is my fate, then I regret nothing. Better to have bathed in the light than cower in darkness. Better to have flown too close to the sun than never feel its heat. Was it curiosity or entitlement that had brought him here? He had needed to know, always, even if it cost him his own life, because ignorance was worse. Magnus looked deeper into Shaitan, speaking to a consciousness that was beyond his. Old Knight, he whispered. The evolution of humanity, the emergence of more psychers, had been too sudden, unguided. Insanity and bloodshed had rippled across humanity in the stars, millennia ago. That was why the colonists of Morningstar had done this. They had tortured and broken all these people to save themselves. And when you love something, with every fragment of your soul, you will sacrifice anything to save it. A people saving their world, like a father would save his sons. Ariman burst into the chamber, attacking the creature and giving Magnus an opening to bind the creature into his grimoire, a tug of war that drew upon every ounce of Magnus's power, leaving him exhausted. The Crimson King returned to the side of his brother, and looked down upon the world that was breaking, the mystery unearthed, the culprit Shai Tan, using the colony ship that was its tomb to break the crust of the world like an egg, one last vengeance of the tortured minds. Magnus took one last look at the ships carrying the refugees, the millions of people and then he ordered its destruction. The doomsday cult of Shaitan, that poison, could not be allowed to be free amongst the Imperium. How many more worlds would die if even one of them lived? Perturabo questioned his brother, commenting on this unusual cruelty. But this was not cruel. It was necessary. The ships and the people of Morningstar burned. All became dust. Scientia protestas est. Knowledge is power. What Magnus had known burned an entire world. Knowledge was also responsibility. 
for those brave enough to wield it. Though the scars remained, Magnus and the Thousand Sons continued upon the Great Crusade, traversing the stars and bringing more worlds into Imperial compliance, and collecting more knowledge that filled the pyramids of Tezka. But his way of war was not appreciated by all, especially many of his brothers. Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves was often a critical voice of Magnus and his legion's conduct. Even his vile brother such as Conrad Kurz cared nothing for the Crimson King's world view. Many times, Magnus had risked open war to defend libraries, even in the midst of conquest, even from his brothers. After nearly two centuries of war, the Imperium spanning across enormous swaths of the galaxy, with billions upon billions of people, all united under one banner, Magnus, and the 15th descended to the surface of the world, coined Agru. Mountains and arid deserts dominated the planet, the temperature searing, even for the superhuman genetics of the Astartes. But something was wrong on this seemingly insignificant planet. The tides of the war, the primordial creator that flowed across the galaxy, howled furiously upon this place. It made the 15th Legion feel wrong. It assaulted them in their mind and body, forcing them into the higher levels of the enumerations, psychic mental paths created by Magnus. Each level an escalation in mental solitude and concentration. Ariman, Amon, Phosis Dekar, Hathor Matt, Uthizar, and Sobek were all unnerved. Their lord, their Crimson King, had descended into the local human tribe's sacred valley alone. Somehow the people of this world had survived, free of mutation or rampant untamed psychic potential. Even here, in this place of violent tides, knowledge Magnus had to discover. The secrets here had taken them to the top of Agru's highest peak, but before the journey could begin, Magnus and his sons were interrupted. Descending from the sky, a contingent of space wolves unceremonially strode up to the Crimson King, demanding he answer the call of Lehman Russ that had so far been ignored their arrogance and the sheer audacity to speak to their lord in such a way rippled anger across the thousand suns. But the walls were quickly cowed with a simple burst of Magnus's power, earning a sign of submission. A compromise was reached and the thousand suns and space wolves ascended the mountain together. Then Russ's call would be answered. The journey was long scorching hot, for all except the wolves of Fenris. Still draped in furs and cloaks, they seemed almost unaffected by the heat, to the astonishment of the Thousand Sons. Magnus encouraged his sons, such as Ariman, to converse and bond with their fellow Astartes, such as Othea Weirdmake of the Space Wolves. The animosity of the two legions, legendary across the Great Crusade, but Magnus believed that it was hate born from ignorance. Even they could be shown enlightenment. Magnus and his sons approached the precipice of the mountain, but they found themselves ambushed. The ground quake, the air vibrated, everything was on edge. As the adrenaline of battle coursed through Magnus and all the Astartes, ancient Xenos constructs, once thought dormant burst from the mountain, and the battle begun. Everything the Thousand Suns launched at the constructs was repelled. Their frustration grew, all of them unable to unleash their full psychic potential due to the unsteady warp tides and the judgmental eyes of the space wolves. Hundreds of Astartes fell in atomizing blasts until Magnus, alone, with his feather cloak spread like eagle wings, began to swell with power. His limbs ran electric with light. Blue fire ushered forth from the glowing godlike Primarch, felling one of the Xenos constructs. No one attacked his sons. 
but the exertion of power cost Magnus dearly. He sank to the floor, his scarlet skin now pale, but it was not over. The wounded thing was not done, and lanced a beam directly at the vulnerable Primarch. The Thousand Sons screamed. Ariman and Uthazar crumbled to their knees. A legion overcome with soul-wrenching grief collected themselves and charged without restraint. With their throats raw from screaming vitriol and hate, they mopped up the rest of this Xenos filth. They turned to see amongst fire and smoke, Phosis to Car on the edge of death, in front of him a kind shield, and kneeling down behind him was their lord. Magnus lived. Better to have flown too close to the sun than never feel its heat. Again, Magnus had put himself in harm's way, all for the mystery atop Agru's mountain peak. The fifteenth fell to relief like nothing they had ever felt before, but yet again the wounded Magnus wanted to continue. At the summit, Magnus, the Thousand Sun survivors, and the walls peered down into the crater. An aura of dread, so strong even Magnus wavered in its presence, oozed from a dark core. It was pure hate, a monster sealed in a time and a war almost lost to the universe. The Thousand Suns approached, but dark tendrils rushed forth and swallowed their crimson king. In a dreamscape nightmare, a kaleidoscope of colour and emotion, a disgusting serpent beast crawled forth, speaking to Magnus, taunting him. It was nothing to Magnus. He had flown the great ocean, even before his tutelage by his father. He saw through its lies, he saw the arcana gate that it guarded and it bled from. More jabs came. It spoke of Magnus's pride, how it already sipped from a poison chalice. It knew his secrets, but Magnus spat back that he had bested powers greater than it before. He had delved into the depths of the war, he was its master. Arrogance. The last word on the serpent's lips, as Magnus throttled the life from it. The darkness scattered, as the shining, blazing Magnus descended amongst his sons, who looked on in awe. Victory and knowledge of the gate was his, but the judging eyes of the wall stared at the Crimson Lord. They and many others in the Imperium had also looked upon him in scorn, and after two centuries of war, after seeing the consequences of Magnus's choices, a question had formed in the Imperium, a question about the future of psychic powers. There is an ancient legend of old earth that speaks of three men of Aegina who lived in a cave deep in the mountains, said Magnus with the warmth of a natural storyteller. Though he had heard this story before, Ariman found himself captivated by Magnus's voice, the natural charisma that loaded every commanding word. These men lived shut off from the light of the world and they would have lived in permanent darkness but for a small fire that burned in a circle of stones at the heart of the cave. They ate lichen that grew on the walls and drank cold water from an underground stream. They lived, but what they had was not living. Day after day, they sat around the fire staring into the flickering embers and dancing flames, believing that its light was all the light in the world. The shadows made shapes and patterns on the walls, and this delighted them greatly. In their own way, they were happy, moving from day to day without ever wondering what lay beyond their flickering circle of light. Magnus paused in his recital, allowing the audience to imagine the scene and picture the dancing shadows on the cave's walls. But one day, a mighty storm blew over the mountains, 
but so deep were the men that only the merest breath of it reached their cave. The fire danced in the wind, and the men laughed to see new patterns on the wall. The wind died, and they went back to contemplating the fire, much as they had always done. But one of the men got up and walked away from the fire, which surprised the other men greatly, and they bade him return to sit with them. This lone man shook his head, for he alone had a thirst to learn more of the wind. He followed it as it retreated from the cave, climbing steep cliffs, crossing chasms, and negotiating many perils, before he finally saw a faint haze of light ahead of him. He climbed out of the cave, emerging onto the side of the mountain and looked up at the blazing sun. Its light blinded him, and he fell to his knees, overcome by its beauty and warmth. He feared he had burnt out his eyes, but in a little while his vision returned, and he hesitantly looked around him. He had come out of the cave high on the mountain's flank, and the world was spread out before him in all its glory. Glittering green seas and endless fields of golden corn. He wept to see such things, distraught that he had wasted so many years in darkness, oblivious to the glory of the world around him, a world that had been there all along but which his limited vision had denied him. The Primarch stopped, looking up to the stars, and his rapt audience followed his gaze, as though picturing the blazing sun of his story. Can you imagine what it felt like? Asked Magnus, his voice racked with emotion. To have spent your entire life staring at a small fire and thinking it was the only light in the world, only to be then confronted by the sun. The man knew he had to tell his friends of this miraculous discovery, and he made the journey back to the cave where the other men sat, still staring into the fire and smiling vacuously at the shadows on the wall. The man who had seen the sun looked at the place he had called home and saw it for the prison it truly was. He told the others what he had seen, but they were not interested in far-fetched tales of a burning eye in the sky. All they wanted to do was live their lives as they had always lived them. They called him mad and laughed at him, continuing to stare at the fire as it was the only reality they knew. Ariman had first heard this story as a philosopher in the Corvée Temple when Magnus had mentored him prior to facing Dominus Liminus. He heard the same note of bitterness in the Primarch's voice that he had heard then, a precisely modulated pitch that conveyed the proper measure of anguish and frustration at the blindness of the men in the cave. How could anyone turn away from such light once they knew of its existence? The man could not understand his friend's reluctance to travel to the world above. But he resolved that he would not take their refusal to come with him as an end to the matter. He would show them the light, no matter what. And if they would not come to the light, then he would bring it to them. So, the man climbed back to the world of light and began to dig. He dug until he had widened the cave mouth. He dug for a hundred years, and then a hundred more, until he had dug away the top of the mountain. Then he dug downwards, a great pit in the heart of the mountain, until he broke through into the cave where his fellows sat around the fire. Magnus fell silent, his words trailing off. Though Ariman knew it was a theatrical pause, rather than any real moment of introspection, knowing how the story ended. Ariman was not surprised Magnus had stopped here. In the original version of the tale, the man's friends were so terrified by what they were shown that they had killed the man and retreated deeper into the cave with their fire to live their lives in perpetual twilight. 
The tale was an aragolical parable on the futility of sharing fundamental truths with those too narrow perceptions of reality. By telling it selectively, Magnus had broken his covenant with the audience, but none of them would ever know. Instead, he continued his tale with fresh words, woven from his imagination. The men were amazed at what he showed them. The light they had been missing for all their lives, and the golden joy that could be theirs were they just brave enough to take his hand and follow him. One by one, they climbed from their dark cave and saw the truth of the world around them, all its wonders and all its beauty. They looked back at the dank, lightless cave they had called home, and were horrified by how limited their understanding of the world had been. They heaped praise upon the man who had shown them the way to the light, and they honored him greatly, for the world and all its bounty was theirs to explore forevermore. Magnus let his new ending wash over the amphitheater, and no member of the Theatrica Imperialis had given so commanding a performance. A rolling wave of applause erupted from the tears, and Magnus smiled, the perfect blend of modesty and gratitude. Sangonius and Fulgrim were on their feet, though Mortarian and the Death Guard remained as stoic as ever. As pitch perfect as Magnus's delivery had been, Ariman saw that not all of the audience were won over, though it was clear the case against Magnus and the Thousand Sons was no longer as cut and dried as his accusers had hoped. Magnus raised his hands to quell the applause, as though abashed to be so acclaimed. The man knew he had to show his friends the truth of the world around them. And just as it was his duty to save his friends from their dull, sightless existence, it is our duty to do the same for humanity. The Thousand Sons alone, of all the legions, have seen the light beyond the gates of the Empyrean. That light will free us from our shackles, of our mundane perceptions of reality and allow the human race to stand as masters of the galaxy. Just as the men around the fire needed to be shown the glorious future that lay within their grasp, so too does humanity. The knowledge the thousand suns are gathering will allow everyone to know what we know, to see as we see. Humanity needs to be led upwards with small steps, with their eyes gradually opened, lest the light blind them. That is the ultimate goal of the Thousand Suns. Our future as a race is at stake. My friends, I urge you not to throw away this chance for enlightenment, for we are at a tipping point in the history of the Imperium. Think of the future and how this moment will be judged in the millennia to come. Magnus staggered forward, reaching out to embrace the monster that was Hastar, his brave legionary. Mercy and forgiveness would be his, until a shot rang out, bursting the Astartes apart. Two sides looked at each other across the chasm, thousand suns and space wolves, all seeing the one who had fired it, the Wolf King, Lehman Russ. Ark reached Secundus. A joint compliant action between the Thousand Suns, Space Wolves and Word Bearers. But conflict had arisen. Once again, Magnus stood in front of the world's great libraries, intent to protect the knowledge that was not evil, simply knowledge. But the wolves had come, the fury of their lord insatiable. A shield wall rammed up against a kind shield barrier. The Barbarians versus the Scholars, 
Yet no weapons were drawn. Yet, it was a test of wills. The chief librarian Ariman screamed to his crimson king and brothers to end this madness. But Magnus stood defiant, his feather cloak bellowing in the icy wind as imperial forces clashed in front of his eyes. Tempers flared, and the Thousand Sons began to psychically choke their Fenrisian cousins, but the effort to corral them was too much. Hastar, warrior of the Pavoni cults, felt his body start to convulse. Rampant growths of protean flesh spilled out from his armor joints, and a psychic corruption threatened to spill over all the others. The flesh change had returned. The clash halted, all looking upon the Thousand Sons warrior in shock, all witnessing the monster until he was blown apart at the barrel of the Wolf King's bolter. Lehman Russ, barely restrained fury and prowess, a living engine of destruction. The Wolf King, surrounded by his rune priests, an honor guard stared at the Crimson King. The tension was on a knife's edge. Death was inevitable. A golden light flared at the center. Their brother, the Primarch Lorgar Aurelian, the tan-skinned giant, strode forward, his aura a sense of wonder, even to the other Astartes. Russ told him to move. The Cyclops had gone too far. He had spilled Fenrisian blood, and he must pay. Lorgar pleaded with Russ to calm himself, as Magna stood motionless. The thoughts bleeding into his mind. This savage had murdered his son. This barbarian wouldn't let him save the knowledge of this world. Oh, how he was so content to be ignorant. Russ spilled forth more insults, decrying Magnus's so-called sorcery. Magnus laughed. How hypocritical when rune priests wielded the magic of Fenris. It was only sorcery to him, because he chose to remain ignorant. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Oh, how Magnus hated those who feared what they simply did not understand. Lorgar again pleaded with both of them, not to break the bonds between them, to spill more blood. The tensions began to die down, soothed by the words of the horizon. Russ walked away. Fenrisian blood had been spilled, and he vowed that there would be a reckoning between them one day. Magnus and the Thousand Sons had their library, but the victory was overshadowed by the haunting realization of the return of the flesh change. Ariman tried to speak to Magnus about Hastur, but Magnus assured his favored son it was a fluke. Magnus was lying. Both of them could feel it, even if Ariman dare not voice it. The events of Ark Reach Secundus had not gone unnoticed, and whispers and rumors of the events overshadowed the largest gathering in the Imperium, as Magnus and his son set course for the world of Ulanor. A triumph, billions of mortal soldiers, and hundreds of thousands of Astartes joined in the greatest parade the Imperium had ever shown. In the wake of the victory of the Orc Purge on Ulanor, he descended down to the enormous city-sized parade ground. The Emperor of Mankind. The very sight of him men made weep, even the Astartes. Magnus looked on in awe. Even now he was confounded by the being that was his father. The guiding light that led towards an age of enlightenment for all of humanity. But surprise hit them all, as the Emperor declared that his work would take him back to terror. The Great Crusade would continue under a new War Master, a brother elevated above equals, Horus Lupercal. 
Magnus was pained by the idea of his father leaving their side, but worst of all, he had not revealed the purpose of his work on terror to any of them. Why? Did he not trust him? Did he think Magnus was not wise enough, strong enough? It was thought he kept to himself as he took the opportunity to meet with his brothers. Many decades had passed since many of their last meetings, and he enjoyed their bonds of fraternity once again. But there had been rumors, talks of a movement of those who despised the use of psychic powers within the Imperium, overshadowing their conversations. Mortarion of the Death Guard and Lehman Russ of the Space Wars were open in their hostility and had been drumming up support for years. Magnus and those of his brothers such as Sanguinius and Jagatai Khan, the most pro-psychic of all their brothers convened. The Librarius, a disciplined set of rules and balances to ensure the safe and modest use of psychic abilities in the legions was drafted. It was a compromise, one that Magnus utterly despised. He was confident, for how could the Imperium be so blind as to shun away its greatest gift and potential? Only a few short years after the triumph at Ulanor, and the crowning of Warmaster Horus, Magnus received the call. A conclave had been called to determine the future of psychic use within the Imperium, upon the world of Nikea. Magnus and his sons arrived, only to be greeted by his brothers Sanguinius and Fulgrim. Along a massive corridor they strode, into the hollowed out heart of a long dormant volcano. Quickly, Magnus began to notice that it was as if he was being escorted not as a guest, but as a prisoner on trial. A large glittering cave with a Colosseum structure is where Magnus stood before a pantheon of assembled lords, Astartes and Primarchs, and at the top, far above, with his flaming sword upon his lap, sat his father, the Emperor of Mankind. The battle had begun. They came in droves, speakers who decried the use of sorcery, its raw destructive power, the scars of old night, and the perils of the warp. Man could not be trusted with it. Some would always delve too deep. It was dangerous. Mortarian, and others gave speeches of venom and hate that burned inside Magnus as he struggled to contain himself. Even the rune priest Othera Weirdmake came forward, an utter betrayal of the olive branch they had extended upon Algarum. After having endured this plea to ignorance and regression, Magnus took his turn to speak. With crimson fingers, he lifted them to the heavens and began to utter the truth in his heart. He spoke of an allegorical cave, how we, humanity, must look to the sun, feel its warmth, its heat, if only we are brave enough to open our eyes to a new world, not cower back into the safety of the dark because of fear. That light will free us from the shackles of our mundane perceptions of reality and allow the human race to stand as masters of the galaxy, just as the men around the fire needed to be shown the glorious future that lay within their grasp. So too does humanity. A golden era awaited, if only they were brave enough to grasp it. A future where humanity mastered its psychic potential, armed with the knowledge that the thousand suns had collected for centuries. Magnus, would save humanity. Applause, tears, and praise flooded over Magnus. He felt incredible. They finally saw it. Hope. Magnus had given all he could. Conversing with Iron Man in their private chambers, he told his son of their responsibility to be guides to the ignorant, just as the Emperor was to his. No whispered Ariman. You already knew of it. When the Emperor showed you of the warp's wonders and dangers, you feigned not to know. 
but you had already peered into its depths and seen them. Magnus almost killed his favoured son on the spot. White hot fury seethed through him as a vital nerve had been struck. He bored into Ariman with his eye, telling him to never say that again, ever. Unguarded, Ariman felt a link between them. Orsmund, his twin brother, what did he do? A seal, a pact, what had Magnus done all those years ago? How had he saved the Legion? Shame, anger, desperation. Ariman saw all mix within his lord. Only moments before others had condemned them, declaring mankind could not handle the responsibility of psychic power. Were they right? Were they right to call the 15th sorcerers? But they were interrupted. Magnus and all attendants walked back to the Colosseum ground. Judgment had come. Hear now the words of my ruling. I am not blind to the needs of the Imperium, but nor am I blind to the realities of the hearts of men. I hear men speak of knowledge and power as though they are abstract concepts to be employed as simply as a sword or gun. They are not. Power is a living force, and the danger with power is obsession. A man who attains a measure of power will find it comes to dominate his life until all he can think of is the acquisition of more. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but few can stand the ultimate test of character, that of wielding power without succumbing to its darker temptations. Peering into the darkness to gain knowledge of the warp is fraught with peril. For it is an inconstant place of shifting reality, capricious lies, and untruths. The seeker after truth must have a care he is not deceived, for false knowledge is far more dangerous than ignorance. All men wish to possess knowledge, but few are willing to pay the price. Always men will seek to take the shortcut the quick route to power, and it is a man's own mind, not his enemy or foe, that will lure him to evil ways. True knowledge is gained only after the acquisition of wisdom. Without wisdom, a powerful person does not become more powerful, he becomes reckless. His power will turn on him and eventually destroy all he has built. I have walked paths no man can know, and faced the unnameable creatures of the warp. I understand all too well the secrets and dangers that lurk in its hidden darkness. Such things are not for lesser minds to know, no matter how powerful or knowledgeable they believe themselves to be. The secrets I have shared serve as warnings not enticements to explore further. Only death and damnation await those who pry too deeply into secrets not meant for mortals. I see now I have allowed my sons to delve too profoundly into matters I should never have permitted them to know even existed. Let it be known that no one shall suffer censure, for this conclave is to serve unity not discord. But no more shall the threat of sorcery be allowed to taint the warriors of the Astartes. Henceforth, it is my will that no legion will maintain a librarious department. All its warriors and instructors must be returned to the battle companies and never again employ any psychic powers. Without wisdom, power will destroy the one who wields it. Seekers desire power, but not wisdom. Power without wisdom is dangerous. 
Better to have wisdom first. Those who have knowledge do not predict. Those who predict do not have knowledge. If you abuse power, you will be burned, and then you will learn. If you live. They had lost. The future of enlightenment was dead. Ash in their hands. Rising from his throne, the Emperor looked directly at Magnus. He peered into his mind, seeing the boundaries Magnus had crossed, his breaking of his word to his father, his delving into the corners of the great ocean he had been forbidden to go to. If I am guilty of anything, it is the simple pursuit of knowledge. I am its master, I swear it. No one saw the Emperor's lips move. Even through his blinding golden aura, words spilled forth that hit like a hammer to the souls of all who bore witness. The seeker of the truth must have a care he is not deceived, for false knowledge is far more dangerous than ignorance. All men wish to possess knowledge, but few are willing to pay the price. Always men will seek to take the shortcut, the quick route to power, and it is a man's own mind, not his enemy or foe, that will lure him to evil ways. True knowledge is gained only after the acquisition of wisdom. Without wisdom, a powerful person does not become more powerful, he becomes reckless. The words cut Magnus like a knife coming from his father, the one being he looked up to. I see now I have allowed my sons to delve too profoundly into matters I should have never permitted them to even know existed. Magnus had lied. All those years ago, on Prospero, he had delved into the secrets of the warp, long before his return to Terra. He had explored and acquired knowledge unguarded, untempered by wisdom. He was a Primarch, a superhuman, but still human, and he tackled everything with the curiosity of a reckless child. Because he naively thought he was wise enough, he knew better. The use of psychic powers in the legions was outlawed, under pain of death. Magnus and his sons limped out in shame to the stars, their fellow ally legions and Primarchs disappointed by the actions of the 15th and what that had cost them. Almost resigned to his father's decree, Magnus sank to his knees as a psychic vision pulsed into his mind, a vision of fire, death and corruption, and through the miasma of cataclysm he saw his brother, Horus. The 15th in shame made their way towards Prospero, Magnus feeling conflict in his heart. What should he do? Should he tell his father of his vision? The father who he had just utterly failed? By means he had just outlawed? And with what proof? That entities of the warp that he was not supposed to know about were conspiring to corrupt his most favoured son? Magnus and his legion returns to Prospero. Once again Magnus set his eyes upon Tisca, the city of light. Oh how he loved his home, the jewel of hope in a galaxy of darkness and ignorance. Assembling with his captains, Ariman, Amon, Phosis Takar, Hathor Mat, Uthizar and Sobek, Magnus told them of his vision a partial truth of the lies he had perpetuated over two centuries, of entities at the warp that were beyond powerful. They were malignant and corrupting to the unprepared. Magnus defied the Edict of Nikea, not even a day after his declaration, as he began to delve back into the warp and his own ancient texts, divining prophecies about the fall of his brother Horus of a fallen son, would ravage his father's kingdom and all of humanity. It was up to the 15th legion to save him, to prevent this oncoming disaster. Inside deep caverns underneath Tisca, 
Magnus and his sons prepared for a ritual. One whose very inception had been crafted from knowledge Magnus knew he was not meant to know. Surrounded by a cabal of his sons, cleansed and focused to a degree that was beyond human, the Crimson King began. With human thralls around them, energy that Magnus knew would be consumed in what was to come. The thought was distasteful, but the fate of the Imperium and humanity was on the line. He spoke to his sons. Too few have the courage to take arm against an uncaring galaxy, but we are the Thousand Sons. There is nothing we dare not do. Laying down upon an altar, his white robe spilling over the edge, Magnus connected himself to Horus. Blood began to pour from him. Psychic sympathetic wounds that mirrored the War Master sprouted over his body. Magnus' eye glazed over with a kaleidoscope of impossible colors as his soul roared into the warp. Horus, my brother, I am coming for you. Days passed as Magnus' sons, Ariman, Amon, and Uthazar stood vigil. The Lord's body was pale and dripping with sweat. Finally, Magnus awoke. I have failed, he told them. There were others there. Erebus of the word bearers who aided in the corruption of Horus. Lorgar's legion had already fallen to the primordial annihilator, Chaos. The word was used as if it was a name, but Magnus had told them after Nikea about the entities of the war. But this Chaos was something more? Ariman questioned his lord, but Magnus told him he only knew of this Chaos after this very confrontation. He was lying. Ariman felt the flicker in his aura. Again, Magnus had lied to him. They had to warn the Emperor. Horus had been corrupted by this chaos, and war was coming. But if Magnus could tell his father now, it could save billions of lives. Once again, thralls of Prospero's psychic cults were brought forth. Their sacrifice willingly given, but still utterly distasteful. Again, Magnus lay upon the altar beneath Tizga. The new ritual to reach terror would require enormous power. Ariman again questioned Magnus, seeing that this ritual to reach terror required Magnus to make pacts with entities of this so-called chaos. Names whispered as demons in order to break through Terra's psychic defenses and warn the Emperor. Magnus told his son it was his consequence to bear alone, that he had bargained with such creatures before and bested them. The warp around him began to convulse once again, and in a pillar of light, Magnus's soul once again roared into the warp. Like a serpent shedding skin, Magnus let go his mortal form. A one-eyed king with a blazing soul of fire sailed past malicious creatures who dared not challenge him. He saw vistas and sights beyond the scope of human language to describe. Mortarian, Russ, if only they could see the beauty of what they shun in ignorance. Following ley lines that spanned across the galaxy, he arrived near Terra, finding it slower and harder as he approached. He wasn't going to make it. Then he felt it, a sentience behind him, something beautiful, serene, fluctuating with power. He knew in this place of contradiction, not everything was evil, and felt the warmth of this entity offering help. It spoke no words, just offering itself freely. He took it. Swelling with his added power, Magnus broke through the psychic obstacle, his soul flying through the ancient Eldari tunnels that connected to the heart beneath the Imperial Palace. The Golden Throne Room began to shake violently. Raw psychic energy was rampant. Thousands of ordinary people began to die. Magnus, a burning white-hot soul, burst into the throne room laying his eye upon his father. 
monster. The servants around the Emperor cried, firing into this fiery apparition before them. But before Magnus could speak, he began to hear laughter, and then shrieking behind him. A horde of twisted, sentient nightmare had followed him. Demons. Magnus looked at the Emperor, panic and shame washing over his features as he realized what he had just unleashed. Father, he cried out, the last words he spoke as he felt those golden eyes look upon him with utter disdain. Magnus awoke back on Prospero. Tears fell down his cheek. What had he done? He had tried to tell his father, give him the warning, but nothing he said could have outweighed what he had done. Without wisdom, power will destroy the one who wields it. Seekers desire power, but not wisdom. Power without wisdom is dangerous. Better to have wisdom first. Those who have power do not predict. Those who predict do not have knowledge. The Webway Project. The knowledge Magnus was missing. The future of humanity, shielded from the war the Emperor's enlightenment, and it had just been destroyed by Magnus. He didn't know. He had broken the wards and had corrupted it forever. What had he done? The Emperor had looked into him and seen all he had done. His breaking of the edict, the rituals, and the wards around terror. Magnus thought he could succeed. He thought he had the best of this chaos. He thought he knew better. Overwhelming grief swallowed Magnus. He ran to his private chambers, broken, defeated, shame, a monument to failure and hubris. You have nothing to fear from me, Amon. You have been my most faithful servant since I first came to Prospero. I could never harm you. With respect, my lord, I am sure young Uthisar thought the same, said Amon, picking his way gingerly through the wreckage of Magnus's chamber. His grey hair was kept cropped, close to his skull, and his skin had the textured age of vellum. He knelt beside Uthisar's body and placed his hand upon the crackled and seared breastplate. The bodies of the scarab occult lay around Uthisar. Their bodies twisted in unnatural ways, and their flesh blackened, as though consumed in the same fire that had destroyed Magnus's library. Tell me what happened, said Amon. Magnus lowered his head, unwilling to meet his oldest friend's gaze. The captain of the ninth made no accusations. He didn't need to. No accusation could carry greater guilt than Magnus placed upon himself. Almost a week had passed since he had killed Uthazar, a week in which he had almost given in to his self-destructive urges and turned his powers upon himself. Fearing the worst, others had tried to enter his chambers, but Magnus had kept them all at bay until now. Magnus looked down at the grotesquely crumpled body of Balek Uthazar and sighed with regret it was an unforgivable lapse, and should never have happened. But he knew too much, and I could not let him leave. Knew too much about what? Come here. Let me show you, said Magnus. Amon rose and followed Magnus into the balcony overlooking the white city of Tizka. Magnus read the wariness in Amon's aura and didn't blame him. He would be a fool not to be wary. In all the long years since they had first spoken, as tutor and pupil, Magnus had never thought of Amon as a fool. Magnus looked towards the noonday sky. Fly the great ocean with me, he said. Amon nodded and closed his eyes, and Magnus let his body of light float free of his flesh. The concerns of the mortal world lessened, but could not be wholly ignored. Tizka transformed from a place of cool marble to a glittering jewel of light. The tens of thousands of shimmering soul lights who called the city home like tiny lanterns. 
how fragile they are, said Magnus, though there was no one yet to hear him. The warm glow of Ammon's subtle body appeared next to him, and they flew into a sky of brilliant blue. The world around them deepened from blue to black, the stars pinwheeling around them like darts of a phosphor. The blackness of space transformed into swirling, multicolored chaos of the great ocean, and both travelers felt the welcome rush of pleasure as his currents flowed around their ethereal forms. Magnus led the way, streaking through the swirling abyss towards a destination only he was capable of finding. Amon followed him, his dutiful friend and beloved son. They came to the region of stillness he had seen a week ago. He felt Amon's horror as he beheld the vast fleet of ships, the slab-sided warships, the sleek strike cruisers and the monstrous monuments to destruction that were the battle barges. Hundreds of vessels drew ever closer to Prospero. Ships of many flags and many allegiances united with one shared purpose annihilation. Leading them was a feral blade of a ship, unsheathed to deliver the death blow to its hated foe. Grey and fanged, it prowled the stars with carved eyes as its braiding bow pierced the depths of the great ocean with uncanny precision. Is that what I think it is? It is, confirmed Magnus. They flew closer to the brutal vessel. The protective shields that kept the Void Predators at bay, no match for travelers of such power. They passed through its layered voids, diving through the meter upon meter of adamantium hull plates, integrity fields and honeycombed bulkheads, until they reached the heart of the ship. The masters of this fleet gathered to plan the destruction of all that Magnus held dear, and the two sons of Prospero listened to their deliberations. Magnus was prepared for what he would hear, but Ammon was not, and the flaring wash of his etheric field sent a pulse of choleric energy through the ship's crew. Why? begged Ammon. Because I was wrong. All the things you taught me, I arrogantly assumed I already knew. You warned me of the gods of the warp, and I laughed at you calling you a superstitious old fool. Well, I know better now, for I beheld such a being and thought I had the better of it, but I was wrong. I have done terrible things, Amon, but you must believe that I did them for the right reasons. Amon drifted down towards the master of this vessel, and the steely-eyed killer in golden armor who stood next to him on a raised command dais. A group of identically armored warriors stood at the base of the dais, occupied by their leaders. The Council of Nikea. Were they right to name us warlocks? I fear they may have been, though only now do understand that. And for that, we are to suffer. Magnus nodded and flew up through the ironwork of the starship exploding outwards into the seething cauldron of the great ocean. Ammon flew at his side, and they hurtled back to Prospero, exhaling pent-up breaths as they opened their eyes and looked down on the reassuringly familiar vista of Tiska. And the legend knows nothing of this. Nothing. I have drawn a veil around Prospero. None see out, not even the Corvide. Now the Thousand Sons must learn what it means to be blind. So our punishment draws ever closer. What happens when it gets here? You are kind, old friend. It is my punishment. Their axes will fall on the rest of us as well, pointed out Amon. I ask again, what will we do when they get here? Nothing. There is nothing to do. There is always something to do. We can destroy them before they even reach us. Magnus shook his head, saying, This is not about whether we can defend ourselves against this threat. Of course we can. It is about whether we should. Why should we not? 
We are the thousand suns, and nothing is beyond us. No path is unknown to us, and no destiny is hidden from us. Instruct the Corvide to pierce the veils of the future. The Pavoni and Raptura can enhance our warriors' prowess, while the Pirie burn our enemies, and the Athenians read the minds of their commanders. When they come, they will find us ready to fight. Magnus despaired, hearing only the urge to strike the first blow in Amon's voice. Have you not heard what I have said? I do not strike because it is what the powers that have manipulated me since I came here want me to do. They want me to take arms against our doom, knowing that if I do, it will only confirm everything those who hate and fear us have always believed. Amon looked out over the city, and his eyes took on a faraway look, tears of loss streaming down his cheeks. Before you came to Prospero, I had a recurring nightmare. I dreamt that everything I held dear was swept away and destroyed. It plagued me for years. But on the day you arrived from the heavens like a comet, the dream stopped. I never had it again. I convinced myself it was nothing more than an ancestral memory of all night. But it wasn't. I know that now. I foresaw this, the destruction of everything I hold dear is coming to pass. Amon closed his eyes, and he gripped the balcony with white-knuckled fury. I may not be able to stop it, but I am going to fight to protect my home. And if you ever held my friendship in any esteem, you would do the same! Magnus rounded on Amon. Despite everything I have done, my fate is my own. I am a loyal son of the Emperor, and I would never betray him, for I have already broken his heart and his greatest creation. I will accept my fate, and though history may judge us traitors, we will know the truth. We will know we were loyal unto the end, because we accepted our fate. Magnus looked out of his chamber to the mountains that bore a statue of him, a monument to the place he crashed into this world over two centuries before. He knew in his heart he couldn't be forgiven for all he had done. The Emperor's retribution would be apocalyptic. The Emperor's words on Nikea that any who broke his edict would become his enemy and he would destroy them utterly. All this will be ashes, he told himself. It does not have to be, said a voice uttered from the direction of a mirror. The form within spoke in his image, the demon he had seen, the serpent of Agru. Such entities could never fully be destroyed. All bargains come with a price. Magnus saw that now, over a century ago. The deal he had struck in secret to save his sons from the flesh change. He was now confounded with the truth that he had not bested this creature then. He was a fool. There is a price to pay for the time I gave your sons. You knew this when you accepted the gift of my power. Now it is time to make good on your bargain. The demon showed Magnus a vision. A crimson king locked upon a golden throne, enslaved as a battery to a tyrant emperor, of the now fleet coming to enact his punishment. Magnus screamed, 
erupting into a frenzy of sorrow and anger, ripping apart everything in the room, his power out of control, as the cracked mirror reflection taunted him, telling him he could not destroy them all. It offered him salvation. It could save Prospero if it just accepted them. My lord, Uthazar said, rushing into the chamber. Magnus locked his eye with Uthazar. Unguarded, everything Magnus had done, the truth and their impending destruction were psychically transferred to him. Uthazar staggered. We have to warn the Legion. Uthazar made his way to leave, but he never reached the door before Magnus emulated him. An entire week passed. The Thousand Sons racked with nerves as they awaited news from their lord. Amon, Magnus's mentor, a father figure, and his oldest friend entered the destroyed chambers, seeing for himself the charred body of Uthazar, a pitiful, broken mess of a man sat in his wallow. The once vermilion red, glorious crimson king. But now Magnus looks nothing like the warrior scholar Amon had known his entire life. Amon questioned his Primarch. What happened? And Magnus showed him. Both of them, like they did in his youth, littered their souls into the wall. And there Amon saw it. The brutal Ceramite cathedral ships of the Space Wolves heading to Prospero. All the things you taught me, I arrogantly assumed I already knew. You warned me of the gods of the warp, and I laughed at you, calling you a superstitious fool. Well, I know better now, for I beheld such a being and thought I had the better of it. But I was wrong. I have done terrible things, Amon. But you must believe that I did them for the right reasons. The Emperor's executions were coming to destroy Magnus and the 15th Legion, and he was going to let them. I do not strike, because it is what the powers that have manipulated me since I came here want me to do. They want me to take arms against our doom, knowing that if I do, it will only confirm everything those who hate and fear us have always believed. Anger filled Amon. They could fight. They didn't have to die for the sins of Magnus. But nothing moved the Crimson King. And though history may judge us traitors, we will know the truth. We will know that we were loyal unto the end because we accepted our fate. He had been arrogant, foolish, and prideful. His faults had cost him everything, but he still believed in the Emperor and would play no part in aiding the schemes of the creatures that had put him in this situation. Magnus ordered the fleets of the Legion to scatter, and erected a psychic shield across the entire planet. No news would come or leave. They were all in the dark. The people of Prospero worked, studied, played and lived, unbeknownst to the doom that approached. And then, to their horror, they stopped as the skies darkened. Silhouettes that they were familiar with cast shadows over them, and then came death. The Space Wolves Legion and Lehman Russ, brother and rival of Magnus, had come to take in the Crimson King and bring him to terror. But new orders had come from the War Master Horus. The new judgment. One word, extermination. Prospero began to burn, as an entire legion set ablaze to every home, city and town. The people and the Thousand Sons were caught completely by surprise, thinking that some Xenos threat had ambushed them, only to find to their horror it was their own. The Imperium was burning their home to the ground. Only Tizka remained, still shielded by its own defences. The Thousand Sons felt Magnus' voice in their head. He lamented to his sons, apologising for the doom he had brought upon them. He told them the truth, that he had bargained with this chaos 
to save them from the flesh change. He was desperate. There was no other way. When you love something, with every fragment of your soul, you will sacrifice anything to save it. But he had sipped from the poison chalice, and now their reckoning was upon them. The 15th Legion couldn't believe it. They loved their Primarch, their father, but this news cut to their core. But even then, his sons would not roll over and die. Why should they die for his mistakes? Ariman, Amon, Phosis Dakar, Hathor Mat, Kalophis, and Sobek would fight. The Athenaeans, Corvide, Pavoni, Pyre, and Raptora would fight. Prospero would resist. The walls of Fenris descended to the ground. The assault on Tizka would be done up close personal. The rambling hordes of the space wolves charged. The human guard were barely a delay, swallowed underneath thousands of Astartes. The men, women, and children of Prospero were not spared, struck down by the wrath of the Imperium. Now playing the part in the fate many human worlds within the Great Crusade had suffered, the thousand suns and space wolves clashed. Astartes versus Astartes, in a battle that was brutal, deafening and cruel. The Thousand Suns, most natives of Prospero returns the fury of the Space Wolves, unleashing their psychic abilities without restraint. Thousands began to fall as the line stagnated, the wolves being blasted and burned, having their minds popped and moves predicted. But this power cost them. Legionaries again fell to the power of change and growth as their bodies began to contort. The horrifying flesh change once again returned to the Legion en masse. From the ranks of the wolves, custodians and sisters of silence weaved in too, many of the 15th becoming the sorcerous monsters that they had been accused of long ago. From his tower, Magnus wept. His life's work, the city that had raised him, the people that had loved him, the legion that had learned from him, his legacy, the knowledge he had collected throughout the Great Crusade for humanity, it was all burning. Prospero was burning. He was wavering. He couldn't look. It was too much. He was the one at fault, not his sons, not his world, not the knowledge. The Emperor was going too far, surely. For hours Magnus watched, he fell psychically every death, every rampant fall to the flesh change in his sons, each one tearing out his heart, death upon death, hearing the cries of his sons to save them. Chaos wanted him to fight, for him to spill Imperium blood, but Magnus could bear it no more, his resolve to self-sacrifice wavering. In the last sanctuary in the heart of Tizka, with less than a thousand of them alive, the 15th Legion prepared for their final stand. And then they saw him, a being of blazing fire and light, donned in his golden warplate, with crimson skin and one sorrowful eye, Magnus joined the field. He gifted Ariman the Book of Magnus, a tome of his life's work, and left to face his brother, preparing to die for his sons. Magnus faced down the Wolf King, brothers, opposites, their differences so far apart it was impossible to reconcile. The reckoning promise an arc reached Secundus had come to pass, as the two Primarchs in the fires of burning Prospero tried to kill each other. Cold fire wrapped Russ as furious blows struck Magnus, both of their armors rent and in pieces as demigods clashed, both their sons watching on none daring to join. Magnus threw lightning and psychic assault at Russ, 
smashing it through his chest plate as Russ swung around and shattered the bones in Magnus's arm. Magnus and Russ were bloodied and their wounds were pouring, all watched motionless as the Wolf King lifted Magnus the Red above his head. And with a sickening crunch that stole the breath of the Thousand Sons, Russ broke the Crimson King's back upon his knee. A bellowing howl of triumph echoed in the pouring rain and fire as the broken Magnus's life began to fade away. Please, father, come back to us, he yelled, and suddenly the river was rushing up to meet him. It felt like crashing through a wall of ice. The frozen water hit him like a blow, paralyzing his limbs and locking him with a cold that shook froze his lungs. The currents spun around him, eager to toy with their new plaything. Grasping hands clutched him from below, dragging him down to join the dead. Amon looked up through the swirling chaos of bubbles and saw his father looking back at him, and then he saw nothing at all. He heard the soft whisper of the ocean's infinite spaces and limitless wonders. Amon half turned back towards the water, but his resolve held firm, and he resisted the call to swim forever in its depths. Instead, he pushed on, climbing steep ridges and unnaturally shaped contours. The ground crunched underfoot as he climbed towards what he hoped was the center of the island. Without the ocean's buoyancy, his body felt inaudibly heavy, far worse than when his subtle body returns to flesh. His body glove hung from a physique wasted by the many years he had spent following the secret footsteps of his lost father. Never in his life had he felt so weak. Amon stumbled and sank to his knees. The breath rattled in his chest as though filled with glassy fragments and his eyes stung with abrasive dust blown from the ground. He heard the crunch of footsteps across the coral surface and wearily lifted his head, squinting through eyes gummed with dust and stinging sweat. A tall man, swathed in a ragged cloth of dark feathers was coming towards him with faltering strides, using a Hager staff fashioned from driftwood for support. His hair was matted grey, pulled back over wrinkled skin to a long scalp lock that reached to the ground behind him. Tied across the center of his skull and obscuring his eyes was a filthy bandage, one side stained with ancient blood. Who approaches? Asked the blind man. Ariman, is that you? Amon shook his head, too horrified at what had become of the father he had loved to form a coherent reply. He licked his lips. No, it is Amon. Amon? said the blind man. Oh, my son, of course. You came. You finally came. His head sinking down over his chest and tears spilling down his cheeks as it dawned on him that his lonely quest was finally over. The blind man's hand reached down to touch his shoulder. My son, welcome to the orrery, said Magnus the Red. A floating sphere of warp flame illuminated the lee of an overhanging spur of coral upon Magnus's island. It required no fuel and cast a warming glow over Amon and his jean sire. They sat in silence, watching the dance of stars from a cliff high above the dark ocean. Within the water, it had seemed the stars were static, but from here, Amon now saw they moved in an intricate pattern that appeared random, but actually possessed an underlying motion as predictable as clockwork. He studied Magnus's face. He had not thought it possible, but his father had profoundly aged. The courage that had seen him do battle against Lehman Russ was still there, as was the wisdom in his hidden gaze. But the lines on his face were deep canyons, and his skin was a texture of yellowed vellum. Amon struggled to know what to say. 
He and his father had always enjoyed a close rapport, but the man before him felt like a stranger. Had so much time passed for Magnus that he had forgotten their friendship. Yet simply being in the presence of Magnus was invigorating, and the weariness that had plagued Ammon as he climbed from the water was diminishing with every passing moment. But such a renewal came at a price, and with his returning strength came all his old hurts. The grinding agony pulsing from the shattered ruin of his spine, spliced with innumerable grafts, bonded by Pavoni artifice, would always be with him. I am sorry, my son, said Magnus at last. For what? For the pain you suffer because of me said Magnus, staring far out to sea, and for leaving you in the great ocean as I did. That was not my intention, but I lost myself. I was distraught, and I had to begin the building of the orrery alone. Anger touched Ammon, an emotion he had never thought to feel towards his Primarch. Then why ask for my help? I did. Atop the Obsidian Tower, you promised me we would build the greatest library the galaxy had ever seen. You told me we would build it together. Magnus shook his head with a rueful sigh. I was boastful back then. Back then? How long have you been here? Magnus shrugged his raven-cloaked shoulders and sighed. Too long. How many years did you spend in search of me? I... I do not know. A great many, I think, said Amon, hearing evasion in Magnus's answer, and they lapsed into silence once more. So you found a place for the Orrery, said Amon, looking out to sea. I did, agreed Magnus, running a hand across his features and Amon saw just how deep the weariness in his father's soul ran. Seeing him so bowed made Amon want to weep. The moment I left you, I was not myself, said Magnus, his blindfolded gaze never leaving the cold flames. Much of me had been broken beyond repair, Amon. Too much has already been lost. In truth, I am not sure I can ever be the soul I once was. If I go back with you, I fear I will diminish with every breath. Amon's anger fled in the face of Magnus's vulnerability. How little he and his brothers understood of their father's burdens, and how much they had taken his immortal presence and unbending strength for granted. Magnus reached out a hand to the fire, staring into his pellicid depths. When I came back to myself, I was so very, very far from you, in time and space. I wanted to bring you to me, but I could hear the song of the world ocean calling to me in my mind. And when I found this planet, the place where I would build the orrery, and saw the scale of what lay before me, I knew I could only do it alone. Why alone? I could have helped. No. You would have been long dead by now. Amon kept silent. Magnus' words spoke of a time span where even a functionally immortal legionary would certainly perish. And you spent all the time since then building the orrery, filling its world ocean with memory? Among other things, said Magnus with a grin. Sometimes I would fly the great ocean to gain a better understanding of how the galaxy had moved on without me. Once I even dared Lorgar's ruin storm and bore a creaking ship of Vulcan's lost sons through its tempests. So what happens now? Magnus stood and his raven cloak parted to reveal his armor burnished bronze and boiled red leather. We go back to what remains of our great legion. We attempt to finish what I have started here with the time I have left. Amon stood and held out his hand. We will finish it together. 
We shall, said Magnus. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of the infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. Magnus was in pieces, his back, shards of bone, broken on the knee of Russ. The thousand suns fell to their knees, they felt hollow, their legion on the verge of despair. With his only mangled eye, Magnus looked to Ariman, his son, and he poured knowledge into him. Ariman understood exactly what he was trying to do. Prospero began to churn and warp. Reading from the book of Magnus, Ariman spoke the words without understanding them. The thousand suns and Magnus began to glow. The wounded near corpse of Magnus spoke to Russ, telling him, You are a sword in the wrong hands. You have severed an innocent neck. And then, they were gone. All of them, the thousand suns, had vanished. The feelings of a sickening vertigo pulsed through Magnus and the 15th Legion, as time and reality shifted over them and through them. They awoke to a place of black sand, boiling skies of strange colours and clouds. Jagged peaks soared all around them, with nine unnatural suns that illuminated this strange place. A consciousness awoke. It was Magnus. He found himself in a broken parody of his once home of Tizka, his now prison, a Primarch and a Legion in exile. In the warp, Logar Aurelian spoke to him, his brother, the Primarch of the Word Bearers, and now Servant of Chaos. Projecting his form to this ruined city of light, the two strode in the recreation of the Gallery of Pergamum, once home to millions of texts on Tizka, but it was now a broken, half-completed ruin, a shadow of its former self. Magnus had only managed to bring a portion of it with him, much like himself. The Crimson King spoke to his brother. They had once been close. Lorgar pleaded with him to join with Horus and the primordial truth, the gods of chaos, the ones who Magnus had always known about, even in his youth, the secret that he had kept, the forces that he had bargained with, the ones he knew were real. The Pantheon could help him. Their victory was inevitable. This war, this Horus heresy, that now spread death and destruction across the galaxy, would destroy the Emperor. Why cling to this pathetic existence when he could be a god in waiting? Magnus rejected him. The wolves had destroyed his home, but he would not serve Horus. He wouldn't serve anyone. Lorgar was banished. His glittering psychic projection snuffed from the ruins of the City of Light. A nearly exterminated legion gathered in the ruins of this new home, taking residence in the strange reflection of the towers that had once been theirs on true Prospero. All sorts of creatures and monsters of the warp began to inhabit the outskirts of this strange place. Assembling before their lord, the legion could see it. Magnus was not himself. Lehman Russ, the Wolf King had not just shattered his spine, but he had broken Magnus's soul. Shards, each a piece of one greater whole, had been spread across the galaxy in time. Azek Ariman and Amon met with their lord in the ruins of his tower. It was a mix of emotions to see him. Prospero had fallen because of his mistakes. He had let so many of them die, but it was him who had made the pact over two centuries ago to save them from the flesh change. 
he went out to battle Russ, knowing it was his death, and he did it for them. Ariman looked at this incorporeal shard of Magnus and felt sorrow. Behind him were duplicates, psychic scribes, writing down every scrap of knowledge he had left in his disjointed memory. It was his last gift to humanity, to restore what he could of Tiska's great libraries, something for the generations to come to use to push humanity towards their great future. The loss of Prospero, not just to Magnus, but to humanity was monumental. The guilt at that, and yet also the anger at the sight of the wolves burning it, would not fade. But worst of all, this shard, all of them, were dying. Magnus was dying. The Thousand Sons, Ariman, Amon, Hathor Matt, and the others could see their lord had resigned himself to death. And with the now return of the flesh change emerging in their ranks, they had to do something. Magnus was broken. He knew it. He had given up. But they had not. Not yet. Assembling the ranks of the Legion, they gathered in the plains of this strange world, bearing witness to the ghostly echoes of the burning of Prospero, witnessing again the truly visceral mortal blow by the Wolf King on an apparition of Magnus, witnessing the shattering of his soul into shards, and divining the locations of them across space and time. The Thousand Suns scattered, they would rebuild their Primarch, their home, and legion, even if the rest of the galaxy was burning. Inside the City of Light, the Shard of Magnus, the legion knew of, met with his friend Amon. Amon trying to convince his lord not to give up. The devotion of his friend, the effort of his sons across the galaxy warmed Magnus' heart. Amon was right. They had been here for months, years. Time was not a certain thing on this world. They, liking Magnus's child, had once again lifted themselves into the warp. They spoke of rebuilding. Together they would make an orrery of all of Prospero's knowledge and remake the Legion. They swam the great ocean, free from physical restraint and limit. It felt good. The Shard of Magnus for the first time since Prospero's burning felt alive again, with purpose. Amon felt tears of joy to see his Primarch so invigorated, until the words slipped out. Uthazar, is that you? Confusion rippled in Magnus's aura. Magnus felt anger ripple within him. He didn't understand his surroundings. He was confused. Amon tried to answer his questions, but each answer only hurt him more. He demanded that they return to Prospero. Sorrow fell over Amon. More than Magnus's soul had been shattered, his mind had been too. Confusion, panic, and grief spilled from this shard of the once great Crimson King. He fled from his loyal son, further into the darkest corners of the war. Months, years, Amon did not know. The equerry of Magnus traversed further into the depths of the warp, seeing untold horrors and wonders. The trail brought him glimpses of his lord. Each time it was only a pitiful creature that screamed and lamented on his arrogance of how he had killed his own sons. Finally, across a river of souls, Amon waded through, finding a hunched, blind figure upon the other side. Magnus, the Shard of Magnus. Time seemed to have diminished all of his features. Time in this place changed with almost every step. Untold millennia had passed for his lord. Amon couldn't even fathom how long. What had this Magnus seen and done? Gone was the prideful, curious, ambitious nature Amon had always known. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all of its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance, 
in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The mind of Magnus, powerful, infinitely complex, and truly beyond a mortal man's perceptions. His mind could correlate all of its contents. It could not retreat to the safety of ignorance. He couldn't forget, unlearn, or be at peace, be free from guilt or shame. Amon realized now how little he truly understood of his lord. Perhaps feeling pity for the prison that really was Magnus's mind. It was heartbreaking to see the Crimson King, Magnus the Red, the man who had fought so hard for the future of humanity, so broken. It washed away all the resentment Ammon had carried for Nikea and Prospero. Wisdom, the one piece missing for every decision he had ever made. The demons, Pact, Nikea, the breaking of Terra's wards, the burning of Prospero. All consequences of a man with power, but no wisdom to temper it. The time had given it to him now. The ultimate perspective. The Shard told Amon he was not sure he could be the Magnus he had once been, but he finally agreed to return with Amon. Scattered across space and time, more and more of the Shards of Magnus were found. Below the ruins of true Prospero, a brother, Jagatai Khan spoke with a splinter of his brother's soul. Ariman and his Cabal, who traversed time, all the way to Terra during the early Great Crusade, found a shard inside the ruins of Old Earth. A perilous journey made in packs with creatures and demons. Upon the peak of Agru, the place Magnus had sealed during the Great Crusade, a shard battled a force of the walls of Fenris. Inside the ashes of an urn, saved from Prospero's destruction, lay hidden a piece of that greater whole. Upon Terra, right inside the Imperial Dungeon, Malkador the Sigilite found another broken shard of the Crimson King. The warrior, diplomat, the vengeful, the sorcerer, the curious. Not just his body and soul were broken. The very aspects of Magnus himself had been scattered, personified into singular characteristics that had made the man. For years, with the Horus heresy raging on, Magnus and the Thousand Sons were in exile, not truly taking a side. But that time was coming to an end. They could feel it. Unity was coming to the fragments. A time where they would soon be whole. With multiple shards in the Legion's hands, they headed to the location of their next piece. A world that was a scar in the mind of Magnus and the heart of the Thousand Sons, Nikea. Nikea, the world that bore the Legion's greatest shame, the place where Magnus had failed to save the use of psychic powers through the Librarius, all because the truth had been revealed. That oh prideful Magnus, had ventured into places he was warned not to explore. And if a Primarch could break the Emperor's trust, how could others be allowed the chance? With a shard of Magnus with Ammon upon the planet of Sorceress, one within Ariman himself, collected from terror, the Chief Librarian and his Cabal journey to find another within the glittering caves and Colosseum of Nikea. But they were not alone. The Imperium had gotten there first. A force of Malkador's Knights Errant and a squad of Space Wolves had come to contest the Thousand Sons, fearing what a reborn Crimson King would become and which side he would choose. As the Horus Heresy burned the galaxy, Ariman felt the power of this place, the shard within him resonating. Ariman was desperate to release the shard from within. The moments of their joining had been overwhelming. To see the world as his Primarch did, the flood of information and detail, the kaleidoscope of color and noise, 
No wonder Magnus was seen as a demigod. Across the plateau, the place where Magnus had once delivered his speech of enlightenment, the two forces met, the chasm between them unreconcilable. Magnus and the Thousand Sons, renegades in the middle of the Horus heresy, they had sipped from the poisoned chalice, dabbled in sorcery, but yet had not sided with Horus and the primordial annihilator. The agent of the Knights Errant and the Space Wolf Squad squared up against them, having brought their own bound shards of Magnus to battle the Thousand Sons. The conflict broke out, as once again Space Wolves battled Thousand Sons, like music rhyming with the destruction of Los Prospero. Blood and bone crashed upon the basalt floor of the volcanic Colosseum, until the bound shard of Magnus the Imperials had brought was freed. The possessed human lifted into the air, the power of a Primarch and his turbulent natures fighting within him. The arena began to warp and change. Spikes of rock and crystal jutted from the ground and exploded around them, forming a dark mirror version of the architecture on Prospero. The veil had been breached and the influence of the warp began to flow around them. A kaleidoscope of color and power weaved around the dark crystal labyrinth. Demons from the warp haunted and whispered in the reflections and shadows. Towards the center, again the two forces clashed, finding a towering projection of Magnus the Red, the shard of Nikea, his very essence being devoured by the warp and demons at his feet. Was he letting himself die willingly? Ariman did not know. Sacrificing one of his brothers, Hathor Matt, an act that disgusted his fellow Thousand Sons. They broke through towards the central chamber. Past the demons, Ariman lifted up to face his lord, but was confronted by the possessed human Magnus, blocking him from the Nikean shard. Venom and bile were spat from this possessed Magnus. It was the worst of the Primarch, his pride, arrogance and cruelty in one being. The shard within Ariman rose up to fight, fully possessing Azak Ariman. Two beings, both Magnus the Red, and yet both not. Each aspect of his soul, his personality, warrior, scholar, loyalist, traitor, it all clashed together. In a torrent of psychic storm and fire, the Magnus possessed Ariman got the upper hand and dragged the shards of his soul out of the possessed human. More whole than he had been in years, this Magnus the Red felt a clarity of sight and purpose that he had been missing, and bonded with the Nikean shard. Transported back to the planet of sorcerers, leaving the wolves behind, Ariman brought the shards back to Ammon, upon a throne, with what was left of the body of the old Magnus. The shards began to flow back into their vessel. Once corpse-like skin began to return to crimson bronze, muscles swelled with growth, golden armor washed away rust and gleamed brilliant and awe-inspiring. A scarlet mane of hair returned as one glittering eye opened once again. Magnus the Red was reborn. The Thousand Sons staggered, the sight of their Lord reborn, a gift amongst all they had lost. They loved him, their teacher, savior, and father, and yet a part of them hated him, the architect of their downfall, the destruction of their home, but they wouldn't lose any more. With the Crimson King restored, they would be reborn. With a clarity like a fresh breath, Magnus looked upon the sons that had saved him. He loved them. He had seen everything they had sacrificed for him and knew he could never repay it. Not truly. Crowned in fire, he declared to them all that he would fight for them. Not the Emperor, not Horus that they would break into the Imperial Palace and claim the soul shard that lay upon terror. 
and then they would rebuild and create the future of enlightenment. The Thousand Sons screamed until their throats were raw, for their lord, their Primarch, their Crimson King. Unleashing their moorings from the planet of sorcerers, Magnus and the surviving Thousand Sons plunged their way towards the throne room. The galaxy was a very different place the last time the Legion had lived in the physical realm. It burned with the scars of years of Horus's betrayal. Many times had Logar attempted to bring Magnus to the gods of chaos, but he arrived not as a servant, but still his arms were welcomed by the War Master. Horus, the true architect of the burning of Prospero. But what could Magnus do against him now? He was a monster, elevated to a near equal of the Emperor's power, truly corrupted by the gods of the realm of madness. None of his brothers were the same. Fulgrim, Angron, Horus, Mortarion, and even Perturabo, the Lord of Iron. The one who had once cradled him upon his near death on Morningstar was nothing but a cold, unfeeling husk of his former self. But yet neither was he the same. Prospero had broken him. The shards of his soul had seen and done things beyond imagination. Even now, partially put back together, he was not whole. He was so far from the hopeful, but yet prideful Magnus of the Great Crusade. Mortarian, one who had spoken so vehemently against the use of psychic powers at Nikea, was a hulking beast of pus and weeping sores. Magnus comforted his brother, alleviating the pain of his new form, speaking honeyed words, but in truth judging, only here for the prize that lay behind the walls of terror, a shard of his soul the only thing in this universe that would make him complete. The Siege of Terror had begun, the traitors and loyalist forces clashing in a conflict so violent and hateful it would scar the species forever. Weeks, months of brutal siege warfare until Magnus finally spotted a weakness in the walls. Keeping the information to themselves, the Legion and Magnus attacked now invaders on the world that had created them. Fire and smoke rained all around them as they punched into Terra's innermost defenses. But it was a diversion. Under the cover of the battle, Magnus, Ariman, Amon, Artahasis, and Menkura traveled deeper into the palace, psychically disguised as the sons of Sanguinius. Through the streets of the Imperial capital, they saw the true cost of the war. The ordinary men, women, and children that cowered from the monsters outside the walls. Like on the world of Morningstar, Magnus felt the thoughts and feelings of the people around him. Their fear, their desperation, their hopes, their cries for the Emperor to save them and their families. He saw in this empire of the Imperial truth, people praying. The realization of mortality brings out the best and the worst in humanity. But it felt good, in a way, to feel human emotion like this, Magnus thought. He wondered if he may have run into the brother he respected, Sanguinius, or the brother he loved, Jagatai Khan. Further they traveled, Magnus feeling the essence of himself close by. The hidden entrance to the Hall of Leng was found, but refugees of this war had huddled all around him in this backwater alley. But before Magnus could unlock the entrance, the dome above him exploded in fire and ordnance. As the rubble came tumbling down towards them, Magnus made his choice. He dropped his disguise. Psychic might blazed from his hands, lifting the fallen rubble. The refugees huddled below the enormous figure as the Crimson King shielded them from death. He saved them. Time was his enemy, but he chose to save them. He couldn't let them die. It was instinct. Maybe he was not what he once was, 
but he was still human. Inside of him was the Magnus who had earned the title of the Crimson King, the man who had shielded the people on Morningstar from the falling ship. With the people safe, Magnus took his first steps into the Hall of Leng, the ancient tunnels that ran into the depths of the Imperial Palace. Created by a mad people in a forgotten age, for miles him and his sons trudged, until they saw two figures, one robed, hunched man that Magnus recognised instantly. Welcome home, Magnus, said Malkador the Sigilite. Only time will tell what is a mistake, and what is not. But an inability to believe you can ever make a mistake is dangerous. It leaves a mind open to certainty, and unwavering certainty is our greatest enemy. Always question, and always be open to different ways of thinking. Other ways of untangling the knot. Magnus expected to see hate in his brother's eyes. But he only saw great sadness. In times of old, he might have embraced his brother in a clatter of war plate, made some aloof comment on his dull pragmatism, or counseled him to lift his gaze from the forge fire once in a while. But these were not times of old. They were new days of war and death. What could he say to a brother who thought him a monster? I have a memory. He began, his voice as cracked and broken as his soul. A faded scrap of a memory, but a memory nonetheless. I stood vigil over your body with one of your sons. I do not know his name, but he held fast to his belief that you would walk among us again. I saw a white flame eternal. A mountain of black smoke and world-ending fire. I did not know what it meant at the time. That sun was Artellus Numion, said Vulcan. It is only thanks to his courage and faith that I live again. And it was thanks to you he was able to bring me home to Nocturne. I don't remember that. Not fully. But I saw your corpse, cold and lifeless. How is it that you are alive? In truth, I do not know. The ancient fire priests of Nocturne would say that the Urdrigs who dwell in the world of my birth brought me back. They would say the great Dregs breathed the unbound flame into my soul and ignited the fire in my heart once more. Magnus smiled at Vulcan's words and cast his gaze around the vast cavern. I admire the poetic turn of phrase, but this is the world of your birth. Of all our births. Our father crafted the iron of my soul and the stone of my flesh here, but it was Nocturne that made me. Just as Prospero made you. Vulcan took a step closer, and Magnus tensed, but his brother's intent was not violence. The Imperium is sundered by the flames of war and nothing ever returns from the fire unchanged. No matter the outcome of the fighting above, the Imperium will never be the same again. Magnus nodded. I am no master of hearth and forge like you, brother, but the fire strengthens some things, does it not? In the hands of a skilled smiter, I, it can. Agreed, Vulcan. But the fires burning all across Terra are those of a blind apprentice. Nothing good will come of it. Warming to his theme, Magnus said, The transformative nature of fire, though clearly destructive, is often a necessary precursor to change. Perhaps, in the grand scheme of things, that will be a good thing. The enemy of progress is stasis, and all things have in their nature a tendency towards complexity. That tendency has carried the universe from almost perfect simplicity to the level of magnificence we see all around us. Always the teacher, said Vulcan with a wry smile. It was a rare enough thing 
that Magnus felt the rest of his metaphysical argument dissipate entirely. But as pleasant as it was to stand face to face with his brother, Magnus knew he was an unwelcome visitor in his father's great sanctum. He was diminished, but Vulcan, for all that he had apparently died, seemed mightier than ever. Do you intend to stop me? That depends, brother. Do you still intend to cast that spear of yours? Magnus looked down at the spear and his form twisted, transforming from a weapon of war to the crook-top staff of a master of Prospero's fellowships. I... I don't know anymore. When I followed Revelation, I was singular in my purpose, but now... I have wandered far, but I am more lost than ever before. You are not lost, my son. You are exactly where you need to be. Magnus looked into his father's eyes as they opened in golden fire. Tizka. Magnus drew in a breath as he beheld the City of Light in all its glory. Flashes of sunlight glittered like noonday stars from the polished glass of the Great Pyramids. The sky was the perfect shade of cornflower blue, and the scent of the recent summer rain was like honeydew. Clouds ran in thin lines of purple over the mountainous horizon. Tears came to him, and he let them flow for the loss of his homeworld. It was so beautiful, he said, sensing an unmistakable presence behind him. It was. I remember the day I first set foot on Prospero. You had made a paradise here, my son. The only paradise is a paradise lost. It exists now only in my memory, for the reality of what has become of Tizka is too painful. His father nodded. A wise man once said that as memory may be a paradise from which we cannot be driven, it may also be a hell from which we cannot escape. Magnus turns to his father, seeing him clad all in gold his armor too brilliant to look upon. At first glance, it could be mistaken for something ceremonial, its every plate engraved, an S with baroque carvings, studded with polished gemstones, and its every fluted edge worked with the most intricate of details. But upon closer inspection, it was clear this armor had seen fierce battle, bore the impact of many weapons, and was stained with the blood of countless foes. He shone with an inner light that Magnus well remembered from that first meeting, when they had embraced beneath the fire of the Pyrie Fellowship Pyramid. I came to kill you. I know. Is that still your intent? I no longer understand what my intent is. The variables at play in the galaxy defy any of the formulae I might divine. Even the Order of Ruin would fail to see a path in this dark forest. Then allow me to show you a possible path, said the Emperor. His father set off along one of the side streets, running towards the Ocularium Square. They passed an ornamental garden of psychically sculpted topiary, in which scholars led discussion groups. Couples read together in comfortable silence, and laughing children passed a ball between them, using only the power of their minds. The people of Tizga walked around them, as clean-limbed and beautiful as he remembered them, robed in many colors, with great minds and inquisitive natures. It was almost too much to bear. Why did you bring me here? I did not. You did. That's not what I meant. Why did you bring me here to stand before you? If Malkador wasn't lying, then you wanted me here, right now, in front of you. His father nodded. Malkador spoke true. It was the last thing he did. Magnus hung his head in shame. I did not mean to kill him. I know, but his death was a sacrifice he knew he might be asked to make. He knew that and accepted it. Another death in a grand procession of them, painful in its own way, 
For he and I have shared a journey longer than most men or gods can dare reckon. Yet, in the macro of what our species faces, his death is irrelevant. I always forget how cold you can be. It is not coldness. It is reality. What might be gained by his sacrifice will be a far greater worth than a single life. A thousand lives would still be a price worth paying for what you and I might achieve. You and I? And the promise of that word was the first light of dawn. I don't understand. I wanted you here before me, so there would be no mistakes, no misunderstandings, and no way for the ruinous powers set against me to twist my words or intent. I wanted you here before me, so you could look me in the eye and understand the truth of what I offer. Magnus's breath was caught in his throat. His father turned to face him, and Magnus met his terrible gaze, feeling the inhuman power that lay at his heart. It was power that could strip a man down to atoms in a heartbeat and breathe him anew with an exhalation. That power had endured uncounted millennia, growing with every passing century and holding its edge for the age in which it was needed. And what is it you offer? The chance to stand at my side once again. Forgiveness. He killed him. Malkador, the Sigilite, right hand of the Emperor, and Magnus's once tutor. In the Hall of Leng, the Sigilite met with Magnus and his sons. No custodians, no sisters of battle, no hostility. They barbed and jousted with their words. Had Magnus just come for the soul shards, or perhaps in his heart, vengeance for Prospero? Would that be unjustified? He had tried to save Horus, tried to warn the Emperor and save the Imperium, only for his world to be burned. The wealth and knowledge of Tizka that he had spent lifetimes building destroyed. So much lost forever. Horus was the architect. Malkador spat back. Blood was on his hands, but the image of the wolves destroying everything he loved. They were the Emperor's executioners. What did they think would happen when they sent them? He didn't deserve it. He had done nothing wrong. Malkador told him he was right to feel sorrow for all he had suffered, but he was not faultless. His actions had broken the psychic wards in the webway below terror, his folly. But this path he walked was not too far trodden to return from. Looking around him, Magnus saw twenty temples, sized the proportion of Primarchs. It would have been their homes, for a life lived on terror, a place for a father and his sons. The shard of himself had been here, he could feel it, the touch of distant memory caressing his mind. He is the best part of me, the shard of his nobility, the part that had cried for humanity on Morningstar long ago. But he was wrong, Malkador told him that the shard was just a part of him, of all of the shards that had formed this complete being before him. They were not aspects, not divided personalities, just pieces, just him. Magnus gripped Malkador by the throat, his blood roared with rage. No, it could not be, he felt its goodness, its purity. Magnus needed him. Without him, he was no better than a beast. He was no better than he was now. A creature of pride, hate, and rage. He would not be like his fallen brothers. He could be whole. He is gone, Malkador rasped out, beyond even your reach. The Crimson King howled in rage as Malkador burned alive in his grip. 
Nothing but a charred skeleton remained. No, it could not be. All he had done, the blood and death, the mistakes. He had justified them, allaying the guilt at the feet of the separate parts of himself, the shards. Only time will tell what is a mistake and what is not, but an inability to believe you can ever make a mistake is dangerous. It leaves a mind open to certainty, and unwavering certainty is our greatest enemy. He was Magnus the Red, Crimson King, Primarch of the Fifteenth. He has studied more, seen more, and endured more than any. How could those mistakes be his fault? He should be beyond them. Staring out of his chambers, to witness the burning of Prospero, feeling immense guilt for failure almost broke him. He would not return to that. His mind couldn't shatter the idea of who he was. It would break him. Anger washed over Magnus. He was angry at himself, Horus, and the Emperor. His soul shard was lost, but they would not retreat when so deep inside the Imperial Palace. They would cut off the head. They would kill the Emperor. Through the innermost sanctums, Magnus and his sons raced, nothing but vengeance on his mind. A clouding red mist that needed to be sated, needed to be justified. Closer, Magnus delved, until in a room of antiques of old earth, a psychic apparition of the Emperor appeared. Revelation. Magnus was welcomed through, directly into the throne room. He was on guard, standoffish, but then he saw it. He saw him, locked upon a titanic throne of gold and silver, a figure clad in brilliant oramite armor. Amber light glowed from him, swirling around the archaic device he sat upon. With his sons holding ground below, Magnus made his long approach up the enormous staircase towards his father. A procession of resentment, bitterness, and anger swelling within each step he took. He looked upon his father's face, strained and locked within concentration. It had been decades since they had been this close since they had bathed in the power of each other's presence. Magnus thought of Prospero, of his decimated home and legion, the outlawing of psychic powers at Nikea, the father who shared nothing of his plans and schemes, an ignorance whose very consequences had made him suffer so greatly. He raised his arm, forming a harpoon-like spear of power. His hands trembled. He hated him. And yet, he loved him. The man who he had admired the most. The man he had always hoped would be proud of him. The man who would cause him so much pain. I loved you like no other, he whispered. He hesitated. Tears stung his eye. Why had it come to this? Behind the throne, an enormous figure leapt forward, landing in front of the Emperor. A man that matched the size of Magnus, donned in green battle plate, Vulcan. Time moved at a fractional pace, as the three demigod beings stood atop the golden throne. It was as if the galaxy spun around this very moment. At the stairs, a force of space wolves and salamanders engaged with Ariman, Amon, and the other thousand sons. But the three paid no heed to the battle below. Brother, the word hit like a gut punch. Magnus and Vulcan both understood together just how much that word had changed, how much it hurt and warmed them too. It was not hate that Magnus saw in Vulcan's ember red eyes, but sorrow. The brother who had always looked to the sky and the brother whose gaze was always locked upon the earth. It felt good to converse with a brother again, 
Vulcan word pulling at the humanity that still resided within Magnus. He was confused. What did he want? He had been blinded by hurt and anger for so long that he hadn't truly thought of what the future looked like, what he wanted to rebuild. What did that vision entail, truly? Finally, those golden eyes opened as his father, the Emperor of Mankind, finally spoke directly to his son. Free from the influence of chaos that had been manipulating Magnus for years. They connected psychically, a vision of Prospero coalesced into view. Its very sight a knot on Magnus's heart. Oh, how he missed his world. Lamenting of the magnitude of what was lost as it had burned. Magnus realized now that he had been allowed inside the Imperial Palace allowed into the golden throne room. Even the death of Malkador was in sacrifice to it, so the Emperor could offer him forgiveness. The Emperor showed him a future, one with Horus at their side, as the Great Crusade reached the edge of the galaxy, a future that never came to pass, and the truth about the vision of Magnus upon the golden throne, how it was no prison, but a manipulation of the demon on Prospero. It was a future of enlightenment, where humanity was victorious, and once again, we returned to a golden era. Magnus wanted it. The redemption, the forgiveness, the absolvement of his sins. But something gnawed at him. There's a price, isn't there? Wisdom. Magnus had finally learnt that such offers do not come free, and the price would be a new legion of warriors greater than any living now, a legion for him to replace the old. The Thousand Sons had to be annihilated, the flesh change, they had been tainted by the warp and could not exist in the new era. How? How could I fight at your side, knowing I had condemned my sons to death? I would look upon these new warriors, and see in them the faces of my betrayed legion. What kind of father would I be, if I were to forsake them? How could you ask this of me? Magnus was furious. His sons. They had suffered Nikea. They had suffered Prospero. And when his body and soul were broken, they had put him back together. How could he forsake them? They couldn't be saved, according to whom? He could save them. He knew it. Why couldn't he try? Anger and grief annihilated the hope Magnus had just felt. He asked Vulcan, would he sacrifice his sons? The words of Magnus echoed once again, when you love something with every fragment of your soul, you will sacrifice anything to save it. Liars, all of them. Magnus spat as his jaw clenched with hate. You promise forgiveness, then make it acceptance impossible. Magnus raised his spear as Vulcan brought up his hammer, and once again in this universe of cruelty, and heresy, brother, fought brother. Without the light of chaos, the universe would stagnate and collapse. Only through this struggle can any advancement occur. The minds of gods are not for mortals to know or to judge, except that Zinch has a place for all of us in his grand scheme, and be happy in the part you have to play. This is what I would have you understand, brother. The Imperium is the lie we tell ourselves, to make sense of a reality we fear to face. We tell each other that it is necessary, that we do what must be done, that whatever might replace it would be worse. But look at all that we do not say. 
Father is a tyrant, and you out of all of us should have seen that first. The Imperium is built on the lies of a would-be god and the violence of his crusade. What benevolent monarch instigates a crusade? Under the Emperor, we have perpetuated a holy war that has sucked worlds dry of resources and cost billions upon billions of lives. We have spent life like meaningless currency, all because one man said we must. How many cultures have we annihilated, Vulcan? How many have we assimilated and robbed of their vitality, replacing innovation with conformity? How much knowledge have we destroyed because Father decided no one was allowed to learn it? This is how it got to you, isn't it? Vulcan knew the answer, even as he asked the question. The creature that gouged its way inside your soul and laid its eggs there. The thing that pulls on your strings. Did it promise you knowledge? Did it paint the Emperor as the death of enlightenment? Magnus's expression answered for him. Long red hair fell to frame his face, and the sorcerer brushed it back from his cheeks. The Imperial Truth is a lie. The empire we built cannot be reformed, only overthrown. From violence it was born, and in violence it must end. Don't you see? Once the board is swept clean, we can start again, with our eyes open, aware of the truths of the universe. You make this sound like a principled stand. As if all you have done, all Horus has done, could ever be justified. Magnus turns to him sharply. I? What do I have to justify? Each time I was attacked, I defended myself. Each time they tried to silence me, I made sure to speak out. The Imperium lavished punishments upon my legion, draping its hypocrisy over us as a funeral shroud. We fought back. Falcon met Magnus's gaze, seeing the ironclad surety there. This was futile. He knew it. Yet the words came forth anyway. Look at the horrors your side has unleashed upon Terra. The massacres. The mutations. Magnus, you are taking part in the extinction of your species. You cannot truly think you have done nothing wrong. Even you, brother. Even you in your arrogance cannot believe this is justified. Necessity justifies all. And this is necessary. Without this primeval force, without this chaos, there will be stagnation. Ignorance instead of illumination. Existence instead of life. I did not write the laws of our universe, brother. I take no joy in the truth of reality, but I won't hide from it. Vulcan looked at him as if he spoke in another tongue. Necessary, you say? Magnus nodded, and Vulcan continued. Necessary according to whom? The alien god that exalted you and now demands you commit genocide? Magnus clenched his teeth, and the world turned. But not far. It turned to reveal Tizka, City of Light, metropolis of white pyramids and silver spires. The city was aflame beneath them burning from the reigning hellfire for an imperial fleet. The golden vessel of the Empress Chosen, sleek black hunting ships of the Sisters of Silence, the many, many warships in the storm cloud grey of the Space Wolves. The raising of Prospero. There was murder in Magnus's eye, murder and sorrow. Bear witness to our brother Russ, bringing death to my homeworld and all its people. Tell me, Vulcan, would you have reacted with temperance to this, had it been the destruction of Nocturne? Vulcan didn't need to stare at the orbital bombardment. He'd read the reports, seen the pics, and the footage, and spoken to many of the custodians that took part in the ground assault. Nothing unfolding here was a revelation. 
he wished to experience twice. Russ was lied to by Horus, deceived into attacking. I know. It changes nothing. But it should. You, who value truth so highly, willingly align yourself with the one that engineered Prospero's death. And when the Space Wolves fleet arrived in your sky, what did you do, Magnus? Did you try to enlighten Russ? Did you use your power to prevent the assault? Or did your belief in your own persecution leave you assuming the worst of the Emperor's intentions? All witness accounts say you languished in your tower, welcoming the destruction as your penance. Until you decided to fight in the final hours when it was far too late to stop the massacre. Vulcan gestured to the destruction raining from the upper atmosphere. Lance strikes, drop pods, the slower trails of gunships making their descent. Why would the Emperor order you and your entire legion dead? Did you not stop to wonder at the scale of this misunderstanding? Magnus laughed at the question, the sound wet and bitter. He gestured away from the burning city, and the world turned, falling away. They were in the webway again, but no longer upon the lost bridge. They drifted through the oval tunnels, following the ankles that hurt the human eye. Always ahead of them, an avatar of fire blazed through the tunnels, shattering the wraith-bone membranes without heed blind and deaf to the horde of demons surging in the webway in its wake. I did this. I thought he wished to punish me, for ruining his great work. For a moment, Magnus paused, gazing at the host of Neverborn, darkening the tunnels, as if seeing them for the first time. But how was I to know? He refused to tell me of his grand plan. If he had told me, Vulcan resisted the urge to spit at the sudden foul taste on his tongue. Again, you see the worst in all others, absolving yourself of blame. Why did you need to know of the great work? You were warned not to toy with the warp. We all were. But you couldn't resist. You believed that you knew more. That you knew best. And why is it that you alone lament being kept unapprised of father's plans? Why is Sanguinius not enraged that he never knew of the Webway project? Why am I not enraged that I was kept ignorant of it? Why did you need to know? Magnus's eye gleaned the reflection of the burning icon ahead. His former self, years before, racing to warn the Emperor of Horus's betrayal reducing the webway to unsanctified rubble with his passing. Had I known the truth, I would never have done what I did. Father should have told me. Vulcan laughed, unable to believe what he was hearing. How could Father have predicted you would defy his one command? Not only did you use the warp against his orders, you fueled your psychic warning with human sacrifice. How could any of us have known you were capable of such barbarity? Magnus exhaled, slowly, his hands clutching the folds of his toga. He spoke a word of power, and the world turned. They were in the throne room. The blazing avatar had incarnated before the scientists and techno-magicians of the Emperor's secret work. It had forced the webway portal open, making it radiate wounded light. It grew dark with the silhouettes of demons as they drew near. The custodians present, precious few of them, for how could they have anticipated the sudden death of the Emperor's dream? They opened fire on the image of ghostly flame. It ignored their paltry defiance, and it ignored the explosions its arrival had birthed across the great laboratory. It hovered before the Emperor, like some spectre of religious revelation from the ancient tomes, when such things were believed by credulous men. I had to warn him, said Magnus, watching the scene. No, you believed you had to warn him. You believed as you always believe, that you knew best, that you had to act, that you alone knew what had to be done, and never once did you think 
through all this destruction that there was something deceiving you. The sorcerer glared at him. Why do you speak to me as if I were a lowly pawn in this game of regicide? The War Master and the Emperor both know I am the most valuable piece on the board. Vulcan was unmoved by the sorcerer's words and by the cataclysm playing out before him. His tone was patient, as it had been in the days before the war. Vanity is what leads you, Magnus. You choke on arrogance, unable to see you are the architect of your own downfall. All the others, all of Horus' broken monsters, at least they can see the bars of their cages. Even Horus, driven out of his mind to serve as a hive for the Pantheon, knows in his soul's core that he has lost control. You are the only one that still believes he is free. Magnus's body was shattered. Nearly every bone was broken, as his once friend and brother Vulcan was on the verge of beating him to death. The two Primarchs jeweled like champions of a gladiatorial pit in front of their father, each of them broken and bloodied as two demigods smashed and stabbed at each other with a speed beyond human perception. Magnus screamed that if I must be damned with my sons, I will be full damned. A battle cry of hate as Vulcan eventually pummeled and hacked Magnus down until he was nothing but a bloody pile that barely resembled the human form. Vulcan, with pain in his voice, lamented for his brother's choice. It didn't have to be this way. He could have stood at their side again. He could have been his brother again. The price was too high. Even if they were damned and corrupted, even one was too many. As Magnus lay dying at the feet of Vulcan and his father, his heart full of hate at the man who had given him no true choice at all, he cursed him. Again, since Nikea, Prospero, and now Terra, all he had done was defend himself, a victim of others' choices, an emperor who chose not to share his secrets, a brother who architected Prospero's burning, and another brother who enacted that violence without question. And now a redemption they knew was impossible to take. But something did have a choice for him. A voice crept into the mind of dying Magnus, an offer he had heard many times before. Ascension, enlightenment, a future without restriction like Nikea, a future where the only good is knowledge and the only evil is ignorance, and he could have what the Emperor kept from him, the knowledge of the warp that he so selfishly kept to himself, immortality and power, and a future where his sons could live under the warm embrace of Zinch. Without the light of chaos, the universe would stagnate and collapse. Only through this struggle can any advancement occur. The Emperor wanted stasis, stagnation, and the death of knowledge. He was the enemy of enlightenment. Magnus finally made a choice. His head tilted back as eldritch sapphire light burst from him. Blue and pink fire washed over him as Magnus felt his limbs re-knit. Magnus lifted into the air as time and space warped around him. And with a sickening smile, Magnus looked one last time upon the throne room as he ascended into the wall. An apotheosis had washed over Magnus. He felt his body transform. He began to enlarge. He grew hoofed feet, jutting horns, and psychedelic avian wings sprouted from his back. The very power of change rippled through him, 
as warp energy flowed through every fiber and cell. One baleful eye opened that saw into spectrums of light, lay lines of time and formulae he could only dream of before. His mind was different. No, more. It was intoxicating, the power and knowledge at his fingertips. It would all be his. Vengeance, knowledge, power. It all belonged to the greatest being in the universe. Him. If this is my fate, then I regret nothing. Better to have bathed in the light than cower in darkness. Better to have flown too close to the sun than never feel its heat. No more boundaries. No more a pawn in others' games. The universe and time was his to do with as he wished. And what he desired more than anything now was the fall of the Emperor. Inside the webway, the demon Primarch returned. Where once had been the place of his folly, it would now be his greatest triumph. Inside the ruins of an ancient Eldari city, Magnus began to throw a psychic assault upon the Emperor's own psychic barriers. A pressure that weakened the master of mankind as the siege of terror raged on. A challenge that had to be answered. Inside a strange Xenos tower, Magnus saw his brother. The Lord of Drakes, Vulcan, approached. To the loyal son of the Emperor, he saw a face that was a mask of condescending horror, smug with a mass knowledge, cyclopic, fanged, bestial, all nobility gone, leaving an animalistic superiority in its place. Magnus taunted his brother. He read every thought, every tang of pity in Vulcan's mind. But it was Magnus who felt true pity. Oh, how ignorant and blind Vulcan was. How it was a waste to explain fate, destiny, and agency to a being that could not grasp its true intricacies like he had. The clash began, Magnus roaring with laughter as Vulcan tried to match him. Magnus towered over his pathetic brother as psychic fire met Great Hammer in this ancient city of ruins. Magnus connected with Vulcan's mind one last time, showing him the hypocrisy of the Emperor, the man who had enacted a crusade that had wiped billions from the universe in order to create his Imperium of Stagnation, that every action he had taken, he was punished for. Nikea, Prospero, his folly were all because the Emperor had hoarded knowledge from him. It was not his fault. Even now his actions were necessary. Necessary according to whom? Magnus had delved too far into the warp because he had to know. He had been warned not to. But he knew better. Oh, the great knowledgeable Magnus didn't think that he could be manipulated that his judgment surpassed the Emperor, that he could outwit the gods of chaos. He alone was responsible for saving the Imperium and warning the Emperor with methods that were forbidden to him, that when Prospero burned, he believed that his guilt, his punishment was so deserved that he did nothing when the wolves came. He didn't try to reason with Russ or defend his world. He wallowed in his own guilt and didn't raise a finger to spare the others caught up in his self-sacrifice. That when he was offered redemption, he refused it. And in truth, it was not because of his sons, but because he desperately needed to be in control. The one who had the choice that every failure and mistake, every boundary broken, was not his fault, because the idea of the great Magnus the Red 
being responsible was too much to bear. Why do you speak to me as if I were a lonely pawn in this game of regicide? The War Master and the Emperor both know I am the most valuable piece on the board. There it was, the heart of it all, pride and vanity. Magnus was not the man who left the cave and dug the light towards his friends. He was the man too deeply afraid to admit to himself that he was blinded by the sun, not wise enough to let his eyes adjust. The true Magnus was dead in Vulcan's eyes, and all that remained was a creature that was the combination of his brother's worst traits, too blind to see the bars of the cage he had put himself in, too ignorant to see that even now the creature he served had taken away his choice. Inside the Webway City, the two brothers clashed. Each time Magnus burst apart, emulated, or suffocated Vulcan, his brother would rise again, an immortal perpetual, another secret kept from him. The Lord of Drakes and the Demon Primarch battled across the ruins, until upon a bridge, after countless revivals, Vulcan began to tire Magnus out. Still, Magnus threw psychic attacks against the Emperor. Even in the midst of this brutal duel, his true target would suffer. Finally, Vulcan landed his enormous hammer upon the demonic flesh of Magnus. Bones cracked, and eldritch blood poured from Magnus. Fear finally showed upon Magnus's face. He couldn't believe he was losing. He was the Crimson King. He was superior. Finally, Magnus saw behind Vulcan's ember eyes, the golden light of his father. He heard the thought imprint upon his brother's mind. As the Emperor screamed to kill him now, Magnus began to unmake his brother down to the very atoms. Flesh and bone peeled away. Magnus thought he had won until Urkdrakul roared down onto his skull, sundering him from the material universe. Inside the wall, the demon Primarch began to coalesce, an immortal existence in this realm of madness. On the planet of sorcerers, a demon Crimson King sits upon his throne. Long has passed since the time of the Horus Heresy, the defeat of Horus and the internment of the corpse emperor upon the golden throne. Gone was the child of terror, son of Prospero, Primarch of the 15th, an arrogant creature with knowledge, but without wisdom remains, and a man who thought he could do no wrong. A pawn of a god of change, and a future of enlightenment for humanity murdered. All of it gone. All is dust. Without wisdom, power will destroy the one who wields it. Seekers desire power, but not wisdom. Power without wisdom is dangerous. Better to have wisdom first. Those who have knowledge do not predict. Those who predict do not have knowledge. If you abuse power, you will be burned, and then you will learn, if you live. Justice is my purpose. The only route to total justice is fear. We are the weapon of fear no other legion dared to be. I became the sinner, the monster, the night haunter. The 
these humans, their imaginations are strong. Kill a thousand men and they will hate you. Kill a million men and they will queue to face you. But kill a single man and they will see monsters and devils in every shadow. Kill a dozen men and they will scream and wail in the night and they will feel fear, not hatred. They are panicky, gossiping beasts, these humans. It serves us to allow them to be so. Justice, madness, self-righteousness, guilt and fear. The cornerstones of the broken mind that is Conrad Kurz, Primarch of the Eighth Legion, the Night Haunter. In a universe filled with horrifying demons and monstrous Xenos, it would be a human, a transformed and elevated one, but still a man that would inspire the adrenaline-spiked dread that haunts our species, reminding us of the time when we were ignorant savages that cowled from creatures in the night. The legacy of the Night Haunter is a brutal, sadistic, fear-driven ethos whose scars reverberate all the way to the 41st millennium. But who is the man, Conrad Kurz, the person behind the veil of the Night Haunter? His story begins in the 30th millennium. Above a bleak and dark world, a gestation capsule roared down from the heavens, a comet blazing with fire and light. Illuminating the near perpetual darkness the planet was shrouded in, the capsule tore its way through the enormous hive city of Nostromo Quintus, plunging down into the depths, scarring the very earth itself. The capsule's landing was so violent it even broke through the planet's crust, lodging itself deep underground. Emerging from the nearly obliterated capsule, that still had the marks of claws on its burnt remains, a child opened his eyes for the very first time, finding only rubble. This child was special, elevated in a way he did not yet comprehend. His mind did not flutter to panic and fear. It chose one singular thing, one absolute to focus on. Survive. The child began to dig. Minutes into his sentence, he was already in a life and death situation. His fingers began to bleed, and fistful by fistful, he tore the earth above with a strength that was beyond human. Bloodied and exhausted, the child broke to the surface, finding a near pitch black existence. The polluted air filled his lungs, and he was consumed by an overwhelming sense of hunger. He needed sustenance. His pitch black eyes found the closest living thing, a human. The child sat upon the anemic, pale looking thing before him, taking his first life and devouring his flesh. Consuming the poor victim's brain, the young child saw something incredible. He saw the memories of his victim, soaking in the information and melding it with the wisdom that had been seemingly imprinted upon him. The polluted, nocturnal hellscape around him was the world of Nostromo, a hive world where midnight perpetually reigned in its pollutant clogged atmosphere. The geology of Nostromo was nothing short of priceless, as the world's unusual crust had unprecedented amounts of naturally occurring adamantium. Enormous gothic hive cities dotted the surface, houses and factories stacked upon each other, miles high. A maze of structures and alleys that all blended together in a disgusting concoction of pollutants that dripped down through the layers of civilization. To think about how daunting and overwhelming it would have been to be in the presence of this nightmarish place would have chilled you to the bone. He saw humans, things similar but yet not quite like him, pale skinned people with pitch black eyes, much like the poor thing he had just devoured. From the moment he had opened his eyes, his brain had been filled with a catalogue of information, 
The child had understood his surroundings, technologies, and concepts to a level that was beyond an ordinary person. What he had seen was information. He was barely hours old into his sentience, and all he had known was the cold, exhaustion, hunger, and the dark. His framing for all of this came from that very first human experience he had. The perception of reality from his victim's brain, still warm in his gut. The corpse before him was a criminal. They had seen the people of this world, the wealthy families who lived at the very top of these mega structures, enjoying the only sense of illumination the world could produce. They were corrupted, brutal thugs, vile people whose grip on power was enforced by tyranny and pain. And as the further one descended the layers of this gothic hellscape, the more desperate and depraved it became. Gangs roamed the streets, stealing, murdering, violating the population who in turn had to steal, trick and lie just to survive. The population numbers of Nostromo was not kept down by war, sickness or murder, but in reality, self-erasure. No joy, happiness, or warmth reached a majority of the people on Nostromo. A life with no future, destined to be corrupted by sickness or murdered. The vision the child saw must have been sickening. To a person so naive, what would that do to you? It was all wrong. The child felt it was wrong. Even he felt it was unjust. All of it, a sensation that seemed to have always been there, roared in his mind. He needed to fix this, fix the world, fix the people. He wanted to make it right. He wanted to make it just. She couldn't stand it. She clamped her hands over her ears and stifled a scream. It was funny given what she intended to do, that she didn't want to scream. Screams brought trouble. She craved a little dignity at the end. She sobbed quietly, saliva running from her mouth. Her eyes screwed up so tightly that they vanished. Her face swirled. She never looked her best when she was weeping. Arjash always said that, teasing her tears away. A laugh tried to rise at the memory. It choked off in a strangled competition with her sorrow. She didn't hear the door. She didn't hear the slice of bladed fingers, breaking every one of her locks with metallic snaps. The apartment had been burgled many times. They had many locks. The door was scarred from battery, kicked in, bashed in, broken with hydraulic jacks. The stealthy entrance was gentle compared to the boot that had put the panels through, or the blow torches that had reduced the first lock to a puddle of metal. The entrance was conducted with the respect for the occupant. The intruder had been keen to inflict no more damage than was necessary. She was still weeping, and didn't see him when he bent over double to pull his cadaverous frame through and stand, willowy, yet hulking, his inhuman head brushing the ceiling. But she did smell him. His pungent odor overcame the awful reek of the air exchanger, a heavy smell redolent of death. Her sobs died. She took in a hitching breath, removed her hands from her ears and turned to face the creature that had come into her sanctum. She kept her eyes closed for several seconds, listening to him breathe. Quiet, yet audible over the thundering fans a hundred thousand lives depended on. Night hunter, she said, opening her eyes as she spoke the words. I have come for you, Night Haunter said. His body was swathed in black rags, stitched together from the garments of a dozen looted corpses. No tailor on the Strama would dare outfit this nightmare. Why? She said. She was too drained to feel fear. The situation was surreal. I have done nothing wrong. I have lived all my life as well as I could. You did not dream of City's Edge. Everyone dreams of City's Edge, she said. Her voice was small yet defiant. 
I tried to make myself into someone who could go there. I failed, but I did no wrong in trying. I have never harmed anyone or wished to. I've suffered life here without complaint. Why are you here? The night haunter's eyes glinted. The manner of your life is not my concern. It is the manner of your death. The manner of death you have chosen is a crime. He took a step forwards, looming over her. There were, in ancient places, laws against self-murder, he said. Suicides were buried without ceremony, in shame, and those caught attempting to kill themselves were often executed. But I want to die, she whispered. Not the way I will end you, he hissed. What I will do to you will make you wish you had opted to live. I am going to hurt you as much as it is possible to be hurt. Why? She breathed. There are no taboos against taking one's life here, said the Night Haunter. Many do. This is not a happy world, but it can be a better one. By killing yourself, you take the easy way out. You encourage others to do the same. You might think you add yourself to a statistic, but your self-murder is much more than that. Every suicide adds to the rot weakening your culture. Every life abandoned is a signal that change can never be affected. You throw your existence away, and in doing so lessen the value of humanity. He reached out a hand and ran a ragged nail gently down her face. I am going to save you. I am going to save you all. The people of this world will rise above the station of beasts. I will make them. If I have to bathe in the blood of you all to make that happen, then so be it. Justice is my purpose. The only route to total justice is fear. Without fear there can be no order. You will suffer now to feed that fear, so that many others will live and this decaying society take the slow road to salvation. He pulled out a long knife he had made himself. It was unlovely. A murderous blade, but with it he would carve the most excruciating agonies. Wait! She said. The blade hissed through the air. Do not try. He said. You plead for something you have already forfeited. The first cut parted the skin on her arm, shoulder to little fingertip. No deeper than the dermis, for he did not want her hide to tear when he ripped it from her living body. It was so swift a movement, the blade was so sharp, she did not feel it. Her first unbelieving gasp of pain only came when the blood splattered to the floor. She clutched her arm, her hand hopelessly unsuited to the task of closing the wound. She began to cry again, this time from fear and pain. Kurz grinned. You do not wish to die any longer, I can tell. That is unfortunate, but it must be done. He advanced on her. Feel joy that your death will bring justice to this world. Feel joy that I bring order. He cut again. This time she screamed. A droplet of warm, wet red dotted his cheek. He fought the urge to lick it off. He must be sober and serious. I assure you, I do not enjoy this at all. His heart's quickened at the lie. An enormous, looming figure, larger than any man, with knotted muscle, long dark hair, and midnight black eyes roamed like a creature of nightmare amongst the streets of Nostromo Quintus. The boy had grown, faster than any other mortal, into an enormous man, 
His physical strength was incredible. His speed was almost too fast for the human eye to catch. His intelligence was fierce, but most importantly, his presence was earth-shattering. A name, once screamed for the lips of hardened criminals, was now spoken in hushed whispers. A title that frightened everyone, from the old even to the children. Night Haunter. The boy had begun to grow, living amongst the damp, cold, poisonous streets and alleys. The boy had no one. Only the screams and cries of a tortured and beaten down population were his constant. His first interaction with other humans had been violent. Only hate and pain reached his feral heart. He began to watch, a creature hidden in the dark, observing the inhabitants of his bleak world. All the boy could see was a reinforcement of the vision he had seen taken from his first taste of human flesh. The people on Nostromo were rotten. He saw horrifying acts, vandalism, thievery, and political corruption in all of them. As he began to hunt down more sustenance, he devoured more brains of the pale-skinned people, witnessing the miserable, crime-laden lives of all. He felt the need to correct it. It was a desire that was coded into every fibre of his being. The young man began to prowl the streets of Nostromo Quintus and began to act upon his ingrained moral code. Gang members, civilians and nobles would find this towering, superhuman figure lunging out of the shadows, moving at blinding speed. With only a second to comprehend the horror of what was occurring, the young man tore them to pieces, feasting upon their grey matter. A never-ending cycle began to emerge. His consumption led to more visions, a looking glass into the crimes of his now dead victims. Names, locations and accomplices were all laid bare before him. And so the hunt began again. A twisted moral code began to form. He killed. He witnessed a crime, and then he hunted down the next. Even slaying a random civilian, he would find he was justified in their death, seeing through their own eyes the monstrous life they had led. The bodies began to pile up. Entire gangs were left a broken pile of limbs. People went missing. Screams filled the nocturnal night. Horrified at the monster hidden in the dark. Night Haunter. Fear the Night Haunter. The young man's philosophy began to evolve over the years. More and more died at his hands. But yet, the people didn't stop. Why? Surely they knew he would end them. Yet they all did not change. The nobles were still corrupt thugs. The gang still brutalized and tortured, and the poor still stole. The young man had felt this need to correct their behavior. In a way, he felt he needed to save them from themselves. He wanted to shape them, and this world into a just, serene place. How many times have you dreamt about shaping the world to your vision? That sensation of correcting all that is wrong in the world, to punish those who deserve it. The now enormous young man started to perfect his philosophy. He had learned so much in such a short time. He was a genius compared to those around him, and his observations of those panicky, gossipy beasts that was humanity helped him perfect his tactics. Hunting down his victims, the Night Haunter saw how humans screamed, how their hearts raced uncontrollably. Some wept, and some were too paralyzed to move. To see this enormous dark-haired man, midnight black eyes looming over you, with a voice that triggered despair in the very depths of your soul. How brave would you be? He saw how compliant the scared little creatures before him became, as their death was moments away. 
Fear, fear kept them in line. Too afraid to go outside, too afraid to commit the crimes in case the Night Haunter was prowling. But murder, dismemberment, and desecration was nothing new to the people of Nostromo. Their fear of stepping out of line had to be greater than the prospect of just death. The enormous young man began to ramp up. Victims would be hunted, finding those around them torn apart. They would catch a shadow moving out of the corner of their eye. He wouldn't let them sleep. For weeks the fear would build, cascading into a full-blown manic state. The Night Haunter was coming. He knew what you had done. He knew your sins. At the moment of frenzy, when all around knew that you were walking dead, there he was, the figure of nightmare. In his clutches, death was a release begged for by his victims. Weeks upon weeks of slow, grueling torture. He broke the body and mind, broadcasting the screams and cries for all to internalize. And then the criminal would die. Justice. Crime was binaric, black and white. He did not care why someone broke order, what age they were. It only mattered that they did. It was discipline, without any human nuance. No one had ever taught him, but most frightening of all, he enjoyed it. In the pouring, polluted rain, the Night Haunter began to chase another criminal, a young boy, through the gothic streets of Nostromo Quintus. He had caught the little thing in the act of attempted violation. He gave the victim a head start. He liked it this way. Catching up to the terrified young youth, he pounced on him, breaking his body and lifting him high, ready to break him. It was then that the sensation plagued him again. The visions. He saw the future. Multiple futures. Ever since his first moments in this dark hellscape, the Night Haunter found his body at times overtaken by glimpses into the future. It even haunted his dreams. He saw titanic battles with men in ornate, powered armor, warring on distant worlds. He could see events unfold days or even weeks after he had foreseen them. He had even learned the name he was destined to have, the one that his creator had given him, or was going to give him. Conrad Kurz. But what haunted him most was a vision of his own death. Upon a distant, barren world, inside a room made of screaming, tortured people, sat a disheveled king in midnight clad armor, an assassin that he knew had been sent by his father, strode up to the creature that was Conrad and beheaded him. To have seen how you would die at such a young age, what would that do to the mind? To have not even had the concept of mortality and human connection, and yet see the man who you knew to be your father is responsible for your death. With the terrified young Nostroman boy in his grip, Kurz saw multiple possible outcomes. A future where he gave the criminal the justice he deserved. One where he spared him, reforming the broken child into a paragon. An example that would spread across this depressing world. And one future where the boy took his knife and wounded Kurz. His survival would turn him into the most heinous monster, the one who had survived the Night Haunter, a mistake that would dampen the fear the Night Haunter inspired. No, that future could not happen. Conrad would not allow it. Reeling from the sensation of the visions, the Night Haunter strode forward, ending the vile criminal's life, even as he turned to see the boy's knife on the ground, out of reach. Was it fear or doubt that drove him to choose this outcome, or were the other possible outcomes merely just illusion? 
The vision of his death at the order of his father remained. Some futures a comrade felt more real, like this was the true event to come, and yet all still led to that haunting death. It was like no matter what he did, he was following a path set out for him, like it was all fated. Each act of justice was a predetermined event. Each choice, each grueling torture was fated, and Conrad was just riding the path created for him. He had no choice. And so the Night Haunter continued. He began to ramp up. Criminals of all ages, even those whose crimes were petty at most, found a dark spectre hunting them. Weeks of anguish followed by a death so haunting it scarred the living of Nostromo, becoming a very silent place. Ascending to the very heights of the Hive cities, Conrad presented himself before the terrified nobles, baying them to kneel and follow his law or be destroyed. Some never left that council. The rest knelt before their master. A dark king had risen. Falling in line to the superhuman Night Haunter, Conrad began his reign of justice, utilizing the vast communication network of the Hive cities. The capture, death, and torture of criminals was cast throughout the cities, all mandated to witness the justice taking place. But this reign of dread was not solely a barbaric one. Corruption was eliminated. Illumination was brought to the previous crime-laden depths. The people did not starve. A living wage was mandated. No one was the victim of crime either. It was Conrad's serenity. Millions of people lived healthy, safe lives but in uncompromising, unnerving silence. Family sat at home, dreading to speak, not to mistakenly incur the gaze of the Night Haunter. Decades passed, and Astramo had been transformed. Not a single crime had been committed in living memory, but everything would change on the day that Conrad knew would come to pass, a day he had seen in his prescience. At the borders of Nostromo, the Great Crusade had arrived, descending from the dark skies like a shining beacon, an army landed. The possession made its way through the illuminated clean streets, all the way to the Night Haunter's palace. The pale-skinned, dark-eyed Nostromans wept. The majesty, such perfection. Some even went blind. Standing before the Dark King, Conrad finally lay his true eyes upon his father, the Emperor of Mankind. It is better by far to be an object of fear than of respect. For one is a truth of the soul, and the other an illusion of the mind. You understand now, for them and for all enemies. Yes, I wanted to be ruthless. Let fear enter in them once and for all, because only with terror could I change anything in this world. Curse! Never once had Rogel Dawn called him by his forename. Brother, he had replied. Throne, what are you doing here? Demanded Dawn, his normal, affable tone swallowed in the depths of his outrage. A phalanx of golden armed warriors followed their lord, and Kurt had immediately sensed the tension in the air. Punishing the guilty, he answered coolly. Restoring order. The Primarch of the Imperial Fists shook his head. This is not order, Kurz, it is murder. Command your warriors to stand down. My Imperial Fists will take over this sector. Stand down, said Kurz. Are they not the enemy? 
Not anymore, said Dawn. They are prisoners now, but soon they will be a compliant population and part of the Imperium. Have you forgotten the Emperor's purpose in declaring the Great Crusade? To conquer, said Kurz. No, said Dawn, placing a golden gauntlet on his shoulder guard. We are liberators, not destroyers, brother. We bring the light of illumination, not death. We must govern with benevolence if these people are ever to recognize our authority in this galaxy. Kurz flinched at the touch, resenting the easy friendship Dawn pretended. Bileless anger bubbled invisibly beneath his skin, but if Dawn was aware of it, he gave no sign. These people resisted us and must pay the penalty for that crime, said Kurz. Obedience to the Imperium will come from the fear of punishment. You know that as well as anyone, Dawn. Kill those that resisted and the others will learn the lesson that to oppose us is to die. Dawn shook his head, taking his arm to lead him away from the curious stares their heated discussion was attracting. You are wrong, but we should speak of this in private. No, said Kurz, angrily shrugging off Dawn's grip. You think these people will bend the knee meekly to us because we show compassion? Mercy is for the weak and foolish. It will only breed corruption and eventually betrayal. Fear of reprisals will keep the rest of this planet in check, not benevolence. Dawn sighed. <sighs> and the hatred planted in those you leave alive will pass from one generation to the next until this world is engulfed in a war, the cause of which none of those fighting will remember. It will never end. Don't you see that? Hate only breeds hate, and the Imperium cannot be built upon such bloody foundations. All empires are forged in blood, said Kurz. To pretend otherwise is naive. The rule of law cannot be maintained by the blind hope that human nature is inherently good. Haven't we seen enough to know that ultimately the mass of humanity must be forced into compliance? I cannot believe I am hearing this, said Dawn. What has gotten into you, Kurz? Nothing that has not always been there, Dawn, said Kurz, striding away from the mighty golden figure and hauling one of the few remaining prisoners upright by the front of his tunic. He scooped up a fallen bolter and thrust the heavy weapon into the prisoner's trembling hands. Kurz leaned down and said, Go ahead. Kill me. The terrified man shook his head, the oversized weapon shaking in his hands as he thought his limbs were paralyzed. No, said Kurz. Why not? The prisoner tried to speak, but was so awed by the terrifying proximity of the Primarch that his words were unintelligible. Are you afraid you will be killed? The man nodded, and Kurz addressed his warriors. No one harms this man. No matter what happens, he is not to be punished. Kurz turned and walked back towards Dawn, with his arms stretched out to either side of him, presenting his back to the prisoner. No sooner than he had turned away from the armed man than the gun had been raised and the hard crack of a bolt shot split the air. Sparks flew as the explosive shell ricocheted from Kurz's armor and he spun around on his heel to smash the prisoner's skull to splinters with his fist. The headless corpse swayed for a moment before dropping slowly to its knees and pitching onto its chest. You see, said Kurz his fingers dripping with blood and bone fragments. And what was that supposed to prove? Asked Dawn, his features curled in distaste. That any chance mortals get, they will choose the path of descent. When he thought he would be punished, he dared not shoot. But the moment he believed himself free from consequence, he acted. That was an unworthy deed, said Dawn and Kurz had turned away from him before he could elaborate, but the Imperial Fist Primarch caught his arm. Your warriors will stand down and withdraw, Kurz. That is an order, not a request. Leave this planet, now. Dawn's eyes were hard as granite, 
and Kurz knew enough of his brother's resolve to realize he had pushed him far enough. When this campaign is won, you and I will have words, Kurz. You have crossed the line, and I will no longer countenance your barbarous methods of war. Your way is not the way of the Imperium. I think you might be right, whispered Kurz. Look out at my father's Imperium. Do not unroll a parchment map or analyze a hololithic star chart. Merely raise your head to the night sky and open your eyes. Stare into the blackness between worlds. That dark ocean, the silent sea. Stare into the million eyes of firelight. Each a sun to be subjugated in the Emperor's grip. The age of the alien. The era of the inhuman is over. Mankind is in its ascendancy. And with 10,000 claws, we will lay claim to the stars themselves. The Great Crusade, the reconquest of the galaxy, the unification of the race of mankind. Meeting his father at the steps of his Nostraman palace, Conrad was overcome by his prescient visions. It was so violent and horrifying that even he, a Primarch who had butchered and tortured thousands of people, tried to claw his own eyes out. Only with the intervention of the Emperor was he stopped, calming him, bidding he be at peace. The Night Haunter, also like playing a role, acting out what was destined to be, submitted himself before the Emperor pledging his loyalty. Like all Primarchs before him, Conrad did not join the Legion that had been created from his own genetic material. He began his induction under his brother Fulgrim, Primarch of the Emperor's children. Of all the brothers that strode through Nostromo on that fateful day, it was Fulgrim alone who had the decency to look him in the eye. Conrad began to pick up the information and battle doctrine at frightening speed the gift of his superhuman genetics, showing just how elevated he was, despite his somewhat barbaric origins. Fighting and learning by Fulgrim's side, he saw how the Imperium fought, how Astartes fought. He saw how Fulgrim used his legion as a symbol, paragons decked out in ornate, beautiful armor. He saw the power of imagery. With his tutelage coming to an end, the first recruits drawn from Nostromo had been raised up, elevated to Astartes, and finally the Legion, Nostromans, and Primarchs were merged. The Eighth Legion, now the Night Lords, were ready for the Great Crusade. Like all Primarchs, Conrad began to mould his legion, teaching them the axioms he had created, the mixing of his personal philosophy with the logistics of warfare. It is far better to be an object of fear than of respect, for one is a truth of the soul, and the other an illusion of the mind. He taught his sons to become icons of fear. Fear is the greatest of all weapons, Fear will cow a world where guns will not. We spill blood to save blood. Why use terror? Terror is a clean blade. Its cuts disarm opponents without doing them harm. Terror is the friend of compliance. The few must die in pain so that the many can live in peace. Fear is the road to civilization. The ends justifies the means. Even on those cold, damp, rotten streets of Nostromo, Conrad had burned into his core that sense of wanting to make the universe right, perhaps the way the Emperor had made him. He had learned that these panicky, gossipy beasts that was humanity needed to be shepherded. He truly did believe in a united humanity, a universe purged of Xenos and mutants, a serene utopia where fear kept the rabble in line. You understand now, for them and for all enemies, yes, I wanted to be ruthless, 
Let fear enter in them once and for all, because only with terror could I change anything in this world. The Eighth Legion became a force of terror. Conrad and his sons molded their armor into wicked shapes, displaying flayed skin and skull trophies like medals. They utilized horrific sounds, screams that would disorientate and spark dread. His sons became the tools, the extensions of his teachings. Legends such as Zo Sahal, Shang, Fel Zarost, Talos, and his most favored son, Sevatar. World upon world, all proud and brave in the face of conquerors, did not understand what was coming. The Night Lords, the Night Haunter. Upon entering the war zone, they wouldn't attack. The defenders braved chance and boasting, rising like a crescendo until they realized the truth. Captives had been taken. Their screams of agony was broadcasted for weeks. The panicky, gossipy beasts would start to dread the night, alone with the bone-chilling sounds. And then they came. Superhuman warriors in midnight clad, covered in still warm blood, led by an enormous figure that invoked our primordial fears. You can imagine the absolute bone-rattling dread that would grip you, looking at the sea of monsters approaching. The surrender always came quickly. World upon world fell to Conrad and the Eighth. So many had been spared death. But many of his brothers decried his way of war. Dawn tried to reason with him, telling him that the hatred planted in those that lived would pass on from generation to generation until the worlds it would be engulfed in a war that the cause of which none of those fighting will remember. It would never end. How could he not see that? But it didn't matter. Terror is the friend of compliance. So long as they were afraid, humanity would be compliant. Take the universe and grind it down to the finest powder, and sieve it through the finest sieve, and then show me one atom of justice, one molecule of mercy, and yet you act as if there is some ideal order in the world, as if there is some, some righteous in the universe by which it may be judged. At times, in raptures of pain, I saw what was to occur laid out before me. In these waking dreams, I took countless lives with my bare hands, heads taken as trophies. I died again and again at the hands of my father, my sons butchered and maimed by their brothers. My name was to become synonymous with dread, but most vividly and most frequently, I saw my world pierced by a lance of purest light, splitting it, shattering it into dust. It was self-sacrifice. Conrad Kurz, the Night Haunter, was creating a just universe for the Imperium, following his fated path created by his father's design. He would do it all, hands soaked in blood. The Great Crusade progressed for decades, the mere mention of the Eighth Legion would cower worlds into obedience. They knew the stories, the horrific monsters clad in dark armor, covered in flayed skin and skulls. How death was a mercy compared to what they would do. Many such as Dawn decried the use of his tactics, but others were just as incensed with Conrad's twisted sense of justice. His dislike for humanity was apparent in his conflict with Magnus the Red. In a joint compliant action, Magnus sought to save the destroyed culture's libraries. The knowledge could be saved, used to aid the Imperium, but Conrad refused his brother's wishes, ordering a bombardment to destroy the last remnants of a defeated culture. 
What good did the knowledge of other worlds do for the Stromo? Learning of brighter places, civilizations with happy, compliant people. Knowledge for Magnus was freedom, a concept the Night Haunter hated. The people did not need to be free. Their freedom led to choice, and choice led to crime. Freedom challenged the Night Haunter's justice. Though he despised the Emperor, his father, he still believed in a just society of humanity. It was the interpretation of that which drew the ire of so many of his brothers. Take the universe and grind it down to the finest powder and sieve it through the finest sieve and then show me one atom of justice, one molecule of mercy. And yet, you act as if there is some ideal order in the world, as if there is some, some righteousness in the universe by which it may be judged. Conrad had seen how effective, how transformative his justice worked on Nostromo, that depressing hellscape. To cower and control that vile population, he had learned that only an absolute black and white system, something that disgusted his brother Vulcan, Primarch of the Salamanders, during a joint compliant action on the world known as Karastan. Vulcan and his salamanders fought alongside Conrad and his night lords. It was only up close that the horror of Conrad's philosophy was realized. During this campaign, Vulcan became disgusted with his brother, seeing the torture, the brutality and disregard for human life, even witnessing the eighth slaughter of the inhabitants of an entire city in order to seed fear amongst the general population. Vulcan, from his first moments, had never been alone. He had a family. He was raised with love. He connected to the people of his homeworld. He understood the human experience, something Kurz never had. His first interaction with humanity was violent. He saw the world through a criminal's brain. He never saw all the good inside the hearts of mankind. Vulcan confronted Kurz about his legion's actions, and the two demigods clashed. Battered and wounded by each other, Vulcan swore he would inform Horus and Dawn of his brother's disgusting actions, a slight comrade would never forget. Vulcan had not seen humanity like he had. His sense of justice was naive. After decades of warfare against numerous Xenos species, and lost colonies of mankind, the 8th Legion had cut a bloody swath across the galaxy. But the cost of decades of warfare came full circle to the Legion. Absent of the Night Haunter, Nostromo began to fall into its old ways. A coup had been launched. The old, corrupt, noble families, generations who had lived on a world devoid of the Night Haunter's presence, had overcome their fear. For decades, the bravest, brightest minds on Nostromo had been taken, inducted into their Dark King's Legion. Would the regime change? The dregs and damned, the boys who were unredeemable, languishing in prisons, were offered up. Men who were mirrors of the very criminals the Night Haunter had hunted were now transformed. They were now in midnight clad. Fear was their weapon. But slowly the Legion began to rot, filled with legionaries who turned their weapons into sadistic delight, butchering and torturing for the enjoyment, something the Night Haunter would have to cleanse. Sevatar had never met the Raven Lord, only seen him from a distance, and he had never seen the Night Haunter and Korax side by side. It was said they were brothers cast in the same mould, and truly the similarities between them were astonishing. Their skin shared death's pallor, their eyes were sinister orbs of ink, the Raven Lords completely black, the Lord of Murders barely less so, only a touch of white either side of his enlarged pupils. Both carried talons of steel, both evoked winged creatures of darkness, one Chiroptian, the other Avian. Both were masters of the dark, 
Their facial features were markedly fraternal. Long, thin noses, narrow faces, high cheekbones, sharp chins, jet black hair. The differences were starker for the similarities. Kurz was filthy and stank of blood. Korax was clean, his armor polished, but it was their expressions that they diverged the most. Corvus Korax bore a perpetual light frown, an expression of such utmost seriousness it strayed into caricature. Kurz's face changed constantly, small ticks, transforming it from arc knowingness to wild-eyed threat. Signs of the incipient madness that, even then, Sevatar was becoming aware of. The possibility of violence turned the air to glass, which any sudden movement might shatter. Two lords of men, one midnight clad, the other armored in shadow, stared at one another. Distant rumbling sent dying tremors through the building. As the bombardment moved on to the other districts, Korax broke the silence first. What is the meaning of this, my brother? He said, gesturing meat along claws at the mess of the slain. What happened to your warriors? Unable to help himself, the night haunter snarled. He caught it and turned it into a mocking smile, but not before all present had seen his anger. He was a predator challenged by something just as dangerous. For a moment, Conrad Kurz exhibited weakness. I happen to them said Kurz evenly. Korax looked over the ruined flesh in the room in disbelief. What have you done? Kurz smiled blackly. An internal dispute, Lord Korax. He said airily. A legion matter that I have resolved. You must understand there are many criminals in your legion also. You have your ways of dealing with those who stray too far from the bounds of good conduct. He poked a blade of mercy through the shattered eye lens of a helm and held it up for Korax to see. This is mine. Korax's eyes lingered on the blood straining Kurz's chin. Then perhaps you could tell me why you are bombarding this already compliant sector. This Raven Lord has fought most of his brothers. Let our lord teach him a lesson. For Vox Devitar. I say we fight. Do not open fire. Sevatar ordered. The muted clicks on the raven's voxes intruded on their frequency. A sure sign the ravens were also communing with each other. From their stance, he guessed their conversation was going the same way. Kurz shifted his weight imperceptibly. Korax reacted in kind. His fingers twitched a fraction of a millimeter. The pair of them appeared at ease, but they were a hair's breadth away from striking. Don't, Kurz, thought Sevatar. Don't fight him. Kurz narrowed his eyes, crinkled with a smile. A little tension bled from the room. We are the weapon of fear no other legion dared to be. We are the glorious eighth. You think I am a monster? I am a simple tool, like you. We have different uses, though identical edges. I do not think anything about you, other than the disgust I feel for your methods, said Korax. Kurz shrugged. You may join the line of all the others who feel the same. I don't care. I am exactly as the Emperor intended me to be. Are you really any better than I? Korax Shadow Skulker. The 19th are assassins. We are all killers. We are brothers in methods as well as in blood. Our way is clean, said Korax. Sevatar found his voice annoyingly lugubrious. Such misery. They said he was raised in a prison, and that accounted for his saturnine demeanor. Sevatar wanted to hurl him into the deeps of Nostromo's hives so he might better learn what lawlessness was. Self-obsessed, unable to see the truth for their own aggrandized woes. Kurz was lonely in being true to himself. He was a fiend, but at least he was honest. 
No war is clean. All of them come with a price. Curse continued. Some are more obvious than others, that is all, and the price must always be paid. Curse sighed, shrinking into himself, bored. War's reckoning awaits you. Do you wish to know the cost? Korax's black, unreadable eyes rested on Curse for several seconds. I will return to my ship. Stop this bombardment. The conquest is falling behind schedule. We risk turning the population further from the Emperor's light. I think you'll find them most pliable when I am done, said Kurz. My Lord Kurz, Sevatar said stiffly and severed the Vox. My Lord Night Haunter, what are your orders? Sevatar asked the question as neutrally as he could, belying his concern that the answer might result in a command to hunt down their allies. Let them go, said Kurz sadly. Now is not the time for us to kill our brethren. Droll thing life is, that mysterious arrangement of merciless logic for a futile purpose, the most you can hope from it some knowledge of yourself. That comes too late, a crop of inextinguishable regrets. But his soul was mad. Being alone in the wilderness, it had looked within itself. And, by heavens I tell you, it had gone mad. He hated him, his mirror, his brother, the Raven Lord, Corvus Korax. Both of them had grown up on worlds overrun by criminals. Both had that innate sense of justice bound into their very DNA. Both creatures of night and shadow. Two men cast from the same die. But Conrad hated him. Hated how Korax was lauded and accepted. The Raven Lord had incinerated a world in his rise to the role of Primarch. Millions dead. But yet he was chastised for torturing thousands? Why did his father, the Emperor of Mankind, not give him a path like the Raven Lords? The journey Conrad was following filled him with resentment, because after a near century of constant warfare, the cracks were beginning to show. His soul was mad. Being alone in the wilderness, it had looked within itself, and by heavens, I tell you, it had gone mad. Alone, in the shaping of his moral compass, devoid of human love, the superhuman demigod Conrad Kurz, for all his elevation above the mortal man, he was still human. And no person who had murdered, tortured and genocided as many as he had, could still retain sanity. He had become the Night Haunter, a figure of black and white justice who hurt the few to save the many, but a small part in the back of his mind was cursed with doubt. It was all piling up. The degradation of the Legion, its perverse new recruits, the re-emergence of crime on Nostromo, his desensitized veterans, and the visions. He still saw his own death. He still saw death and destruction, a time when legionary and brother would kill each other, even a time when he had a particularly violent vision, where he saw the future monstrosity he was destined to become, squirming and lashing out, screaming in pain, horrified by his future. He awoke out of his trance, and he realized he had murdered one of his archivists, he had killed his first innocent person. Someone who he had no evidence of crimes for. There was no justice in his death. He was a criminal now. Perhaps he really did deserve the fate he was due. He was falling. Even his closest sons, Shang and Sevitar, could see it. He was vulnerable and turned to the one person he felt he could confide in. Fulgrim the brother who had guided him, 
the only brother who had looked him in the eye on the day they had met. Perhaps his only friend. It was a defiance of destiny. Perhaps if he told his brother, then he was free from the future he saw. Maybe he wasn't to become the disheveled monster he had seen when he was a boy. But he was betrayed. Fulgrim had told Dawn everything. His confidence, his secrecy, his vulnerability was betrayed. We all know the confusion, pain and hate caused when the person we trusted turns their back on us. Dawn chastised Conrad. How dare he speak of betrayals against the Emperor? In the mass of judgement and anger, Conrad was struck by another horrifying vision. Pain shot all over his body as images of a future of fire and blood ravaged his mind. He became a wild beast and began lashing out. The raving Conrad launched himself at dawn, beating the surprise Primarch to a pulp, butchering several of his imperial fists too. Shame and regret crept back into the devolving mind of Conrad as the vision ceased and the Lord of the Eighth fled, anguish turning in his chest from the betrayal of Fulgrim and for what he had done. Returning to the Eighth Legion, Conrad was sick of it all. He had come to his brother to confide in him about the future and his legion, but he was met with betrayal. His legion was becoming corrupt, straying further and further from the ideals and teachings he had ingrained in them. That accursed world, Nostromo. He hated everything about it, and now it was corrupting his philosophy, his justification of all the deeds he had done. It needed to be stopped. Conrad assembled the entire Night Lord's fleet. Arriving in the Ultima Segmentum, the shadow of an entire legion loomed over the dark world of Nostromo. A legion full of warriors looked at the place of their birth, the world they had grown up on, the place where their families lived, where their culture thrived, and then they burned it. Conrad ordered lancing strikes deep into the core of the planet, breaking it apart. Millions of screams lost into the void of space. Those that had resisted their orders were butchered by Conrad's ever-loyal son, Sevitar, until the weakness was cold. Was it justice or vengeance? That code forged in the dark, killing the few to save the many. But where was that? Did all Nostramas deserve to die, even those who had done no crimes? No. It was all corrupt. It had to be, or what he had done, or what he had just done, was a crime. Condemnation poured in from the throne of terror. For decades a sentiment had mounted. Forces refused to fight with the Eighth. For decades, brother legions had begun to be openly hostile. And then the word came. The Emperor was recalling the Eighth back to terror to face judgement. After all they had sacrificed, they had become the monsters to save lives. For over a century the Emperor had known their way of war, not afraid to utilize his terror unit when the hint of rebellion came. Condemning Conrad from enacting justice on that corrupted homeworld, he had made Conrad and them this way, only to act so above it. Conrad and the Eighth were angry disillusioned, and it was at the height of this discontent that Horus arrived. I have seen darkness, witnessed it in my dreams. I am standing at the edge of a chasm, there is no escaping it. I know my fate, for it is the future, and nothing can prevent it coming to pass. So I step off and welcome the dark. The visions were coming true. The time for brother and legionary to kill each other had come. Horus Lupercal, favoured son of the Emperor, had been corrupted by foul entities of the warp. Dark gods, created from the negative emotions of sentient life. 
Horus came to Conrad, whispering sweet words designed to target the ego and anger the Eighth was feeling. Something Conrad knew was unnecessary. He had seen his betrayal of the Emperor. His prescience had shown him. He had no choice but to join the rebellion. It was destined. Upon the world of Isfahan V, brothers clash in a battle so violent that to bear witness to the concophony of death would destroy your sanity. The Salamanders, Iron Hands and Raven Guard, retreating to their allied lines, wounded and beaten, hailed for their reinforcements, but a cold, eerie silence met them, and then the tension was finally broken. The word bearers, Alpha Legion, Iron Warriors and Night Lords open fired. Conrad and his sons tore into their fellow Astartes, ripping them apart. Amongst the heat, smoke and blood, Conrad was slaughtering the loyalist warriors of the Emperor. To witness his speed and prowess was like death itself, reaping souls. His sons around him screaming the battle cry that had originated from his favourite son, Sevitar. Death to the false emperor. It was then that Conrad found them, his brothers. Seeing Lorgar, that weakling priest, impaled on the claws of the ones he hated most, and he chose to intervene. Two black, pitless eyes met each other. The two brothers, cast from the very same die, locked their power claws together. It must have felt good to see the one who had looked down upon him shattered and wounded. Confused by the betrayal, the Raven Lord, Corvus Corax. Wounded and deep in enemy lines, the Raven Lord made his choice and retreated, a decision that would haunt him forever. The battle had turned into a massacre, one of the greatest defeats the Imperium would ever know but the sensation of victory was slightly tainted. Amidst the violence and betrayal, the Eighth Legion had seen something unnerving. They had seen how some of the word bearers had transformed into nightmarish creatures, and Lorgar Aurelian wreathed in a vile psychic flame. There was something unclean about them. Conrad, Sevitar, and the Night Lords were beginning to see that there was more to this rebellion. Conrad's disgust at his brother and fellow conspirators was quickly overshadowed by an invaluable prize. Vulcan, the Primarch of the Salamanders, unconscious. The brother who had condemned him decades ago during the Grey Crusade found himself strapped to the torturer's table. The sight of Conrad to Vulcan filled him with disgust. The dishevelled mess that was his brother looked awful. He was filthy, covered in dried blood. He was prone to twitching and muttering to himself. His features appeared even more gaunt. Was he speaking to Conrad or the Night Haunter? Conrad began to brutally torture his brother, occasionally hearing whispers in his head at times succumbing to more violent visions in between decimating his brother's form. Conrad had been created a monster. His father had made them all like this. If only the oh-so-proud Vulcan would admit it. If Vulcan had been in his place, he would have done all the same vile acts he was condemning him for. Conrad's horrific torture of Vulcan ramped up. Physical and psychological pain that even a Primarch couldn't endure, placing him in situations where he was forced to take innocent life against his will. Were these people even criminals? Conrad's mental state was declining. He would twist scenarios where empathy and kindness were shown into unwinnable death games. Perhaps his soul was mad. Vulcan was the most human of all their brothers. He represented all the goodness in humanity Something that, if acknowledged by Kurz, would call into question his horrific acts. Because then he killed people. Not the panicky criminal beast he made them out to be. And Vulcan had to turn. Had to show his true nature that he was a monster deep down. Because if he wasn't, then Kurz had chosen to be one. 
His mind was devolving further, his frustration fueling the degradation, until finally he snapped, killing his brother in rage. But to his horror, Vulcan began to regenerate. Vulcan lived. Conrad's sanity snapped. Unable to deliver death, the punishment in his form of justice, it made him scream. Combined with the fact that his father had gifted Vulcan with immortality, whilst he had been born a monster. Conrad began to kill Vulcan again and again. Was it justice, vengeance, or anger? It was lost in the maelstrom of madness. After months of mind-numbingly brutal treatment, Vulcan escaped, beating Conrad into an inch of his life, and then worst of all, sparing him, giving the monster his pity. The crumbled, broken mess that was Conrad did not have long to wallow in his haze. The War Master Horus had ordered the Eighth Legion to the eastern fringes. Lord, he asked after several minutes of silence had gone by. Speak, Sev. Why do you hate us? He asked it quietly, carefully, with no hint of offense or malice. The words still stopped curves in his tracks, causing him to turn. The long blades curving from each of the Primarch's knuckles reflected the golden light of the Emperor's halo, several streets away. What? Sevitar spoke just as casually as before. Why are you the only Primarch to hate his legion? What have we done to you? Kurz smiled, barely. I spoke with Angron and Lorgar not long ago. They told me of their purges, cleansing the untrustworthy elements from the 12th and 17th. I laughed when they said it, at the sheer absurdity of the idea. They knew exactly when to stop the killing of the weak, the treacherous and the corrupt within their bloodlines. I wouldn't even know where to begin culling mine. Sevatar snorted in dismissal. On any other day, such words might hurt my feelings. Look around you, Kurz said. You were born on this world. You grew to adulthood here just as I did. The Emperor praised me for my rule over this world. Even Fulgrim admired it. A model of compliance. An obedient world, they said. Were my people happy? Did that even matter? I made these people human despite their feral drives. I made them civilized despite their baser instincts. I raised them above the level of beasts. That was my responsibility to them as a superior being, and I fulfilled it. Kurz looked to the grey spires, rising in every direction, and the frozen smog from the foundries and manufactorums, veiling the spire tops in a haze of pollutant smoke. And see how my people rewarded me. I was gone only a handful of years before everything soured. My own homeworld poisoned my legion with recruits who were worthless as soldiers, violators, murderers, thieves, the scum, the dregs, the detritus. Sevatar almost laughed. Say, you are no different. The legion is disorderly and vile because it's cast in your image. No. Kurz drenched the single syllable in regret. No, you don't understand. I've never claimed to be perfect, Sevatar, but I became the sinner, the monster, the night haunter, so my people would never have to. And look at the result. Look at the recruits from Nostramo, less than a decade after I departed. Look at the filth they sent me. Look at the disgusting dregs of humanity my own apothecaries infused with my genetic material and reforged into transhumans. The eighth is poisoned, Sev. Generations of men who are murderers in my image, yet devoid of my conviction. 
They are killers and abusers because they want to be. Not because someone had to be. The end result is the same, said Sevatar. Fear is the weapon. Fear is supposed to be the means to the end. Look at the bloodshed my legion has wrought these last years. Even before the crusade was done, fear became the end itself. It was all they desired. They fed on it. My sons were strong, so they bled the weak for their own amusement. Tell me, Captain. Where the nobility is in that? Where is the nobility in any of this? Sevatar gestured to the streets of Nostromo Quintus around them. You can claim a savage nobility, father, but this is far more savage than noble. Curse's pale lips peeled back from his filed teeth. There was no other way. No? Sevatar answered his father's snarl with a grin. What other ways did you try? Sevatar. Answer me, father. What politics of peace did you teach? What scientific and social illumination did you bring to this society? In your quest for a human utopia, what other ways did you try beyond eating the flesh of stray dogs and skinning people alive? It was the only way. Sevatar laughed again. The only way to do what? The only way to bring a population to heal? How then did the other Primarchs manage it? How has world upon world managed it with resorting to butchering children and broadcasting their screams across the planetary Voxnet? Their worlds were never as... as serene as mine was. And the serenity of yours died the first second your back was turned. So tell me again how you succeeded. Tell me again how this all worked perfectly. Curse was on him in the time it took to blink. The Primarch's hand wrapped around his throat, lifting him from the ground, stealing his breath. You overstep your bounds first, Captain. How can you lie to me like this? Sevatar's voice was a strangled growl. How can you lie to yourself? I stand here inside your mind, witnessing a theater of your own memories. Your way is the Eighth Legion way now, but it has never been the only way. Just the easiest way. Kurz tightened his grip. Sevatar narrowed his eyes, his last breath escaping as Kurz squeezed. You enjoyed this way? The captain hissed. You came to love it, just as we all did. The power... The righteousness. Curse released him. Sevatar crashed to the ground, his armor joint snarling as his ceramite scraped the rock creek. Son of a. He trailed off, catching his breath. The son of a god. Curse said softly. Get up, Sevatar. Leave me be. The first captain rose to his feet, his vision blurred. I'm going nowhere, sire. Not without you. Curse smiled. His son could see that much, at least. I admire your tenacity, I always have. But you are a shadow of what I am, Sevatar. You cannot match me. Go. Sevatar filled his lungs, the sterile air viciously cold as he drew it in. He hated them, his so-called sons. He had taken his philosophy of justice, crafted from his interpretation of a serene society, cloaked by an Astraman worldview, and spread it to his legion. They had become torturers, icons of fear and terror, bringing justice to those who deserved it. And to create a human utopia, a very quiet and serene future, where the little human stayed in line. It was the way the Emperor had made him, but his legion no longer killed for justice. They were simply enjoying it. After the escape of Vulcan, Conrad and the Night Lords headed to the eastern fringes, set to engage Lionel Johnson and his Dark Angels, a strategy to delay the First Legion and allow Horus to strike at terror. Conrad and the Eighth launched themselves at world upon world, 
cutting a swath across various worlds of the newly forged Imperium. Populations of billions would find their skies darkened by supposed allies, only to realize the horror when warriors in midnight clad started butchering them. Conrad, fulfilling the path he had seen in his prescience, slaughtered and killed without restraint, witnessing his so-called sons enjoy the slaughter and torture, but he did nothing. He saw no path where fate made him intervene. He just watched and judged. Even when he would snap and kill innocents, it was different for him. He justified it. Any who had died were destined to do so. His father had made him this way. His father had crafted his fate, so it was his fault. Their blood was on his hands. But the slaughter was not unchallenged. The Lion and the Dark Angels for years chased the Eighth Legion. Hundreds of battles were fought in the ashes of ruined worlds, as legionaries butchered each other. The Thramos Crusade was raging across the eastern fringes for years, until Conrad finally bade the Lion to meet face to face on the barren world of Desolga. Descending down to the surface with just an honor guard, the two Primarchs met face to face. To see the two superhumans side by side was incredible. One the chiseled face of Terran perfection, the other a gaunt, dark king, both intimidating, but yet awe-inspiring. The sight of Kurz shocked the lion. His appearance reflected the heart within. A disheveled, pale, gaunt man stared back at the lion, showing a murderous smile with filed teeth. The brothers spoke, Kurz attempting to convince the lion of the truth that their father was a liar, a manipulator, that this rebellion had revealed his hypocrisy, that horrors had shown him the secrets of the war. But he did this in vain. He had seen that he would not sway his brother. A genuine sadness emerged from underneath his mad features. A tragic glimpse of the person, of Conrad the man behind the Night Haunter. Only Conrad and the Lion had grown up alone, devoid of the warmth of human connection. They alone understood what it was like to see the galaxy unfiltered. At the onset of the Great Crusade, Kurz had been the Dark King, the cruel Primarch in Midnight Clad, who cowed the enemies of the Imperium. A man who held so strict to his code that he knew when to stop. But the creature before the Lion was nothing like that, perhaps never noble, but once sane. The Lion apologized to Conrad, and then stabbed him in the gut. A vicious duel broke out, reigniting the conflict. Brother versus brother, legionary versus legionary. For years the conflict continued, until Conrad and the Eighth found themselves caught in a Dark Angel's ambush. Conrad was captured after a brutal duel with the Lion. Wounded and defeated, Conrad awoke upon the Dark Angel's flagship restrained like a wild animal. But no cage could truly hold a Primarch for long. Conrad was locked within a comatose state until he was reunited with his favored son and first captain Sevatar. Utilizing his emergic psychic powers, Sevatar entered his gene father's broken mind, baiting him with the unspoken truth designed to reawaken his lord. Why? Why did he hate his sons so much? They were his creation. His philosophy of justice was a joke. The minute the Night Haunter was gone, humanity overcame their fear. More lived through his methods, but the Night Haunter's peace was a joke. He was just like the sons he detested so much. He enjoyed the killing, the torture, the brutality the tearing down of his father's kingdom. That was the truth behind all his madness. The reason he enjoyed all the evil he had done, 
and the hate he had for this cruel universe was because he hated himself. He hated himself because he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it all. The words reached into Conrad, awakening the mad mind back into reality and almost costing Sevatar his life. Even with all the hypocrisy and dressing down of his Primarch, Conrad's son was still loyal, perhaps both a traitor and a fool. Darting off into the bowels of the Dark Angel ship, once again Conrad became the figure of terror in the shadows, hunting the Dark Angel just like he had stalked the population on Nostromo. But it would all change soon. Sailing to the only beacon of hope, the Dark Angels arrived above McCrag. You know I hate, detest, and can't bear a lie. Not because I am straighter than the rest of us, but simply because it appalls me. There is a taint of death, a flavor of mortality in lies, which is exactly what I hate and detest in the world, what I want to forget. You are repugnant, said Sanguinius. So pretty, so stupid. Father's favored cockerel preening in the hen coop. Is monstrousness not rather the point of me? Curse replied bitterly. Tell me, brother, I am curious. Are you one of the ones who believe our scattering was chance, or one of the ones who do not? I think Gilliman is in the latter camp. I can see the thought ticking around that tedious track of a mind he has, like a rodent in a maze. Desperate to find a different way out, but knowing there is only one exit, and a feline waits without. Tick. 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 He cackled, raking his talons slowly through the air. Claws on the walls. You came to ask me this? You are insane. I came. Curse shrugged. I am asking it. Does my purpose matter? Come, Angel, do you really think it was a chance? I want to know. Each one of us was cast away upon a world that turned out to suit our characteristics perfectly. Characters our father engineered. Furthermore, the characters of many of our Legion's Terran sons were also matched with those of the worlds we were found upon. And, uh, oh yes, we can both see the future. I rather suspect, therefore, that father can read it like a periodical. Can you stand there and tell me that it was chance? No? No reply? No, said Sanguinius quietly. No reply or no as in, no, you don't believe it? Goaded Kurz. Sanguinius's sword lowered a fraction. Why he confided in Kurz he could not discern, but the words were out and he could not have stopped them, even had that been his desire. No, I do not believe our losing was chance. Yes, yes, you see! Kurz became excited by Sanguinius' agreement. A man who plans so long and hard to be taken in so at the moment of triumph? Nonsense! Congratulations, you are halfway to the truth. That our father was a liar? Was, Curse said with a smile, his brow furrowing for just a fraction of a second. Indeed, a liar and more, for I am a monster because that is all I can be, and you are an angel likewise. You had a choice, Curse. Father only made us. He did not shape us. Curse's eagerness turned into a snarl. I was made to be thus. Nothing could change it. I know because I tried. I did. Curse's eyes gleamed with tears. For what? So that he might see me suffer as I failed. That he might tick off his observations upon his laboratorium chart. 
What kind of father makes a child to be one way, then castigates him for being so? You think me cruel. He is crueler. I was to be sanctioned for doing what I was made to do. He clashed his teeth, suddenly vicious. How is that fair? How can I follow the man who did this to me? As quickly as a wave is spent, his ire subsided, and his brittle, agreeable manner returned. So you see, he deserved betrayal. That I do not believe, Conrad. Fathers lie to their sons to protect them, to save them. Our father hid himself for untold millennia among mankind, revealing himself only when he deemed the time right. The story of our scattering was a necessary lie, if indeed it is a lie. The difference between you and me is that you see sinister purpose behind his actions. I do not. His secrecy hurt me, Conrad, as much as it hurts you. And the conclusion you have reached hurts me also. But I will not cast myself into despair. That is the true difference between you and me. I will not abandon our father's dream. His plan is for the good of mankind. Curse stiffened. When not threatening violence, there was something pathetic about him. Good given to a species singularly lacking in goodness. Did you know that here at the heart of Gilliman's perfect little paradise, there are those that are not cared for? I have been hiding in the Illyrian quarters. Rebute's vaulted civil codes wrap themselves around the edges of such places tight as walls, but do not penetrate its wards. The Night Haunter approached his brother. Sanguinius matched him step for step, keeping the distance between them. Kurz dragged Asgelion around like a morose child, might carelessly drag a toy, unaware of the damage being inflicted to the thing it cared for, as it fulmigated on some meaningless slight. To have been there, among the outsiders, the unvalued. They speak of me in whispers. They have learned to fear the dark. But has our brother found me? Has the lion thought to look there or anywhere on McCrag? No. Idiocy. I practically shouted to them to come for me. If you would look at this world and see the hope of the future, go to the poor quarters. There you will see the despair of the present. And you know as well as I, hope for the future is a lie. Everything goes back to the beginning. And our beginning is so very dark. Is that what you believe, brother? That all this was inevitable? I believe Horus's turning was part of our father's intended plan. I do not think so cursed her up his arms, as if he would embrace his brother. Askelion's boot clanked on the floor as he dropped it. See, what a marvelous heart-to-heart -heart we are having. Why should we not? Our brothers have close relationships. Fulgrim regarded Ferris very highly before he killed him. And then Ferris was also close to Vulcan. So easy to dislike Ferris but so much loved by others. Perhaps there is some hope for me. There is hope for us all, Conrad. Curse smirked. No, there isn't. I am hated. You have always hated me. You know I hate, detest, and cannot bear a lie. Not because I am straighter than the rest of us, but simply because it appalls me. There is a taint of death, a flavor of mortality in lies. Descending down the road to madness, Conrad hated what he was becoming, the monster he had seen in his visions on Nostromo. It was all his father's fault, this fate. Hiding in the cold, damp bowels of the Dark Angel's flagship, a trail of bodies were left in the Night Haunter's wake. Any sent to capture him were left mangled, tortured things. Some even with bite marks from when the Primarch had become hungry. Escaping from the lion's clutches, Conrad roared down to the surface of McCrag, finding himself at the heart of a new empire, Imperium Secundus.
The innocent people of Gilliman's homeworld found this enormous shadow loom over them. Like death itself. Was it a man or a beast? The Night Haunter began to butcher the screaming, terrified people. Finding himself confronted by both Rebute Gilliman and Lionel Johnson, he fought them both with all the grace of insanity itself, pushing the two demigod figures to their limit. Even amongst the Primarchs, Conrad's prowess made him one of the best duelists, and his blinding speed and tenacity forced the Lion to protect the death blows aimed at Gilliman, the weakest amongst them. Detonating the explosives he had rigged around the chapel, Kurz escaped. While Gilliman and the Lion only survived thanks to Barbarous Dantioch, teleporting them away. Seemingly unchallenged, Conrad dove deeper into the heart of Gilliman's realm, finding Gilliman's adoptive mother, Tarasha Uten. The elderly matron stood up, and under the sheer weight of the Primarch's aura, his silhouette of dread and terror, she looked the monster in the eye and told the bastard to go to hell. For a man who had reveled in being an icon of fear, his weapon in cowering humanity, the act only in his dark moments he would admit to loving, the fearlessness of this mere human standing up to him must have filled him with rage. But before he could end the pathetic thing, an enormous man, covered in rudimentary armor, with obsidian skin and scarlet eyes barreled into him. Vulcan lived. Confusion, rage, paranoia, and hate flooded into Kurz as the two Primarchs began to duel. Each death blow Kurz gave his opponent, he would simply reawaken from. That accursed immortality. The brothers mercilessly attacked each other, but the duel was interrupted by the Cabal assassin, John Grammaticus, and his comrade, Damon Pitanius. Using a mysterious entity, Conrad was banished, and the Primarch found himself in the warp. The debilitating, insane Primarch was cast into that realm of madness, and there he saw the truth of things that their father had kept from them. He saw his father's empire of lies. Conrad bore witness to the future of unending war. His father crippled on a throne of gold, a carrion god, ruling an imperium built on hate, superstition and war. Emerging back into real space, Conrad found himself again back on McCrag. A concophony of justification added to his personal outlook. Infiltrating his way back into the heart of Imperium Secundus' realm, Conrad ambushed his brother Sanguinius, now the Emperor Regent, keeping a hostage in case he decided to get too brave. Conrad began to taunt his brother. Their father had lied to them, that all of what they had endured, even this rebellion was part of his plan, a sinister plot to achieve his selfish goal of apotheosis. But the truth was buried in his words. I am hated. You have always hated me. And he did not deserve it. How could you hate someone who had no agency in their life? No choice. His father had made him this broken monster. He had implanted his sense of justice. He had allowed him to weaponize it for the Imperium for over a century. And his reward for all of this was condemnation and then death at the hands of an assassin. He didn't want to be hated. Why? Why couldn't he be in his brother's place? Couldn't he be there in golden glory? And Sanguinius the rotten mad thing instead? Why did he have to be alone while his brothers were taken in? Loved. He had tried to fight fate, but no matter what he did, this path was set. For all that he was, Conrad, the uncompromising, cruel Archon of Justice, the Night Haunter, a symbol of terror and dread. He was still human, 
the loneliness, the torture, the pain and powerlessness to fate. It had all broken him. Conrad offered his life to Sanguinius to end it all here. One last defiance of fate. His brother rushed forward, swinging down towards his neck. Conrad welcomed the release, welcomed the justice for the murderer he had become. But it never did. Sanguinius stopped. He wouldn't kill his brother. He told him that even he could find redemption. No, his freedom would not come. Fate had stayed the same. Conrad retreated, angry, ashamed, broken, mad. Like a man possessed, Kurz began to roam the world of Macrag, reaping the souls of the pathetic creatures that served in his hypocritical father's realm. The man, Conrad, raving about his father's injustices, and the creature, the Night Haunter, brutally killing and torturing, enjoying the power and self-righteousness from the kill. For weeks, Conrad plagued the forces of Imperium Secundus, stirring up the broken and forgotten people who dwelled in the slums of the world. Hated vagrants just like him. However, Lionel Johnson was able to corner his brother, and the Primarchs reenacted a duel they had fought a dozen times. Two of the greatest combatants, even amongst their brothers. The Jewels was a display of dizzying heights of martial prowess and strength. But finally, after years of hunting his brother, the lion defeated Conrad. But the sight of this poor, demented and tormented thing captured the last of what was pity in his heart. Instead of death, the lion broke his brother's back over his knee. The wounded, mad Curse was brought into custody and put on trial before the Emperor of Imperium Secundus, Sanguinius. Before Gilliman, Lionel Johnson and Sanguinius, Conrad freely admitted to all that he had done. It was a joke to put him on trial, when he was simply a victim of his father's constructed fate. None of the guilt was his, and what good was their judgement? He was still destined to die at his father's orders, the mad king, dishevelled and broken, alone on his throne. His judgement was given, execution. But even as his brothers prepared to put down this mad monster, Conrad taunted them, even goading Sanguinius with his fate, the death they had both foreseen, a broken angel. Murdered by Horus, his once closest brother. All a path constructed by their father. The enraged Sanguinius lashed out, preparing to strike him down, decrying that this was not how he would die. It was not how it would all end. Moments away from a death unforeseen, the lion appeared, roaring for Sanguinius to stop. Troops came into the room, demanding the lion's surrender, but he responded that Kurz's prescience had shown his death would be at the hands of an assassin sent by the Emperor. For Kurz to die, his death would have to be ordered by their father, which meant for that future to come to pass, the Emperor and Terror still stood. There was hope yet. With the dissolvement of Imperium Secundus, the Ultramarines, Dark Angels and Blood Angels raced towards terror, hoping to break the massive warp storm that had isolated the capital since the early days of their heresy. The raving Conrad, locked within chains, laughed. Once again he had avoided death. His fate was still on track. He was vindicated. He was justified. The loyalists in their journey to break through the ruined storm followed the prescience of Sanguinius and Kurz, 
the latter only revealing small pieces in rants between his deranged mutterings and apathy towards their cause. Arriving above the world of Davin, the Primarchs descended to the surface, curs in tow as their prisoner. The further the group descended upon the world, the more Conrad began to panic. He had not foreseen this. All his life, he'd had the comfort of knowing what would happen next. But now he was utterly powerless. He was making decisions. The anger and sadness began to build like a wave in his broken mind. Choice. He had always had no choice. But each step he took towards the warp portal, located deep upon this strange world, was cracking his foundational belief. Arriving at the eerie temple, the brothers were in awe. The warp portal. The epicenter of where their father and Horus had entered that realm of madness. Caught off guard, the group was ambushed, and Sanguinius was swallowed up by the demon Madal's portal, the sight of which made Conrad shriek with concern and sorrow. Of all his brothers, Sanguinius had shown him kindness. Even though he was a monster, Sanguinius loved him. A feeling the all too human Conrad buried amongst the madness of the Night Haunter. Gilliman and the lion began to scream at him, to use his prescience to see where Sanguinius was. But he couldn't. Conrad was panicking. He had seen none of these events, and it was breaking him, calling into question everything he had done. Emerging out of the portal, as demons erupted across Davin, Sanguinius dragged the fragile curs aboard his flagship. As Gilliman and the Lion engaged the traitor forces that were blockading the path to terror, they allowed Sanguinius and the Blood Angels the opportunity to defend terror. Aboard his brother's flagship, Sanguinius decided again to bring his brother to terror, placing curs within a stasis coffin. As the brothers spoke for the last time, Sanguinius told Conrad that they would both face their destined path. Sanguinius had accepted his fate because he chose to. He was in control of his destiny, just as Conrad had had the choice to. Haunted, furious and raving, Conrad screamed at his brother, trying desperately to hold on to the justification for it all. As Sanguinius cast his brother's sarcophagi into the void of space. A sense of pressure building before a storm pressed the air in the room to an uncomfortable thickness. From out of this rolled a thunder of words that Kurt had yearned for, yet in the last sane pockets of his mind had never expected. You are not weak, my son. The voice drove Kurz to his knees with its power. His head rang with sudden, white pain. A roaring hurricane of might blasted from the figure, now surrounded with ancitic light, tossing the remains of his last victims around and burning out the wall, exposing Kurz to the light of the hateful stars. Father, he said. His voice was fractured, small, a child's voice. Pitiful. I am beyond your accusations, beyond speech, beyond anything. Why do you think that I speak? Your madness is finally complete. Again the words rang Kurz's skull, with the force of a clapper striking a bell. Still he managed to grin and raise his head to stare at the meaty thing's glory that he was forced to squint against the blazing light. No, no, you are here. I hear you. You have come to face my judgment drawn by this offering I have made. You were ever a bloody god. I am no god, nor shall ever be. Kurz got back up, his feathered cloak whipping in the psychic gale. His book clutched protectively to his chest. You are here. You understand your guilt. You have come to face my judgment. You cannot condemn me. 
I am punished enough. There is not enough punishment for what you have done. Not in this life or in the next, shouted Kurz. How dare you presume to understand what I have done and what sacrifices I have made and what I now must suffer. The force of the voice battered Kurz back. You will never know the depths of my pain, for which I am grateful. Kurz opened his eyes to peer sidelong at the figure. Why such hollow words? The voice took a moment before it returned, again with thunderous force that made Kurz howl. No father wishes his sons to suffer, no matter what burdens he is forced to place upon them. <laughs> An apology! What next? You will forgive me. Sanguinius warned me you might. He scoffed. There was never anything to forgive. You acted as you were made to, but my plan was interfered with. Your insanity was not your fault, nor was it mine. Kurz snarled like an animal. Lies! Everything was as you intended! There is nothing you have done wrong. If only you and I could have met one more time, I could have shown you back to the light. How marvelous! Curse fell into a minute of wild, howling laughter. I am the Night Haunter. Light is anathema to me. Light is within you all. You are my sons. You are born of light. None of you are beyond redemption. Tell that to those who died! Nothing ever dies. Death is a state of transition. You have my forgiveness, Conrad, whether you want it or not. Never! The voice in his head would not relent, but pounded mercilessly on. More masonry fell from outside the wall. The floor collapsed behind him, frittering into constituent atoms. You made but one mistake, my son. From it, all the evil you have perpetrated springs. You chose to believe in immutable fate. Without choice, there is nothing. These gods that taunt us rely upon choice. The functioning of this universe depends upon choice. A single fate is one book in a library of illimitable futures. You read only one. Do you not see that you chose this? You chose to be fate's prisoner. Had you believed in your own agency, none of this would have come to pass. You made this happen. You chose to be the way you are. Trapped. Manipulated. Insane. Kurz's smile froze, seeming to become detached from the face that it wore, hovering maniacally about his lips as a thing unique to itself, before it collapsed with all the violence of a dying star, and his mouth became a screaming hole. No! You sent the assassins to kill me. You want me dead. You determined what fate you trod. Your belief, my son, is nothing but an excuse for your own failings. Wailing, Kurz threw aside his book and hurled himself into the dreadful light, though it burned his eyes and beat at the effigy, rending and tearing at it with broken black nails, peeling long curls of frozen flesh from the stitched carcasses, ripping it to bloody shreds. The light went out, shaking, sobbing, he collapsed to the floor. The last remnant of his sculpture rolled wetly from the throne. I cannot be forgiven, he whispered. Tears coursed down his face, dripping from his nose and chin, insufficient in their profusion to dilute the blood spilled upon the floor. After all I have done, where would be the justice in that? I had no choice. I had no choice! 
The pressure dissipated. Kurz hunched down to the floor and wrapped his arms around the ruin of his substituted father. Frozen in a half embrace, he waited for a voice that he would never hear again. My sons, the galaxy is burning. We all bear witness to a final truth. Our way is not the way of the Imperium. You have never stood in the Emperor's light, never worn the Imperial Eagle, and you never will. You shall stand in midnight clad, your claws forever red with the lifeblood of my father's failed empire, warring through the centuries as the talons of a murdered god. Rise, my sons, and take your wrath across the stars. In my name, in my memory, rise, my night lords. Conrad Kurz, or the Night Haunter. It would be this pathetic, fractured thing that would awaken from the stasis coffin his brother had placed him in. Nearly three decades had passed. The rebellion was over. Sanguinius and Horus were dead, and his father laid crippled upon a throne of gold. A war that cost the lives of billions, a war that had destroyed worlds, fractured brotherhoods, families, and the Imperium had been changed forever. Eventually being discovered by a human salvage ship, Conrad reawakened, massacring the crew. The poor, innocent people aboard, they found this disheveled creature in human form. Some screamed, some were frozen in place by the sheer dread, but all died at the Night Haunter's hands. Conrad was a husk, leaping from sprouts of rage, cruelty and torture to something that resembled more of a man. The Night Haunter and Conrad Kurz, two aspects of one mad Primarch. With his freedom, Conrad made his way to the planet of Salgulsa, foreseeing his legion's arrival in his prescience. Like a puppet on strings, Conrad played out the part he had seen over a century ago, and prepared himself for the fated death that had once filled him with dread. He isolated himself. Alone with his madness, he crafted a sculpture of flesh made from the broken pieces of legionary slaves and servants. As the rotten, wet, disgusting thing was prodded and stitched, a twisted mockery of his father looked back at the filthy, mad, blood-soaked creature that was Conrad. He began to argue with it, swearing he could hear it speak. Oh, he hated him. His father, the arbiter of his fate, his architect for the state he was in. Look at him now, a broken corpse god, set on a path where he was to be worshipped as a god, just like he had planned. It was all his fault. Everything Conrad had done was because of him. He had no agency. He had none of the guilt for the billions who had died. Why him? Why was he chosen to land on Nostromo, growing up unloved and alone? Why did he have to become the Night Haunter, the arbiter of a brutal justice that he had allowed to continue for over a century in the Great Crusade? Why could he have not been in his brother's place, such as Sanguinius, and even Korax, two brothers cast from the same mold, but yet Korax's gifts were so much better. He haunted the night, but Korax owned it. Why did he make it so that he enjoyed the killing? Why did he make him this monster? Power and golden light began to emanate from the flesh effigy. Words pounded into Conrad, who in his broken mind he would never know if they were real or in his own head. He began to rage and condemn his father, blaming him for everything. But his father's words cut deeper than any wound ever could. You chose to believe in immutable fate. 
Without choice, there is nothing. Do you not see that you chose this? You chose to be fate's prisoner. Had you believed in your own agency, none of this would have come to pass. You made this happen. You chose to be the way you are. Trapped, manipulated, insane. The gods of chaos had ripped him from the Emperor's side, and the dark gods had toyed with Conrad, but he was not faultless. Those entities tried to poison him. They had shown him more possible futures when the prescience took over, but it was Conrad who chose his fate. It was his fault. The words broke him as tears began to fall down his cheek. The boy with the knife on Nostromo, he had chosen to kill him. He had chosen to be the Night Haunter, and Dawn was right. The hatred planted in those you leave alive will pass from one generation to the next until worlds are engulfed in a war, the cause of which none of those fighting will remember. It would never end. His justice was a joke. And Sevatar was right too. How then did the other Primarchs manage to create compliant worlds? How has world upon world managed it? without resorting to butchering children and broadcasting their screams across the planetary vox nets. Even the events on Davin, where Conrad's prescience failed him, showing that fate was not set. It was all his choice, and the confoundment of it all was so great that Conrad knew that to accept it, it would break the last string of sanity he had left. It is perhaps the most frightening thing in this world, what humanity does to protect itself. We will burn worlds to protect the fundamentals of who we are, and our ego, our self-righteousness. Shaking, sobbing, collapsed to the floor, Conrad picked himself up and prepared to face the destiny he knew in his heart he was the architect of. The Primarch strode to his throne room, passing the sons he hated so much, and in turn his sons looked at a father that didn't love them, a father who made them monsters and then judged them for it. He had become the very thing he condemned his father for, and in a spiteful act he ordered them to fight in an unending war. Sitting on his dark throne, a mad king welcomed the assassin sent for him. Laughing, crying, and cold, he welcomed the killer in. Raving with his broken mind, he spoke of vindication, and as his head was cleaved from his superhuman body, Kurz escaped the guilt for all that he had done. Thank you.